and here we go. The contest will start in one minute. Spectators, help us count down from 10. And contestants, when the clock hits zero, at that point, you may touch anything on your workstation, but not until the clock hits zero. They should be here. Where, where and it's been hold, a long time hold, coming. Hold on a second. But Can PC, we? PC World Finals DACA starts in 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 6 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 2 1. The contest is underway. Okay, well, we've got it started. Good morning, everybody. I hope you are enjoying the countdown. Welcome to ICPC DACA. We have Andrew He, Ecknerwala here, uh, and me, Second Thread, as commentators. The contestants are just now opening their problem sets. They're looking for the easiest problems. Right. We, uh, we haven't seen the scoreboard yet. Do you know how many problems there are in this contest? Uh, I don't. It looks like, ooh, it just got released just now. There are L problems. All right. What is L in the alphabet? L is 12. Yeah, it looks like 12. So there are 12 problems set. That's four problems for each of the three team members to read. Right. And uh, at this point, everyone is trying to get the first solved balloon. Right. Uh, so there will be a golden, right? It is golden and it is star-shaped. And it will be uh, it will be awarded to the on only the single team who solves the first problem in the entire contest. As a bit of context here, uh, the way this works Every team can solve as many problems as they want and as many problems as they can. Uh, but if you are the first team to solve a problem, you get a special balloon. And if you're the first team to solve any of the problems, you get a special golden balloon. Right. Uh, these these balloons, unfortunately, these first solves don't award you any special... Uh, they, they award you a special award for the first solve, but it doesn't actually help you in the, uh, in the overall rankings. And so... Depending on your strategy, some teams may be going for these as a way to kind of you know show that show their speed, and some teams may be trying to play uh, a bit of a slower strategy in hopes of placing higher at the end of the game. Largely, the main benefit of this first solve balloon is just the the significance of of having the first solve or right. some level of glory associated with it. Having a golden star-shaped balloon makes you feel a little bit better than everybody else. There's an ego boost there, too. Right, right. So teams right now should be looking through all 12 problems because they don't actually know which ones are the easiest. Yeah, so uh, I guess one, one question might be why would teams want to solve easier problems first, maybe for people who are less familiar with the way these scoreboards work? Right. So ICPC uh, works with... Uh, ICPC scoring works with two different... There are two different numbers that matter. The first is just the number of problems you solve. If you've solved more problems, then you place higher, right? Um, but there might be a, there are only twelve problems, and so there are obviously going to be uh, you know two teams that solve the same number of problems. Uh, and the tiebreaker for that is what's called penalty. Uh, and penalty is the sum of the solve times of every single problem that you do solve. So if you solve a problem at 5 minutes, and then you solve your next problem at 20 minutes, and then you solve your next problem at 60 minutes, your total penalty will be 5 plus 20 plus 60. As a, a quick reminder, we'll show an example of what this actually looks like once we get some solves. We'll have the scoreboard live as well, and you'll be able to see on the stream or also on the scoreboard link which teams are winning up until the final hour of the contest, during which the scoreboard will be frozen. And you'll be able to see that submissions happen, but you won't be able to tell whether they're right or not. So it'll make the scoreboard reveal after contest even more interesting. Right, right. Uh, yeah, and so we will, uh, you know, we'll get there when we get there. But for now, all submissions, uh, all submissions will be visible to both yourself and all other teams in the contest. Right. Uh, not not the contents of the submission, but whether you solve it or not. Yeah, whether whether it's right, and then other teams will see if it's incorrect. Right. Uh, and if you're the team submitting, you'll see a little bit of information about how it's incorrect. It might be too slow, uh, maybe it crashed, got a runtime error, right. or maybe it was just wrong. Right, right. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, we'll have to, uh, 
we'll have to see if there are any submissions coming in. So it's been four minutes into the contest. We still haven't had any submissions, correct or incorrect yet. Yeah, and it looks like you got lots of teams. We can kind of see the scoreboard or the, the contest floor here. Lots of teams are, are reading through their problem sets. Right, right. Um, did you did you guys have any strategy for reading through these problems? We we did have a kind of interesting strategy. So obviously you have three team members, and your goal as a team is to find the easiest problem. That's the one that you want to solve first, both for the dark green balloon and also just because it'll contribute best to your penalty points at the end of contest. So what my team did, and I know this was kind of a UCF strategy, so it's possible that UCF is, is using this strategy this year as well, is we didn't actually start like at the beginning of the problem set, a third of the way through the problem set, two thirds, and just each read a third of the problem set. We did each read a third, but we did it in an interesting reading order. One person started at problem A, and then read, read backwards through the end of the set. And then we had two people, one started at problem E and read backwards, and one started at problem F, and that was me, and read forward. And by doing this, we did some statistical analysis of where the easier problem tends to be on World Finals problem sets. And right. it might it might not be true, but uh, as may, maybe we were able to find uh, find an easy problem faster than usual. I mean, it, you know, if it, 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 if it works, it works, right? Yeah, I mean, well, like worst case, it's just random, so yeah. it's probably not going to be too bad. But right, right, yeah, kind of lucky. Yeah. I know one of the things your team recommended doing is removing the staples. Right, right. Uh, well, in, in this contest, uh, they actually pro they, they should have printed three copies of the problems, one for each team member. But still, it's very nice to be... I, I know some teams even just only use one copy, remove the staple, and then split the piece of paper. And that way, each problem is on its own piece of paper, and you can just pass them around that way without having to coordinate, you know, coordinate additionally. It looks like we do have our first incorrect submission. Um, we have our first submission of the contest. It is from U Wisconsin Madison on problem G, uh, and it is a wrong answer. Uh, and so uh, it's, it's kind of an interesting question. We're still not actually sure whether G is an easy problem and, uh, and they have just a small bug, or whether G is a hard problem that U Wisconsin Madison might have thought was an easy problem. Yeah, but there's certainly a bunch of teams looking at it. Because, yeah, problem, problem G being submitted to is certainly interesting. It looks like we also have a submission from University of Waterloo in problem H, and it appears to be still running. Right. We still don't know. We see a second submission on H right, coming in now. So H might, actually be, uh, H might actually be an easy problem, and it might actually be the first solve of the contest. We'll see, if that, uh, we'll see if that happens. Looks like we're still working through some things with the scoreboard, but since we had a submit from you, Madison... Uh, UW Madison. It it might be some some interesting interesting things for people to know if they weren't familiar with it. I see we've got some some people cheering for it in the chat here. Right. But University of Madison, believe it or not, they actually only have one team member competing on the contest floor today. Most teams are allowed three members, and obviously there's a huge advantage to having all three. But right. it looks like two of them from University of Madison had COVID, and I gotta speak with the third one during team registration a few days ago. He was a really nice guy. Right. His name is actually. Uh, Vietnamese oh, okay. for the word courage. Oh, wow. Isn't that great? And he's yeah. like coming alone, standing up against everybody else here, all of these best programmers in the world. He's right. on a one-person team, and he's got the first submit of the contest. wasn't quite correct, but maybe he can, he can still earn that title. Right, right. Uh, and so right now we're looking at U Waterloo, who I believe is the first submit on H. Um, and we're looking. Uh, hopefully we might be able to see their reaction to, to be able to guess whether they passed it or not. I think I saw uh, one of the contestants, I think that was Ildar, look up and he smiled. So oh, I'm a little right. hopeful, but uh, still no actual results coming in yet. Nothing on the scoreboard. It looks like UW-Madison submitted something. We can see it here. So their submission is, it looks like it's an empty <laughs> file that has the comment strategic submission. And so maybe they're trying to throw everyone else off on which problems are, are easy by making a wrong submit. So in fact, this was neither of the things that I thought might happen. It's neither that they, they thought it was easy and it wasn't, and it actually is easy. It's actually just who knows still, but now other teams might be tricked. We'll get a copy of the problem set in a bit, and we'll be able to look at what problem G is. My guess is it might be some crazy hard geometry or something that University of Madison is just like, oh uh, yeah, I'm not solving this in contest. Right. So uh, you wanted to throw other people off, but uh, yeah, we'll see, it'll be exciting. And we, we can see the two empty chairs here in U Wisconsin Madison, and uh, they're one remaining team member working hard and probably trying to actually solve a problem now. So this guy, believe it or not, 
he he's actually from Chicago. He lives in Chicago now, but his mm-hmm. team is from Madison, right. which is uh, in in Wisconsin, obviously. And as a Wisconsinite, I I know quite a bit about Madison. Uh, I I drove from where I live, which is in Milwaukee, right through through Chicago. It's like a five hour drive. Uh huh. And this uh, this team member, the one who's competing today, he's from Chicago, and every week he would take a bus from Chicago all the way up to Madison in order to practice with, with his teammates. Wow. Which is really unfortunate that it ended up uh, like this, where his teammates weren't able to compete. Right. All of that work, it, it seems, is like, ah, uh, the collaboration is well, at least, killing you. At least, you know, t- uh, practicing with your teammates is still a lot of fun. I think when I was competing, that was, you know, that was a lot of the reason why I compete, why I was, why I was there. It was so that, you know, you can spend time with teammates and you can practice coding. And I'm sure, he, I'm sure he still got a lot of good practice, even the, though they're not able to be here today. The social aspect of it is, is really a huge part of competitive programming. Right. I imagine lots of the people in the chat are, are friends of some or all of the competitors here, uh, and they can definitely testify to how much fun you have with them when right. you're practicing and, and after practices when you're just having fun. Right. Right. And so, uh, right now, it's been 10 minutes into the contest, and we still see some submissions coming in for problem H, um, but I still am not sure if we've seen any verdicts yet. So maybe um, maybe they are taking a little bit of time to show up. Um, yeah, it could be some security thing. I'm not sure if they're like actually releasing the immediate results live, or if perhaps it's delayed in some way. Right. But right. we'll see. But yeah, at least it seems pretty clear that problem H is, is what teams think is the easiest problem. Yeah, they're, right? they're definitely like, going after it. They're, they're definitely going for it. Looks like UW Madison also has a submit on problem D. We're not sure. Ah, oh, that's wrong. It's wrong. also wrong. I wonder if it's the same strategic submission. Yeah, we'll, we'll see from the, uh, we'll see from the analyst soon, hopefully. Um, but uh, may, it may it may also be a strategic submission. It's kind of interesting that they would make two such submissions. Uh, maybe maybe they just decided that uh, you know they they uh, won't bother. Uh, they aren't going to bother solving it uh, in the contest, or maybe they they think that you know one strategic submission isn't enough. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see here. I guess one one fun fact about this. So. There are some other teams, uh, when they when they were looking at interesting things about their teams, who thought mm-hmm. they had the shortest sum of code forces handle lengths because they all had short code forces handles. Interesting. And it turns out many of the ones who who submitted that fact were were right. But UW Madison actually does have the shortest right. because they only have one member. His handle is BVD on code forces, right. and uh, he's I think the the champ so far, the, or at least getting the most attention. Right. Right, right. So it looks like we do have verdicts co- coming in for problem H. Um, oh, all of them, almost all of them were incorrect, except Seoul National University has achieved the first solve of the contest. Well done. We'll probably get a get a shot of the, the first balloon being delivered to this team. For those of you who aren't familiar with how ICPC contests work, anytime you get a submission correct, uh, the judges will, or the, the balloon distributors anyway, will bring a balloon from a secret room in the back out to your team, and they'll tie it to a little metal knob that's next to your team station. Uh, and this is a really nice feature, because since all of these these teams' computers are like the same height, if you look around the room, you can see all of these balloons hanging between different teams' stations. Uh, and it, it's a very, like, very pretty scene once teams start solving more problems. It is a very, it is a very colorful scene. Uh, you can see there are some balloons around the outside right now as decoration, but we'll really see start seeing a lot of balloons scattered throughout the whole place. It looks like Seoul, Seoul, is it Seoul, 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 Seoul National University. They're they're now in first place, and we can see this on the scoreboard. Uh, there's a link to the scoreboard. You can also use the is it exclamation point or hashtag Things scoreboard. You, you can use the exclamation scoreboard command at least on some platforms. Um, um, should we try it? We, let, let's try it here. There you go. So if you want to link to the scoreboard, uh, you should be able to check it here. Oh, maybe, maybe hey, not. Oh, there oh, we go. There it is. All right. So you there's... need to look at the scoreboard for yourself. We'll also be showing it on the stream from time to time. And we have our second correct submit of the contest. It is UCF, also also on problem H. Uh, and uh, yeah, congrats to UCF. What well do you think about that? Well done UCF. Yeah. So UCF is the university that I went to. For anyone who didn't know, uh, it will actually have a coach of UCF coming on the stream uh, later on. This is uh, Arup Guha. So mm-hmm. get excited for that if you're from UCF. 
I know we've got lots of team members from UCF staying up late to watch this contest. Right. Because it's, it, it's kind of the middle of the night for them. It's kind of the middle. Uh, and I believe on the West Coast where we're, the West Coast of the U.S. where we're both from, it's it's like, what? It's uh, midnight right now? And it'll be uh, it'll be 5 a.m. by the time the contest yeah, is done? Yeah, yeah. It gets pretty late. So, so But there is there is no shortage of excitement powering them on. So they'll be they'll be up all night for sure. Right, right. So we, uh, we have our third third correct submission from National Taiwan University. Congratulations. Looks like these are all from Problem H. Yeah, and another interesting thing about Problem H is that even though there have been three correct submissions, there are uh, there have been like a dozen or more incorrect submissions. So even though this problem is, you know, even though this is maybe the easiest problem and the first problem that could get solved, it looks like maybe there's some traps in there that you could think you have it correct, but actually there's some edge cases you missed or maybe there's uh, maybe this like the greedy solution or something like that is just totally wrong. One similar type of problem we've seen in past years is comma sprinkler. Right. Uh, I remember, I think this was like a couple couple years ago. Right, right. And it was on the ago. practice contest from yesterday. It was also on the practice contest. Yeah. So it's one of those things where if you uh, if you're not super careful with your implementation, you might forget about a case. Right. And I suspect that might be something that lots of teams are getting wrong. But it might also just be a greedy that looks right. Yeah, isn't. and uh, it's just hard to prove that it's not right. We are seeing more and more wrong answers to problem H flood into the contest. We had 11 when I counted a few seconds ago, and it looks like we just got another half dozen more. Right. So this is something teams need to be really careful with, and certainly they're looking at the scoreboard themselves, seeing all these wrong submissions, and are probably reconsidering whether right. they're doing it right or not. So it looks like uh, it looks like MIT has made the first submission on problem C, uh, unfortunately, it was incorrect, but that's another problem that we might want to look out for as a uh, as a potentially early solve in this contest. So, if you're MIT, there's a really interesting question you need to ask yourself at this point, mm -hmm. which is, do you go look at problem C and do you do you let people run the cases on terminal right. and try and debug it if you're if you think you're really close, or do you move on, try and get problem H and give someone else the terminal if they think they're ready. Right. Looking at the webcam, it looks like they were leaning over the computer and maybe debugging. Really? All right. But I think the, I think the, oh, we have a second submit on problem C. Um, but I think, I, I think if I were in their position, I would probably actually start typing problem H and, and have the person on problem C print their code. And, and that's something that's really powerful that you can do. Uh, you can, you can press uh, the print button. Uh, you, you can print any code or anything from your local computers, and uh, we will have volunteers who bring the printout to your station. Uh, and using this, you can have someone else use the computer while you're reading the code and debugging. Printing code is actually a huge aspect of the way the way this works. In particular, because you have three people but only one computer, you really have to be careful with the terminal usage that, that, you, that you spend. Right. Uh, so being able to print it and give it to someone else and have them look at the code at the same time someone else is writing code for another problem, maybe problem H, maybe maybe a different problem entirely that you think you know how to solve, uh, can speed things up quite a bit. Right, right. And it looks like St. Petersburg State University is the, uh, I believe they're the fifth team to solve problem H. One. We, but they, they, rise, they rose up into third place. And it looks like, yeah, some of these teams are taking multiple tries in order to get it right. right. Um, uh, yeah, UCF and Seoul are the only two to get it on the first try so right. far. Right. Uh, and so the reason that they rose up into third is because every additional try that you take to get a problem right costs you 20 extra minutes of penalty. So it's it's important to get problems right fast right. because the fewer minutes of penalty points you have, the better. And it's also important to get them right with as few incorrect submissions as you can. Right. And, right. and UCF and Seoul are doing a great job at that so far. They have 11 and 13, or I guess 13 and 11, penalty right. points respectively, with Seoul University in first place. Looks like we also got another AC from Waterloo. It took them three tries, but they did a good job getting it correct right. and pushing through. Right. It looks like we're, we're, we're told that about 50 teams are working on from H at the moment, which is um, about half of, the, half of all teams, right? Yeah, we have a little bit less than half. We have about 136 or so teams at World Finals, over 130. And uh, yeah, lots of them are, are looking for which problems to solve. I think at this point in the contest, it's pretty clearly revealed that problem H is doable. Right. Uh, but maybe 50 of them are, are typing it. Right, right. Uh, it looks like the code was actually pretty long. Uh, earlier, earlier, the analyst brought up uh, uh, Seoul, Un Seoul National University's code, which was the first correct solve of the contest. And it was about like 20 lines or or more. And so 
there's probably a, there probably is a lot of things that you could get wrong when writing that. Yeah, this is uh, sounds sounds to me so far like it's a, a very implementation heavy right. problem, and right. there are lots of lots of traps that you might fall for, but the right. thinking part probably isn't too tricky if all these teams immediately see that right. it's something they can do. Right, right. Um, yeah, and we, we also see more submissions coming in for problem uh, for problem C. We have, I think, about three submissions for problem C now. Uh, and we also have, uh, I believe we had our first submit for problem B. It was incorrect, but it was from Kyoto University. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'll see. Maybe that one is also a uh, problem we'll start seeing solves on. Yeah, it looks like we got eight submits so far on problem H. Right. Uh, and we certainly have plenty more streaming in. Uh, it's up up to 11 already. Yeah, so lots of teams are getting it right. There we go. Oh, we got the problem. We got set. the problem. Let's take a look at problem H. What do you guys say? I really want to see it. All right. So, you know, the first thing we do is we take the staple out. We take out. the staple out. Just like a classic MIT alum. We got a comment here about uh, UCF beating MIT. Right. Which is certainly impressive from UCF. Right, right. This did actually happen in uh, in World Finals, though. I think we beat you guys by by one place uh, in Beijing. Right, right. If I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's read problem H here. I'll read it to you guys, and maybe someone can transcribe this if they want to know what it is early. So the problem is called prehistoric programs. Archaeologists have discovered uh, existing clay tablets in deep layers of the Alutila cave. Nobody was able to decipher the script on the tablets, except for two symbols. Uh-oh, we got lots of applause. What's going on here? Another AC? I guess another AC. All right. No one is able to decipher the tablets, except for two symbols that describe the nested structure, not unlike opening and closing parentheses, in a, or in Lisp. Could it be that humans wrote this program thousands of years ago? Taken together, the tablets appear to describe a great piece of work, perhaps a program, or an epic, or even tax records. Unsurprisingly, after such a long time, the tablets are in a state of disorder. Your job is to arrange them in a sequence so that the resulting work has a properly nested uh, parentheses structure. And I imagine this is just the, the classic balanced parentheses where right. uh, you can replace things with, you can add ones and add pluses and you can get an arithmetic expression. Right. It means that every open parentheses, you can match it with a closing parentheses and it, like, it fully contains the things that are inside. I think, uh, yeah, there are a lot of different ways of stating this. Um, but most people have a, uh, you know, most people have a pretty good sense of what it means, right? Yeah, I think so. So you can't ever have a bigger prefix, or you can't ever have a prefix that has more closing parentheses than open open parentheses, uh, and you also need the sum of opening parentheses and closing parentheses to be the same. Right. Uh, so yeah, I guess a, an informal way of describing the problem: you have a bunch of like chunks of open and closed parentheses, right? And you need to concatenate them in some order to make a balanced parentheses sequence. Right. Right. Uh, and that's a. This is a pretty interesting problem. I think this is actually. Uh, this is actually a pretty. There, there are some pretty classical ideas in as to how you might solve this problem, and a lot of them coming come down to how you think about uh, balanced parentheses sequence. Yeah, like uh, a good way of, of thinking about it, in my opinion, is you can kind of imagine a, a graph over time of for which position you're looking at. Right. Uh, the height is like how many more open parentheses do you have than closing parentheses. Right. So, so you want to make sure this never goes negative. Right. An open, parenthes an open parenthesis is kind of like a slope upwards in a mountain, and a closed parenthesis is like a slope downwards, and you a, a, a sequence of parentheses is balanced if it just never goes below sea level. Exactly, right. exactly. Um, it looks like problem, we're getting a, a, some information from our analysts here, that problem B is one of the harder problems of the contest, and it's very ambitious for Kyoto to be working on it already, especially when, when problem H is, it appears so much easier. Right, so perhaps they, uh, maybe they have seen something about it before, or maybe they think that it's, uh, think that it's doable, or maybe they even, um, maybe they uh, just misread some part of it and, yeah, and maybe, they misunderstood it. Maybe they're misunderstanding it, or maybe they, they think the solution's easy, but really there's, there's some subtle mistake, and right. there's a lot more work that needs to be done with it. Right, so we actually see U.S. U Wisconsin Madison has a second submit on D. So I, I think they might actually be working on that problem. Um, if this is a, a strategic submission, there's a lot of investment being put into it. Right, because that's potentially 40 points of uh, a penalty. So I, 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 I'm guessing that their submission to D is a is a serious submission, and they are you know the first team to try and attempt this problem. It it seems so. Yeah, it is it is a bit of a wordy problem, but uh, here we go. All right. Looks like, yeah, we're getting uh, a bunch of teams who are actually able to get 
problem each in one try. Right. My guess is they were a little scared of getting it wrong, took some time to run some extra cases. Right. And it, that it's really tough to say whether that's worth it or not, because, uh, you know, on the one hand, 20 penalty is a lot of time, right? But on the other hand, if you save one minute on this problem, you actually save one minute of penalty on every problem afterwards that you solve. Right? It's true, yeah. So if, if it takes you, like, an extra two minutes to solve this problem and you end up solving 11 problems, right? it's worth it to just get one wrong submit if you can get the AC instantly after that. Right, exactly. Because it, it, instead, that, that kind of adds 22 minutes to the whole time. Now, I'm no analyst, but I do have a thing that I think might be the cause of many teams getting problem H wrong. It looks like there's only one sample that's impossible, and the reason it's impossible, uh, I guess, is because the sum of opening parentheses and closing parentheses are different. Right. But there can be other cases in this problem where it's just not possible. Like if you have close open, close open right. as your two different things, well, the sum is the same, but it's still not possible. So there, there are cases where, where the samples really are incomplete. Right. And you right. have to run your own cases if you want to be sure that your code is correct. Right. That really is a big part of, uh, that is a big part of how, how you, uh, how, how, how you have to do these contests. You have to, you know, you have to make sure you both think through like all the cases. And also, it can be very helpful to actually write your own cases so that you can test them and so that you can validate that your code is doing what you expect it to do. And so, there's a, there, this is, a, you know, honestly, it's a lot like, you know, what you have to do in real software engineering. You have these complicated, you have these complicated structures, but you need to, uh, you need to write, you know, you need to write tests. Yeah, so I guess we'll, we'll come back to this in just a minute, but MIT just got the dark green on problem C. Congratulations to them. Uh, they are trying to catch UCF <laughs> and, and Seoul National University, all the other teams. They are the first team to get it after two tries, but now they've got H on the docket, and they're definitely going to move on to that. Right, right. Uh, one interesting thing is that uh, some people might be looking at this and thinking, oh, well, that makes that puts MIT a lot behind because they did it C before H, even though it's you know it should be swapped. But actually, it, it's a little bit it's a little bit different than that because. Um, uh, it's kind of like if you did C before H, if C takes 10 minutes and H takes 20 minutes, right? Uh, if you do C first, or sorry, if, if H takes 10 minutes and C takes 20 minutes, if you do C first, you get 20 minutes of penalty on this, and then 30 minutes of penalty on the next, and you do all the rest of the problems, you know, 30 minutes later. But if you swap them, then you get 20 minutes of penalty on H and 10 minutes of penalty and 30 minutes of penalty on C, and it's only 10 minutes of penalty worse, I guess. Yeah. As long as you solve the two problems like both pretty quickly, it's okay if you swap the order as long as you make sure you solve them both fast. Especially considering how many teams are getting two and three wrong answers on H, this this inversion of solving C before H when it might not be totally optimal is not going to hurt him very much. The other thing that I want to mention here, Andrew, right. is just for people who aren't super familiar with programming contests in general, or ICPC. Right. So for these people, they right. might say, OK, well, you have these these sample cases. Right. Even like anyone can write code. It's just a matter of testing them on the sample cases. Why are so many teams getting it wrong? Right. Well, there are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of test cases. So the way that these programming contests are set up is uh, it's, it's uh, I, honestly, I think it's kind of, it's kind of beautiful how, uh, it's kind of beautiful. What you, what you do is you write some code, and you submit it to the judge. And the judge will evaluate um, the judge will evaluate your code on a hidden set of tests, uh, and th this hidden set of tests is maybe you know 60, 100 test cases. Um, and the con only constraints are that it has to print out the correct answer. If it doesn't print out the correct answer, you get this verdict WA, which we sometimes see. Oh, I for, guess for wrong answer. For wrong answer, uh, I guess there's there's a verdict you have to do before that, which is CE compiler error. So your code has to compile correctly. Your code has to give the correct answer. And your code has to run within a specified time limit. Uh, and this time limit for these problems looks to be, you know, about five seconds. It yeah. depends on the problem. It's pretty reasonable. Uh, and, we, and, uh, and this is used to make sure that you are writing fast algorithms. Um, it's not a super tight time limit if your algorithm is asymptotically fast enough. But if you write something that, you know, takes n squared operations when it should just be, you know, should just be n, like takes like 10 to the 12 instead of 10 to the 6, then obviously you will not fit in that amount of time. So for people who aren't super familiar with this, the the important part here is that not only are these, these are there these known sample cases which you have to get right, but there are these hidden edge cases, and your code has to handle any possible input, not just the ones that they show you. So you have to be really careful about the kind of things that that might possibly show up, even right. if uh, you're right. not expecting them. Right, right. Um, and I think the analyst just pulled up MIT's correct submission on C. Okay. Uh, their their comment was that they were fixing precision issues. Do you want to ah. talk a little bit about that? 
Yeah, so there can be uh, lots of issues if you use like doubles or floating point numbers. These are basically just numbers that don't have to be whole numbers. Uh, and sometimes you need to use an epsilon. I think I, I don't know too much about the problem here, but using the right float, using like long doubles and using epsilons correctly is something you want to make sure you do. Right, right. So the hard thing about floating point numbers is that you know you can't actually represent you know any real number uh, because you know the, the the decimal can go on infinitely, right? And you only have so much you, space on the computer. Right. Exactly. If I wanted you to ask, if I want to tell you square root two, like if I want to ask you square root two, it, it actually goes on infinitely, and there's no really succinct way of representing it. And so what you have to do, what, what when you use floating point numbers to represent them, you're really rounding them. You're rounding them with a lot of precision. You have you know like uh, you have like ten or twenty digits precision still. Yeah. Um, but it still is rounded, and if you're not careful, that rounding can make your answer incorrect. And so it looks like, yeah, here's the difference between uh, what MIT first submitted and what they have now. And it looks like what they did is they originally wrote, had a sum of, of various items, and now they instead, uh, they actually collapsed that formula and made it, uh, you know, uh, made it a closed form. And that that might have uh, fixed their uh, fixed their precision issues. I'm not too too sure exactly. Yeah, I, I didn't have too much time to look into that. You can go back and pause if you want to analyze the code super clearly. But it looks like yeah, that might be a thing that's going to cause other universities some trouble too. We see Carnegie Mellon has a wrong answer on this, and so does St. Petersburg University. Both of those are quite good teams. Oh, and looks at MIT just got the dark green on problem L. This is another problem we haven't even seen before. MIT jumps into first place with problem C and problem L. They're right. just ignoring problem H entirely. Right. And maybe they'll come back to it later, but for now, they don't need it. Right. They they got problem L on their first submit, and it looks like it was only five minutes after their previous submit. Now, granted, we're not sure they probably were working on L while they were debugging C, but it is still very impressive that they were able to get this so quickly. One of the great strategies and great things about having three people is you can have one person working on a problem, you can have someone else figure out the entire idea, and if problem L is like something mathematical or something that's short to code, you only might need five minutes of terminal time in order to type the solution. And that's what MIT was able to do here. MIT, an incredibly talented university. Right. Uh, the one Andrew is from. Right. And <laughs> then uh, I think the, the one Anton is from too, right? Right, right. So Anton represented MIT. He's he's in the comments here, right. and he is uh, he represented MIT at, at North American Championships. Right, right. Which is the, for which was actually for the next year's World Finals. Yeah, for next year's World Finals. So he'll be doing or uh, trying to do anyway. Right. What MIT is doing now. Right. In in one year. Right, right. Um, yeah, and uh, we will uh, we will see how this MIT team does and see if they can match it next year when we come back. Do we want to take a brief look at what? problem L is to see if this is something that other teams are likely going to be able to do easily. Right. Uh, so let's take a quick look. This oh, is maybe what a some, long problem. What a long problem. <laughs> oh, there, <boy>. are, <laughs> there are some diagrams on this. Uh, there are some grids and diagrams. And that's, no that's not even the sample. This this whole sheet, this is just text. This isn't even the, like the input output. That's all in the back. And, and so we'll, we'll be doing what a lot of teams might be doing right now. And, you know, they see a solve, and so they read the problem. Yeah, right? now people will start reading L. I'm sure. Now people, I'm sure, will start reading from. Um, so this problem is about a, it's about kind of a spiral grid, I guess. Um, there, there's a test subject, and it seems like they, uh, they start at the center of this, of this infinite grid, and they, they spiral outwards, uh, walking in, like, you know, this kind of pattern. Uh, and... What are they? What are we trying to do? Um, yeah, should I read it for people? Who <laughs> yeah, maybe you should read it. I will announce this. Who am I? What am I? Where am I? These are all difficult questions to answer, uh, but philosophers have kept reliably busy over the past millennia. But when it comes to where am I? Sorry, I misread the questions. You get the point. You'll see them later. Uh, then, well, modern smartphones and GPS satellites have pretty much taken the excitement out of that question. To add insult to injury of the newly unemployed spatial philosophers formerly pondering the where question, the Instant Cartog Cartographic Positioning Company, initials ICPC, of course, have decided to run a demonstration of just how much or how powerful their GPS is compared to old-fashioned maps. Uh, their argument is that the maps are useful only if you already know where you are, but much less so if you start in an unknown location. So for this demonstration, the ICPC has created a test area that's arranged as a unbounded Cartesian grid. And most cells are empty, but there are a finite number of cells that have markers at their center. These are probably like cells that have statues or waterfalls or something like this. 
And suppose you're given a map of the test area, so you know where all of the markers are, and you're placed uh, at some cell which you don't know. How long would it take you to find out where you actually are? The ICPC's answer is clear, potentially a very, very long time. Well, a GPS could give you the answer instantly. But how long would it take you exactly? So, yeah, you've got some, some points on a grid. You have, uh, you've got some, some locations showing you how right. the cells are ordered. Right. And you have to figure out exactly where you are. Okay, so, uh, yeah, let's see what the question is here. In this trial, test subjects will explore their environment by following an expanding clockwise spiral. And I guess they'll look for, for one of the X's. Right. Uh, the test subjects can see a marker only if they are at its grid cell and will stop exploration as soon as they know where they are based on the grid cells they have seen so far. This means the observed sequence of empty and marked grid cells could have begun only at a single position, a single, single starting point. position. Right. The grid's unbounded and you'll consider it infinitely, but obviously at some point you'll have seen all of the markers and you'll right. know, know where you are. Right. Having hundreds of test subjects literally running in circles can be expensive, so you'll run simulations. Okay. So, yeah, what, is this, what does this look like? You're given some grid, mm -hmm. and you need to output three lines. The first is the expected number of steps you'll need. Okay. Uh, if your starting position is chosen uniformly at random, presumably within that within box. Within the grid, right. And, uh, yeah, that's a double, so you need to be correct within, within about one thousandth of a unit. Right. And the second will be the worst case of all of the possible starting positions. Right. All right, so this seems a bit tricky. So it sounds like the the amount that you'll know will like spiral out and increase, and you right. have to see is there like at what point is that knowledge only mappable to one position? Right, right. And one one thing that's uh, that we should we should think about is um, kind of what what the bounds might be, or we we can think we can think about the problem without looking at the bounds. Yeah, I guess it, it is good to talk about the bounds though, like you mentioned. So it turns out the bounds are actually quite small. Right. There are at most 100 by 100. The grid that you're given is at most 100 by 100. And the total markers is at most right. 100 as well. Right, right. And so uh, I, I think what, might, what you might be able to do is uh, you, uh, you, you try, you, you can actually simulate the process starting at every position, right? And you can just say, for some given things you can see, maybe you can do a hash of this if you're right. familiar with string hashing. Right. You can do a 2D hash of what you can see, and you can see, is this thing visible for right. multiple starting positions right. if you have looked at this many cells? Right, right. So you can have some some like hash map of like some hash to how many times it occurs, and that can tell right. you whether you know it for sure or whether you have to take another step. Right, right. Um, another uh, another uh, an, an, one, one issue with that is that you uh, you have to be a little careful with exactly how you how you simulate, right? So you do have to jump from from one thing that you see to the next thing. Right. Perhaps you can sort them by by their distance, taking this circular path, and maybe right. that's one way of handling it. Right, right. Because if you don't, then you might end up walking. You know, it's a hundred by hundred grid, so you have you know t ten thousand starting positions, and then if each of them you have to simulate ten thousand steps, that starts to get a little close to potential time. Yeah, it's a little little scary for sure. Right, and so. Uh, you know, being able to jump directly to the locations of the markers from every single starting point is kind of where you want to what you want to be doing. So yeah, it looks like like an interesting problem. Uh, now that you know it's solvable, I don't think it's it's too crazy difficult. Right. I think there's a lot of uh, there's definitely a lot of uh, implementation that goes into this, and you have to be really careful. So I'm pretty impressed that. Uh, it looks like MIT and also Waterloo have solved this in only one try. Yeah, Waterloo, I think, just got it. Maybe they got it a bit ago and we didn't see it because we were too focused on the problem. But yeah, Waterloo got a, a correct submission on this. And this moves them all the way up into second place. It appears there are three wrong answers on problem H are right. what's keeping them from first. Because MIT was, was able to get C in only two tries right. and still has H available to them. Right. So it looks like we have our fourth problem of the contest just solved by Utokyo. Oh wow, which problem? This was problem J. Whoa! Well done, Utokyo! And uh, this, you know, we, we'll see whether this is also one of the easiest problems. Uh, we, Utokyo is uh, one of the favorites to win this year, right? Utokyo has an incredibly strong team. They have, is it is it three LGMs? Uh, I think or they might two. have three LGMs, but it might only be two. It's at least two. Well, only two. Yeah, exactly. So for those of you who don't know what an LGM is, this is a legendary grandmaster. Uh, there are about 40 of them in the world, and they're they're the best 40 programmers in the world. At least on Code Forces. At least on Code Forces, yeah, yeah. Which I think is probably the most common way of evaluating right. uh, programming skill, but 
but yeah, there are there are people who who use other systems as well. But uh, many of these people, such right. as yourself, Andrew, you're you're an LGM, you're right. you're certainly yeah. way up there. Uh, many of them are are after college and they don't reach this rank until having used their uh, used their their ICPC eligibility, or or maybe they they reach it in in uh, right. in college, in, in but their course of since training. then they're still LGM and now they can't compete anymore. Right, right. So having three available all on one team, all from university, one university, all in the same year. That's huge. That is that is really big. And one of them is Maroon RK. Right. Who is very involved with at Coder as well, which right. is another programming I, I think contest he, platform. He runs most of their contests. Yeah. And so he definitely has a lot of experience with a lot of problems, and he's certainly talented at solving them. Yeah. I think another of their members is uh, Yuta Takaya, uh, and I think his mo his one one really notable achievement, which I think hasn't been done in many decades, is. He won both the IMO and the IOI in the same year in high school. That is incredible. Right. So he's, they're all certainly super talented, and uh, we'll see. We'll definitely be looking out for this team. It looks like we just got another ACN problem C. Uh, St. Petersburg University, a team from, from Russia, was able to get it after right. three tries, uh, which, you know, is, is, I guess, as expected. So they, right. they saw the the issues with, with precision, and they were able to handle that. I, I believe I saw their first uh, their first run actually got TLE. Oh, TLE. Time limit exceeded. Um, so it's possible that they were doing some sum, or they were doing some exponentiation in you know linear time instead of uh, using faster flow point methods. Yeah, it could have been either they were a little greedy with what they were trying to do, or... Right, a little lazy. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so, lazy, not greedy. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, so we'll... we'll uh, you, maybe, maybe we'll pull that up if, uh, if, if we get some time. Um, but as of now, it looks like we still have submissions streaming in. I think there are about 36, 35 teams, 36 now, teams who have solved problem H. Including uh, Georgia Tech. They just got it. Oh, well actually, done. My, my count was one high because MIT has, in fact, not solved problem H. Yeah, but we have 34 other teams who, right. who have solved it. Right. Uh, MIT probably looking, looking to uh, Looking to, to clean it up. So you, Tokyo, now that they've solved problem J and also problem H, this puts them in first place, which is quite impressive. Quite impressive. They were not the first team to solve two problems, or even the second, but they had much better penalty than everyone else because uh, because they didn't have these wrong submissions. They were the first to solve problem J, though, which means they will get a metal balloon, right. which they can keep forever, right. as as a, a token of their being awesome by getting problem J first. And it looks like M MIT has submitted problem H, uh, and it is a wrong answer, just like so many other submissions we've seen. Um, uh, I see some questions. Someone was asking, what's RE? RE is one of the other verdicts you can get. It stands for runtime error. Uh, and it means that over the course of executing a program, some exception was thrown. So this could be a raid next out of bounds. This could be null pointer exception. Uh, this could be you know some memory exception, or uh, it could even be an assertion failure. Um, but it means that something went wrong and it wasn't able to get a complete, uh, wasn't able to complete its run. Yeah, most most commonly, this usually tends to be someone is like they made an array, which is like some some group of memory, but they didn't make it big enough. Uh, or something like that, something that they, they were expecting to get right and didn't for some reason. Right, right. Um, runtime error is, usually means you have a uh, you have an implementation bug and not a logic bug. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Traditionally, they're, they're much less scary to get than some sort of unexplained wrong answer. Right. Because, because you know, you can, you can look at it, and worst case, you can comb through every line of code and figure out right. what thing could possibly crash, and that right. limits your options quite a bit. Right, right. But if you have a runtime error, now if you have a wrong answer, suddenly you're questioning everything. You're questioning whether you implemented it correctly, whether you, you know, have a bu have a small bug in, in that, where, or whether you, you know, maybe, you're, maybe even your code that you copied is, is wrong, or your entire understanding of the problem could be wrong. Like, maybe your entire algorithm is just incorrect, and uh, you misread the problem or something. And so there's definitely a lot more to come through. It looks like we got Seoul National University looking at problem C right now. They're debugging it. You can see their screen. Uh, right. It appears they're probably using Vim, right? Yeah, so there are a lot of different editors that teams can use. I think some people were talking uh, earlier in chat about that. Um, and uh, we, the, uh, uh, the, there are, yeah, the, the computers come preloaded with a whole variety of editors. And I think a lot of teams use different things. So the... You know, there, there are a few co command line editors, the classics, you know, Vim, Emacs. Some teams who, are, uh, who like to go minimalist use Nano. Uh, ah, yeah, yeah. I don't, know if there are any, I don't know if there are any teams that use, you know, crazier things like Ed, but, uh, you know, that is theoretically possible. Um, 
Uh, and then the uh, there are also a lot of like you know kind of these new uh, modern lightweight stand standalone editors like Sublime Text, VS Code. I don't know if we have Atom editor still, uh, but we definitely have Sublime and VS Code, and also Genie. Um, and these are all like you know uh, GUI editors. And then there are also a few different IDEs loaded on these machines. Um, some of them are provided courtesy of JetBrains, uh, who is uh, you know, one of the sponsors of the contest. One of the sponsors, yeah. Um, and so there's, you know, there's a few JetBrains IDEs. There's also Eclipse, right? Is that what you guys used? Eclipse is, yeah, yeah. It is definitely what uh, what many teams from UCF use. I think nowadays mm -hmm. we've largely switched to C++. Oh, okay. But the, the UCF teams of old were very Java heavy. Right. Uh, and there is also uh, Codeblocks. And, for C++, uh, for not, C++. not as popular, but... Not, a, not as popular. A lot of C++ programmers just use Vim or Emacs. Um, but yeah, those are all options. Those are all preloaded onto the machines, and uh, it's kind of... Uh, it's totally up to the teams uh, wh what they use. I think even if, if a team has a special editor they prefer, you can also request that. So the goal is to be as inclusive as possible, right? Um, but you want to make sure it's a level playing field, and you also want to make sure that teams aren't secretly smuggling, it, smuggling in any hidden, uh, hidden uh, reference information. We were talking about editors you can use just there, but there are also several languages you can use, and I saw some comments about this. The most common one is C++. Right. But you don't have to use C++. You can also use uh, C if you want to. Looks like we got another submit going on from Seoul National University on problem B. Uh, seems like it's a time limit exceeded result, though. Right. And, and we're, we actually just received some, some information on problem B. It's not actually for, about Seoul National University. It's about Moscow State University. Um, the analysts are telling us that their solution for problem B is just a little bit too slow. So maybe they just need a little bit of constant factor optimization in order to make it, uh, in order to make it fast enough uh, and be able to pass uh, be able to pass all the tests. So actually, problem B, despite you know, despite it being potentially one of the harder problems, uh, might actually be solved, you know, barely within the first hour of the contest. One of the things that judges often will do is they'll run the contestant's code for a little bit longer than than the time limit. They won't immediately cut it off. But if the code didn't finish within the time limit, they won't get a correct verdict. Also, the teams don't know this information. So although we know their time limit is really close, the right. teams are totally unaware to whether they're they're almost there or whether they have a long, long way to go. Right. Uh, quick correction. That was that that was actually uh, uh, Moscow HSEs. Uh, uh, Moscow. Uh, the higher school of economics uh, submission, not not Moscow State. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it is pretty interesting. Uh, where uh, it it is pretty tough. But one one thing that the teams do have in their advantage, to their advantage, is that uh, is that their computers are the exact same as the judge computers. So if they're able to write a large test case um, that you know should take the maximum possible runtime, then they can actually get uh, then they can actually find. The correct, uh, they can actually test it locally and find out exactly how long they're taking. One of the tricky parts about that is, of course, generating this max test case. Right. Sometimes it's it's hard to submit on problem G um, from Titec, uh, and so that might be the first serious submit on problem G of the contest. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we got an AC as well from what is that? Uh, Tishreen. Tishreen University. Right. Well done, well done, and uh, good morning to everyone who is joining us now. Yeah, hopefully our streams are back and uh, you guys are able to see and hear us. Uh, let's uh, quick look at this. Um, and uh, yeah, hopefully, uh, hopefully some of them are, hopefully yeah, as many of them as are working as possible. We got some shots of the balloons right here. These are the balloons that get, get distributed to the teams who solve a problem. Any time a team solves a problem, they'll get one balloon delivered to their workstation. And it's a, a source of pride for many teams, just having the balloons. But it also makes the contest floor even more interesting, because it's something for, for you to look around and see. And it kind of gives a visual indicator for who's winning uh, in person. Because right. obviously, you see the names on the scoreboard, that's one thing. But looking around and seeing, oh, that team has four balloons next to them. Right. Uh, especially when lots of other teams don't have any. It's right. a very intimidating factor here. Right, right, right. As the, as the contest goes on, the room will really fill up with balloons, and then it'll be a little tougher to tell, you know, oh, there, there, are, there are a few extra balloons in this corner. But it is, uh, it is very pretty, and it's, uh, it's a great way to get a quick, you know, quick glance at how all the teams are doing. Tougher to tell who's winning, but a lot more beautiful. Right.
there will be lots of colors everywhere. And I think it looks like blue, from what I see, might be the, the solution for, or the, the blue color for Realm H, which, right. uh, yeah, I guess we, we have everything here. So uh, I think blue is, is a very pretty color to, to have as, like, kind of a background color. Uh, right. The only one that, that might be interesting is J, which is kind of a brownish. Right. So for an easy problem, a brownish color might be not, not quite as pretty, but but I guess we'll see, yeah. Right. Uh, L is a, a very bright pink fuchsia, right. which will look good, I think. Right. Yeah, I mean, one, one, one thing I heard is that they actually randomized the balloon colors at the start of the contest. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm not sure exactly what how much it would matter, but it does provide a little bit of sec extra secrecy about how many problems there are or what, it, you know, what the mapping is between problems and colors. It's just... Random is kind of the safest way to be uh, to be uh, to, to to not leak any information. Yeah, if you know that hypothetically, let's say blue is a very pretty color, and you suspect judges will make that an easy problem, if you once you can see that that problem H is the blue balloon, you might right. want to read that first. So for that reason, there's a ton of security that right. goes into making sure that uh, no one knows which which balloons map to which colors until the contest starts, and also. No one knows which balloons the judges are ordering more of or ordering less of. Well, the judges, might... in fact, don't even order more or less of any balloon. They order the same number of everything. Right. So even problems that might not get solved, I believe they order the same number of balloons and they probably keep the leftovers for next year. I, I would imagine so, yeah. So on, on the scoreboard, we see that we actually have our first, first correct uh, submission on problem I by ETH Zurich. In fact, that is the first attempt at problem I. No other team has even submitted to it. Right. Uh, and that so is, ETH is really impressive. going, you know, really uh, going out on the limb. Yeah, yeah. And it seems like a good time for some some other teams to maybe read that problem. Right, right. Um, Looking at the problem here, it looks like it might be a geometry problem. Uh, no, it doesn't look like a geometry problem, but it is. It is kind of a. You know, it has a diagram in it, so it, it's almost geometry. Do we want to take a look at what it is right now? Right now. Yeah, sure. Let's take a look. Would you would you like to read it? I would love to. So the problem is called spider walk, and uh, you can imagine one of those spider webs. We can't really show you the pictures here because it'll look weird in the camera. But lots of spider webs. They have a lot of like radiuses going out from the center, and then they have lines connecting the radii. Uh, and from that, spiders can walk from one position to another, and that's that's what the picture shows. So let's jump into the problem. Charlotte the spider, possibly from Charlotte's web. This is the center of her spider web, which consists of a series of silken straight strands. Oh, that alliteration. And that is wow. Uh, that go from the center uh, to the outer boundary of the web. Charlotte's web also has bridges, each of which connect two adjacent strands. The two endpoints of a bridge always have the same distance to the center of the spider web. When Charlotte has finished a late night feasting session in the center and wants to retreat to some corner, she walks to the edge on autopilot. To do this, she picks some starting strand and walks along it until she meets the first bridge associated with that strand. She'll cross the bridge and go to the other strand, and then keeps walking outwards till she meets another bridge. Then she'll cross that bridge, repeat the process until there are no more bridges on the current strand, and then she will walk to the end of the current strand. Note that Char Charlotte must cross all the bridges she meets. So basically, she's going to walk outwards on a strand, right. and if she ever reaches a, reaches a bridge that goes to an adjacent strand, right. she'll follow that. Right. And the question, I think, is which strand does she end up on? But we'll, we'll keep reading to see if that's true. So Charlotte's favorite corner to sleep during the daytime is the end of strand S. So for each possible starting strand, she wants to know the minimum number of bridges to add to the original web to end up at strand S. She can add a bridge at any point along the strand, as long as the added ones do not touch any original bridge. Uh, two endpoints of an added bridge must have the same distance to the starting or to the the spider web, mm -hmm. and each bridge must connect two adjacent strands. Right. Yeah. And so this problem, uh, this problem, I think, is loosely inspired by a, uh, I believe, uh, it's a Korean folklore game, um, but it might just be e e East Asian in general, um, called uh, Ghost Ladder, um, and it's it's actually kind of a common way of. Um, of, of picking random numbers. So instead of being on a circular, instead of being on a circular grid, you're actually just on a. You, you pick a bunch of lines and you put a bunch of bridges between them. And in order to like kind of do eeny meeny miny mo, you just put a bunch of bridges kind of randomly, and then you have one person just trace the path from, you know, the first strand on top and see which strand it ends up at the bottom. Yeah, it makes sense. It, it's certainly hard to see initially uh, right. what starting strand would map to what ending strand. Right. So maybe the, the difference here is instead of thinking about it as just a bunch of vertical lines, right. you've got like the vertical lines, but they're on a cylinder. 
Right. And then you can wrap around. So the right, first, right. The so first there, one there's a little bit extra of uh, wrapping around. But the the what the really interesting thing about this problem is uh, that we're trying to find the minimum number of bridges to add to make this uh, to, uh, to to make the path work. It looks like the bounds are pretty big. So n goes up to two hundred thousand. You can have two hundred thousand uh, like vertical lines or strands going outward from the spider web, and also half a million bridges to start with. Right, right. And we we are trying to reach. Uh, we're trying to reach. Uh, we're trying to find the answer for every single starting point. So you actually you don't, you can't even just uh, just do it once. You actually have to do it for every point all at once. So there are certainly some observations you got to make about this problem before starting it because right. obviously this like there there are patterns here and there's some stuff you can do, but you have to have a better understanding of exactly how this kind of thing works. Right. Uh, before you're you're able to start typing any code. Right, Anything right. that I can think of initially seems like it would definitely. Uh, at the very least, be n squared. Right, right. Well, one interesting thing you can do to avoid uh, having to deal with the fact that uh, every uh, you want to solve it from every starting strand is you can uh, is you can kind of reverse the process. You can realize that if you just reverse the process, uh, the the path you take is still the same. So if you start at strand s and go backwards towards the center, then you know kind of it, it just traces the same path in reverse, right? It still is deterministic. Yeah, so you can imagine instead of Charlotte's walking uh, from the inside out, she's walking from the outside in. Right. That might help a little bit. Right. But you you still have to know like when when might you add an edge, and you might need to use some sort of data structure to consider right. uh, adding an edge from every position to every other position. Right. Right. Yeah. And, and I think uh, yeah, I, I think when choosing when to add edges, uh, I think the biggest observation there is that you should never use the same edge twice. If you, I mean, it's not even possible, right? Add the uh, same edge twice in a row consecutively, like right, there right. and back. Yeah, right. yeah, exactly. Because that, that's just a total waste. And so, um, oh, we've got a, an example of what this looks like here on the stream. You can look at uh, this is an example of the diagram from problem I, and right. you can see how as you go out, you follow the red path and you you cross twice the two adjacent. Uh, right. Right. Adjacent bridges, I think they're called. Right. And so, uh, and uh, yeah, I think we, we can leave it to uh, the analysis, which will probably come in a little bit to fully explain the solution. Um, but there definitely are a lot of things to think about. Um, while we've been talking, UC, Utokyo has also solved problem F. Problem um, F? Oh my goodness. All which right. puts them back, back in the first. lead over MIT. Um, you know, they well, one thing to remember is that they have, even though they're in the lead on penalty, they uh, they got to four problems a little later, and so they might or might not have a little more penalty on the remaining problems. So you know, a little little more penalty early, but a little more time to work on the later problems is MIT, and and uh, but Utopia has less penalty and uh, maybe a little less time working on the later problems. Yeah, it looks like there are several problems that teams in general have solved. So the the, the set isn't terribly. Uh, unbalanced in the sense that there are a bunch of easy problems and then a bunch of really, really hard problems. Right. So it seems like MIT has a little bit of an advantage, which isn't shown in the scoreboard here, that they've been able to spend terminal time typing the solution to maybe, maybe problem maybe J, F or maybe, maybe problem, problem J. F, maybe problem I even. Yeah, maybe even problem B. Maybe B, yeah. And uh, Utokyo is, is just now getting that time. So right. it's even closer than the scoreboard might make it look. Right. And MIT actually just solved problem J. Um, and oh, just so, now! Oh my goodness! And, so and they're they, back. They are back in the lead, and so you know we'll we'll see how many scoreboard switches there are, but it's certainly shaping up to be a lot. This is this is looking like it's going to be an incredibly entertaining world final. So I hope you guys are along for the ride and enjoying it almost as much as we are in the commentary booth here. Right. But yeah, this is this is a, a fun set. Right. Um, yeah, so we also have some, the judges have also been telling us a little bit about problem uh, problem F solutions. Uh, there have been two accepted solutions so far, but actually neither of them use binary search. Uh, I, I, I think we haven't quite read the problems, so and we're not really sure where what that's supposed to yeah, mean yet. Yeah, what you're even binary searching um, for, but yeah. But it, it is interesting that they, they neither of them use the more common approach that the judges expected. Um, it sounds like this problem might have a lot of different approaches to, to be solved. And uh, yeah, I think that's that, I think that kind of thing is a really interesting facet of algorithms in general. Like um, sometimes there are a lot of different ways to do something, uh, and they all kind of work in different ways. They're all fast for different reasons, or maybe if you study them closer, you might realize that they're all fast for the same reason. So maybe they're all uh, they actually all uh, they actually all are look our binaries are just you know in slightly different orders or something. And so there's definitely a lot of uh, interesting stuff uh, if you start looking at that. 
it looks like a couple of minutes ago, Swarthmore submitted to Problem G. And uh, Swarthmore is the team that has Geothermal on it, who is pretty well known within the Code Forces community, I'd say. Right. Uh, they submitted uh, an optimized uh, log n, so they optimized their, their linear approach to, to log n on Problem G but they needed to make it order one in order to get it accepted. Right. Uh, so the judges are telling us they're they're close, but they got some some ways to go here. Yeah, so like I mentioned earlier, Swarthmore has, has Geothermal on it. Right. And Geothermal recently earned Legendary Grandmaster on Code Forces. He is... As of the last contest during... which happened during ICPC World Finals, right? During uh, last or maybe, World Finals? Maybe he maybe he achieved it a little earlier. No, like during this World Finals. Ah, uh, a little a little uh, before this World Finals. A little before this World Finals. Yeah, yeah. But he but it was still it was still pretty recent. It's the last contest he's done, I believe. Right. Uh, and he's one of the the few World Finals from North America. Right. He's the only one from North America to not have won an IOI gold medal. Oh wow. Yeah. That's uh, that's pretty interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. A lot of uh, a lot of North American contestants. Um, a lot of North American contestants kind of. We, first of all, we can calculate for each of the sequence its, its total balance Ti and its minimum, avail, minimum balance Mi. Then we need to split. So for example, in the, in the, in the, problem, in the sample from the problem statement, the, the second sequence has, has total balance plus 2, while the first has total ba balance minus 2. Let's just split all sequences we have to those who are who are, have positive total impact and those who have negative total impact. We, we, will, we will get always positive impact first and always negative impact next. But we need to properly sort them inside. Each, each, of, next, each of next positive one allows us to get even more positive one. So we, can, we actually can get any which we're allowed to get now. So the valid solution is just to get any possible positive sequence and uh, until we until we can until we get all of them but this is too slow to make it faster we need to sort them by decreasing of minimum balance which is negative so by increasing its absolute value and then just sort and just and then just check if it works with negative one we need to use similar greedy or we can just reverse them and replace open brackets with closed one and get, and, and get the positive case that's all For more from the ICPC World Finals DACA, follow us at news.icpc.global and on social media with our hashtag ICPCWL. What a nice voice that was there. All right. So, uh, yeah, a couple quick announcements about... Uh about geothermal that we were, <laughs> we were working on before. Uh, turns out he's from Swarthmore University, which is the only liberal arts college to qualify for World Finals this year. Uh, he is also working on uh, a course. He's like running a course. And with, with one of his teammates and his coach, I believe, <laughs> teaching competitive programming right. and, and like computer science interview questions. And this is something that's that's mostly due to, to his success working on this. Uh, just a quick note here. We have a quick diagram on problem F. Uh, problem F is about, you know, we, we, we're given a polygon and uh, we have some segments and we want to kind of find a viewing angle so that all, all polygons would be covered by these segments. Um, that, that's just a quick summary of the problem. Sounds like kind of a tricky We've, geometry problem. Maybe if you think about it a bit more, there are some, some simplifications, but... Uh... Right. It, it do, does sound pretty tricky. And honestly, I'm... I, I would never. Uh, I would be too scared to implement such a problem so early in the contest. For the number of ways you could get it wrong and the amount of code it probably requires, it might be a good thing to work on a bit later. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. All right. And uh, what else? What else? We have uh, last last fun fact about geothermal here. Mm -hmm. He unfortunately missed out on Facebook Hacker Cup with a double fail system tests. Aww. He was the only one to miss out in that way, and if, even if he failed just one of the problems, he still would have made it because he was so fast. Uh, so hopefully he'll be able to overcome this this rough start and make it climb climb the scoreboard. Right. Uh, I know he was he was hoping to earn a medal this contest. So right. We'll, right. We'll be cheering for him see if he can do that. Right. And uh, back here it looks like Seoul National University has gotten the first solve on problem B. Oh my goodness! Another dark green. Right. And so they, they, this is their fourth, fourth problem, so they're still behind the top two teams, uh, which are at the moment MIT and Utopia. Um, but they are, you know, they are up there, and they have proven that problem B can be solved. 
The first four teams at the end of this will earn a gold medal. Right. And Stoll University just is is now in, in third place, right. which gives them the gold medal. Obviously, being in first place, being the, the ICPC champion, champion. team is uh, what, what everyone's going for here. But a gold medal is nevertheless very impressive. Right, right. It looks like Warsaw is is uh up next the best team with three problems right let's see if they can pull a fourth out of their hat here right and move back into the top three range right after all they do have quite good penalty only 115 penalty points so right far. right 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 now it looks like we have about um six teams that is that right that have six problems solved uh, that have at least three problems three solved. or more yeah six problems and, and uh, six teams, at least three we problems. have maybe uh you know two dozen teams that have two problems solved and, and quite a few more with one. Uh, it right. Looks like there there is a little bit of a drop off after problem H. Right. Problem H it definitely is definitely is a bit easier than any of the rest, and there's definitely a lot of branching. All right. So Andrew, I've got a couple questions for you. All right. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Andrew is Eknerwala on Code Forces. Right. He's an LGM, one of the the best, probably the probably the best from from uh, from United States. Um, maybe, maybe not anymore. Certainly up there. Cer certainly, certainly one of the top. A very, very strong competitor, nevertheless. Right. A legendary grandmaster. Uh, and for those of you who don't know what Eknerwala means, right. I guess I'll have you explain that very briefly, because right. I know lots of people's eyes are opened when they first learn it. Right, well, my, my middle name is, so I, I first made this username in, like, middle school, uh, when I was, you know, just signing up for, like, Art of problem solving and other other random forums, and I was like, I didn't want it to be directly, you know, connected to me. So I, I took my middle name and I I, I I turned it backwards, and that gives Ecknerwall. And the, the reason I did this is, you know, just so that people uh, people couldn't really tell, uh, you know. You know, it's not obviously me, right? My name is Andrew. I don't. I never tell anyone my name is Lawrence. You right? still have a way out in case yeah, you yeah. not for you. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and then at some point, I just I realized that you know to. to it's sometimes taken, and so I, I put the, put the A on the end. You know, it's better than the one. I think it looks and, prettier. Yeah, yeah, and the the A makes a lot of sense because right. my first name is is Andrew. Right, right. So A Lawrence backwards would be Ecknerwalla. Right, right. There you go. Yeah. All right. So we got we got some questions for you, Andrew. So uh, during the North American Championship stream, right, you talked about how you're a me melee player, and right. you learned a lot of that from Scott. Right. Who's another uh, very very talented programmer from the U.S. Uh, and uh, we will continue talking about problem uh, about, about melee in a bit. We have priorities here, people. Priorities. We're gonna watch the problem L solution video uh, coming, coming right up, up right now. The problem L is one of the easier problem in this contest is called where am I? The idea of a problem is that uh, we're given a, a part of an infinite grid where some crosses are placed on uh, part of the cells. There are no more than 100 crosses and uh, then they're used for a positional positioning algorithm. Uh, the positioning algorithm works by going in a clockwise spiral from a point from a starting point and observing all crosses and trying to match them to the expected positions of those crosses on the grid therefore determining the cell where the path was started uh, it can be proved that any starting point uh, will be able to be to be identified uh, by this algorithm because the number of crosses is finite and during this traversal we will eventually encounter all of them. However, for every cell, there, after some number of steps we can already uniquely identify the cell and uh, that's exactly when the prefix of the observed sequence is unique. The exact task is to determine maximum and expected number of steps uh, for all of the cells on the part of the grid. There is an obvious naive solution, which is to uh, generate all the traces covering the whole grid from every possible starting point, and then construct a prefix tree out of them, 
uh, and then uh, it's quite easy to determine uh, the length of a prefix which is sufficient for uh, positioning. The problem is that the complexity of this solution is uh, number of cells squared, which is too much because the number of cells can be 10,000. However, the smarter way is to use the fact that there are no more than 100 uh, x's and uh, therefore by encoding the whole sequence uh, only by positions of those axes or the indices of those axes in the sequence. Uh, in this case, uh, we encode every trace by only 100 integers and uh, comparing those uh, sequences with each other can be done in the same way as comparing the original uh, traces, which is just lexicographical order. So if we put them later in a prefix tree or a similar data structure, we'll be able to obtain uh, the length of uh, the prefix sufficient for the positioning. By doing this for every possible starting point, uh, it's easy to then obtain the necessary uh, statistics for the outputs, like the maximum and the average number. For more from the ICPC World Finals DACA, follow us at news.icpc.global and on social media with our hashtag ICPCWFDACA. All right, welcome back. We have an analyst here. This is Nick Wu. Nick, do you want to explain your, your handle to everyone? Hi, everyone. My name is Nick. Uh, my handle on Code Forces is uh, X I A O W U C 1, and this is pronounced Shou Kone. Uh, most people uh, pronounce it like Shou Wook, and they omit the one, but in fact, uh, what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to to take the one, interpret it as a word, and then C1 is actually cone. Uh, so yeah, a lot of, there are some people who just go around and call me cone. So I guess, that's yeah, pretty yeah. funny. We've had, uh, we've had Eknerwala, we've got, we've got this one, and then we've got, uh, I guess I'm just second thread, which isn't, isn't quite as interesting, but it's part of, part of being a Java programmer, I guess. So welcome to the stream, first of all. Uh, we've got a very interesting contest here, the scoreboard seems to indicate there isn't a very clear order of which problems to solve. It seems like it's not just necessarily easiest to hardest. And uh, we've seen quite a bit of variety in terms of what teams are trying. Indeed, indeed. Like, um, so on on our end, like, we, we got a brief overview of the problems, like, shortly before the start of the contest. And as, um, as I was, like... Uh, looking looking for the problem set and, and trying to evaluate like, oh, which problems are easy, which problems are hard, I was like, hmm, there's like one really hard problem and a couple like pretty standard annoying implementation problems and so on, but in the middle there's like a pretty very like flat difficulty curve. So, um, yeah, it's, it's uh, interesting just sort of seeing like which uh, problems teams are going for like problem H is probably by far like the easiest problem, but it's it's still like non-trivial. There's there's a it's easy to get it wrong, and then after that it kind of there's just like a lot of stuff that's like uh, I, accessible. I don't mean to interrupt you here, Nick, but we just got an AC from U Tokyo on problem G. This is a dark green first solve of problem G. Uh, and this cuts down the number of unsolved problems quite a bit here. It looks like we have a very reasonable set of unsolved problems left. Uh, and it's a, a, a fun fun set for contestants where there's a lot of things that might be something they can solve. Indeed. Uh, I actually am the analyst who will be responsible for recording a solution to problem G. Um, and... do, you, do you know how to do it yet? Yes, I do know how okay, to do it. Right. The, moment, the moment it was read to me, I was like... I actually have seen this problem before, and I know how to do this problem. Well, we know Utopio has a lot of very experienced competitors, including Maroon RK. Mm -hmm. And uh, with if you're the one running at Coder, or Code Forces, or, or anything that big, that famous, uh, if something is a known problem, you know how to do it. Yeah, actually, if you if you asked me which team would be the first to solve this problem, I probably I would have told you like uh, Utopio. 
um, and that might be a little bit of a, a spoiler for what the uh, the solution is. But to to, to maybe leak a little bit more, um, there is a programming contest series called Open Cup. Okay. Um, and so Open Cup is a is a series of like very hard ICPC style contests that run. Um, the difficulty goes from like you know probably slightly easier than the average world finals to like insanely harder than the than the world finals. Um, and I believe it was it might not have been like Utopia, but it was like a, a contingent of like folks from Japan who published a contest, and they had a contest where like some like I want to say like a third or a half of the people. Uh, or a further half of the problems, uh, all required some usage of a technique known as FFT, or Fast Fourier Transform. FFT? Oh my goodness. That is, FFT is one of those things where, you know, most of the time, knowing a solution to a problem requires a very large amount of information. But in certain cases, there are a couple key words you can say, and just saying that word will spoil it for contestants. There's flow, there's FFT, there's like simplex, and I guess to some degree there's DP, but there's a lot left with DP. But for the first three, just knowing that it's a, a problem of that topic is something that uh, contestants really want to know, and it requires quite a bit of ingenuity to figure out. Yeah, um, and so the, the this problem really does just boil down to like, do you know FFT? Do you have FFT in your in your team reference document? Um, and then there is like this little trick. So earlier I sent in a message to live saying like, uh, Swarthmore University they uh, had a solution where they use they call FFT a logarithmic number of times, but you actually have to use it a constant number of times uh, in order to solve the problem. So it is not sufficient. So. Um, it is not sufficient to just know FFT. You have to be very clever and figure out how to only do it once. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it looks like we're going to be looking at, at problem J in just a minute here. Um, but any any uh, closing interesting ideas you can fulfill in 40 seconds here, Nick? What do you think uh, about the set? I think this set is really interesting. Um, We'll see if it if any team can solve all the problems in the set. I think it'll be a, it'll be a tough challenge, um, but I think that the scoreboard will be really interesting, like through up to scoreboard freeze and pass, and you know, uh, we'll we'll see which teams come out on top. It should be a fun set. Uh, we're gonna look at one of the most approachable problems we've seen uh, H so far, and uh, another solution video just now. Here is the third one for you. This is problem. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Mishov and I will be explaining a solution to problem J, a split stream. So this is a problem about gates. We have two types of gates, a split gate and a merge gate. These gates are processing sequences of integers. For the split gate, uh, if you have a sequence that is coming in, then it is alternately sent to the left and the right output. So you have a sequence that is one, two, three, four, and so on. And then one goes left, two goes right, three goes left, four goes right, and so on. Uh, the merge gate is the exact opposite. So we have two input streams and one output stream. Uh, what I think it's merging in the order left and right, alternately, until it runs out of one of them, and if, when it runs out of one of the streams, then it just continues taking elements from the other one. All of these sequences are finite, uh, so, some, uh, so eventually they will run out. What we are given in the input is a description of an entire network of such gates. We are starting with a single input, and the input is plugged into a split gate, and there can be multiple other gates connected, and so on. And onto the input stream, there is a sequence of up to 10 to the 9 elements that is entering the entire system. Now, the entire system can have up to 10 to the 4 nodes, and now we are given a collection of 10 to the 3 queries. Each, in each of the queries, we are given one specific wire in the network, and we are given an index, k, and we are asked what is the value of the kth element that is traveling along this particular wire in the network. 
So how can we answer such queries? The tricky part is what happens with merging uh, with uh, when we are merging sequences of unequal lengths because if everything were infinite then uh, it would be very easy if you are splitting you are splitting according to parity and when you are merging again you know that the uh, odd numbered elements are coming from the left and the even number elements are coming from the right but if the sequences are finite they can have different lengths then uh, you can have uh, more complicated situations and the answer to this is that you can uh, determine everything you need as long as you know what is the size of each of these streams. So we can start at the very top of the network and go from the top to the bottom. And for each of the, uh, out of the wires in the network, we can compute the number of elements that reach this wire. So whenever we have a split, then uh, a half rounded up goes left, half rounded down goes right. Whenever we have a merge, then it's the sum of the sizes of the two input streams. And now when we know these sizes, we can answer each query by doing the exact opposite, by going up the network. So now we can enter a gate, and when we know the sizes of the... So if it's a, a split gate, we know how to merge those two incoming streams back into the first. So we can, what we can do is we can recompute the new index in the previous stream, and this way we can propagate it all the way to the top. Uh, the last reminder about this problem is we just need to be careful about uh, the implementation. So, for example, if you are given the number n of gates in the network, you have to realize that the number of wires in the network can be up to roughly two, to, two times n, not just n. And also, you need to be careful not to overflow in the situations where you are given an index of an element that doesn't, doesn't exist. So there can be queries where the answer is none, there is no such element, and you need to handle those carefully. And that's it about this problem. For more from the ICPC World Finals DACA, follow us at news.icpc.global and on social media with our hashtag ICPCWFDACA. What an end transition. Oh my goodness. All right. Welcome back, Nick. Uh, we have a very interesting scoreboard, and I think it would be great to talk about that a bit. So of the unsolved problems, we have just D, E, and K. And one of the things you'll notice is that the, the 90 minute mark has just passed. So we are officially just over 90 minutes into contest. There's usually a heuristic that goes with the 90 minute mark. Do you want to explain what that is briefly to people? Yeah, so the 90, the 90 minute heuristic uh, talks about uh, what does a team need to do in order to be able to get a medal at the ICPC World Finals. And, and to clarify, a medal here is in the top 12 teams. Yeah, so there are the top 12 teams, and they're broken into the top four getting a gold medal, uh, the next four, ranks 5 through 8, getting a silver medal, and then ranks 9 through 12, getting a bronze medal. Um, and so the 90-minute heuristic says that in order to get a gold medal at the World Finals, um, imagine that like n is the number of problems that have been solved by the 90-minute mark, so here n is 9. Um, in order to get a gold medal, you have to solve uh, three problems on top of the nine problems that have already been solved in the contest. So in this case, um, the heuristic would say that you have to solve every problem in the set in order to get a gold medal. All 12 of them. Now, to be fair, that, that seems a little unlikely. That the, the heuristic applies in this particular case, but we'll get to that in just a minute. Right, and so just to keep on going down uh, for this heuristic, so in order to get a silver medal, you solve two problems on top of the nine. So in this case, you would have to solve 11 problems to get a silver, and then to get a bronze medal, you have to solve one problem on top of the nine. So you have to solve 10 problems to get a bronze medal. Um, so yes, in this situation, the, the heuristic probably doesn't apply. Um, it seems like the it, it would it would be very uh, interesting if multiple teams were able to completely finish the set, given that I think that's only ever happened once in in recent history. Um, so we would probably expect in this situation the the gold is like to get gold, you would have to solve eleven problems. That's yeah, there's there's an interesting thing that comes up here where teams kind of have to mentally modify their heuristic, maybe change their plans a bit, because it seems like the problem set has a lot of borderline medium hard problems and not a lot of crazy hard problems and not a lot of crazy easy problems. So the set is pretty flat, but it's flat at what appears to be just the right level. 
uh, just at the, the edge of what teams are able to do. And it looks like different teams are trying trying different problems here, a bit more than they usually would on a normal World Finals. Yeah. Um, so in, in this situation, like, um, the hard problems themselves are, well, we can see that problems D, E, and K are, are the hardest problems on the set. And if you look at the problems, they actually all look extremely intimidating. Um, like, one of them is, is, a, is a classic, like, hard geometry problem, and those are a, a, a mainstay in World Finals. You have a cool card trick problem. Hey, really quick, really quick. We got an AC from Saratov State University. They just got problem G, which is a, a very tricky problem here. Uh, just recently dark greened by Utokyo. And fun fact about them, they have the shortest total code forces handle lengths, 4 plus 4 plus 5, other than University of Wisconsin, which is just 3, because they only have one member, uh, which code forces handle has a length of 3. All right, anyway, sorry. Please continue talking about the problems, Nick. Didn't mean to uh, Yes, yes. So we're talking about the three hardest problems in the set, the ones that are unsolved. So the second problem is a problem about a, a, about a classic card trick. Um, if you've seen the classic card trick of someone gives you five cards and uh, you're supposed to give, you, you give your friend four of those cards and then they have to guess the fifth card, the card that you have left in your hand. So, the, so one of the problems is an extension of this trick and it's extremely hard. And then there's another problem that looks like a graph theory problem but is actually secretly probably a, another geometry problem honestly. Interesting. These mix and to topic problems are always tricky because, uh, in particular, if you're not a crazy good team where everyone can do everything perfectly, if you're if you're one of the middle teams and you have like one person who's your geometry guy, one person who's your graph theory guy, and you're like, ah, oh, this is a geometry problem, throw it to to Jeff here. Ah, uh, this is a, a graph theory problem, throw it to Alice. And then Bob is sitting here looking at the rest of the problems. You might run into this problem where the geometry guy doesn't see this. And uh, could be could be quite a big uh, issue if you're not careful there. So yeah, that, that's that's something that might trip teams up. Um, and something you want to be careful for. For sure, for sure. So, you know, one of the biggest one of the biggest difficulties in, in problem in, in solving problems is is knowing like what sort of technique um, to apply. And so this one here, like, you know, a, a geometry problem that doesn't look like a geometry problem is actually really terrifying. You, you were talking about the spider, the spider web problem earlier. That's not actually a geometry problem, even though it kind of looks like it. It looks like it, but it's not. But the one that isn't a geometry problem, or that doesn't look like one, but really is, uh, can be even more scary because you might go after it and then realize you're out of your depth. All right. Uh, well, backing off of these hard unsolved problems so far, we have a solution video to problem A and we hope you enjoy. Here is a solution for problem A, crystal crossfeeds. We have a grid of cells, some of, some of which are, are colored, and we don't know that grid, but we have some partial information about it and want to restore the initial grid. Formally, we have some views for some sides. We have a view with some vector, which means that we see only points which are not covered by something else. For example, we don't see these two points on the first picture because they are covered by next one, and we don't see this one point on the second picture because it's covered by the by next one. So we give given such an information and need to restore minimal and maximal possible sets of the points which can be which can be colored. Actually, what information do we have? First of all, each point which exists in any picture exists because otherwise we won't be able to see it. On the other hand, some this means that some other picture, that some other points which would be which, which would shade the, the visible points does not exist. For example, this point does not exist because otherwise one point won't be visible, and and so is true for a lot of other points. On the other side, we for some points we know for sure they doesn't exist because they will surely be visible. For example, this point surely does not exist because there is nothing nothing that can hide it. It's, it's just located outside of the grid. So when we know that some point is visible, we can be sure we can ensure that it's not hidden by something. When we see that 
some points is invisible, we can ensure that some point does not exist because otherwise, because it's nothing that can hide it. And we can propagate this information recursively. After we do all of that, which can be done in linear, in linear time by breadth-first search or depth-first search, like algorithm, we are, have some points which surely exist, some, po some points which surely don't exist, and some points we don't know. Actually, it's happened that with points which we don't know, we can either get them all or don't get them all, which obviously produce minimal and maximum possible values. It's, it's not hard to prove that both of these will be correct solution. It requires some analysis of the graphs. We are actually doing the breadth first search or depth first search. And they would just be in a single component, which with this solution consistent in this independent component. That's all. For more from the ICPC World Finals DACA, follow us at news.icpc.global and on social media with our hashtag ICPCWFDACA. All right, we have another guest here. Uh, we have Jan from the University of Warsaw. Correct. Welcome very much. So, first of all, your team is doing terrific. At the moment, they're they're on their way to a gold medal if they can keep doing this well. They have four they, problems, and they're the best of all the teams with four problems. And I believe they were on the gold medal uh, scale before I came here. Yeah, they've been they've been doing very well the whole and time. What is the current position? Uh, at the moment, they are in third place. Third place, not third too place. bad. Not too bad. So, as I understand, University of Warsaw has quite the history of doing very well in these ICPC contests. That's true. First of all, we're at our 27th final in a row. 27 in a row. You haven't yes. missed a single one. We haven't missed a single one since 1995, which was Nashville, Tennessee. And we went there almost by accident, I would say, because we knew nothing about the contest in 94. We went to Amsterdam, the team went to Amsterdam, such an unknown team from knowing nothing of the contest, and they won. Next year, and then we went to Tennessee. They, they won World Finals? Yes. Or the, or the regionals? The regionals. Regionals, regionals. Regional, okay. and that's the way we advanced to the final. <clears throat> Next year, the Central European contest started. It's in Bratislava, and I sent, I went with two teams, the first one splitting into two, and one team won. And this is what we repeat for almost 30 years. That's that's incredible. Uh, at World Finals, what's the best that you're, the teams you coach have ever done? Well, we won in 2003. And first place in World Finals, the, the world yes. champions. And it was a very special one because it was in March in Beverly Hills when Oscar awards were given. And we, the event took place at the same hotel where the actors were living. So lots of journalists came. Did you get to see any because, anyone people be, would, would be, know? Be, well, I shake hand with Sean Connery. It was, ah, uh, he yeah. Was, it was very nice. Anyway, uh, the journalists were shocked that we were first lead, leading and then winning. And they asked many nasty questions, including <laughs> where is Poland, where is the University of Warsaw, where is Europe? So, oh, man. But it, it became very well known because of the American journalists. They advertised the fact that we won. And it has changed the thinking of big, large IT companies. They first tried to pick up some of the gifted guys, but many of them didn't want to go out. And this was opening the door to IT companies in Poland. And we repeated it, and by the way, it was such a very nice winning one problem more than the next. Yeah, it's one thing to win on penalty, where you're just like yes. a little bit faster, but when you win on problems, there's yes. a satisfaction there and of knowing that, that, that you're better. <laughs> that was my answer to one of the journalists who asked me, are you shocked that you, you are winning? I said, why should I be shocked? We are from Poland. <laughs> this made me angry. So I said, like, look, we came here with two goals, the minimum and maximum. The minimum was to win, the maximum was to knock down. And that was basically to, to solve at least one problem more than the next. And we repeated it in 2007 in Tokyo, the same way, one problem more than, than the rest. So there were two best years. But if I look at the history of contestants from, from uh, Tokyo, two of them they were students in 2007. 
two of them are professors at our university. So in the meantime, they got MSc, PhD, so-called habilitation and position of a professor. They're very good scientists. And they, the thing I am very proud of is that we managed to build more or less a sort of school, I would say. So it's my role has completely changed from those previous years. I'm not teaching them programming because they do it much, much better. I'm not teaching them problem solving because they do it much better. But we have previous contestants who became co-coaches. And we have also published edition of ICPC for 20, no, 30 years, no, 25 years. And uh, we use no more. <laughs> I have to remember. Anyway, uh, that also became very popular. And the obvious question is, how come we are so good? And it depends on students, and which means you have to have good students. It, not only is it just like you need a lot of talent, but in addition, yes. you need this, this rolling ball effect. You need yes. the students who have already graduated feed in to help train the new ones. But if you don't have good students, you wouldn't do too well. And to have good students, you have to invest, become interested in school age. And what happens at schools, we organize Olympiad of Informatics at the very beginning. Olympiad in Mathematics is very well known in Poland in 70 years. Plus, there is such an organization called Published Children Fund, which helps gifted kids at school age to develop. Not, not too many who can take care of, I say we because I'm involved in it. And those first contestants, I met them when they were 13, 14, school age, then they came to university, and that's the way it works. But probably you want to ask me some questions, but I'm talking myself. No, I mean, of course, I, I certainly certainly have some. I know the, the Polish Olympiad Informatics POI is uh, very, very that, prominent. That, that's the one which I mentioned. I, and, and I know I this is a... I was involved in creation of the like, Olympiad, and I'm in it, in this committee from the very beginning. Uh, a colleague of mine who is official now the coach, I'm somehow replacing him this year. He wanted to retire, but he decided not to come here. Anyway, uh, he is the chairman of the committee. We organized the International IOI in 2005, I think, if I'm not mistaken. So we're very much involved in it. I, I know there's a, a history of POI having very interesting problems. And uh, some of the problems that we've trained on have actually been those Polish problems, but manually translated into English. There is a book in English also with problems. Looking for a challenge? Yes. That's Looking a classic. So, so you know. <laughs> it's, uh, I know one of the authors of it is Tomasz Izadek. Tomasz Izadek. Izadek, sorry. Ah, okay. My pronunciation's a, a bit a bit American. Uh, yes, he is. Yes, I know him very well. We were together in 2005 in Shanghai. Oh, man, nice. Very nice. As, as a contestant, and he did pretty well. He himself sold four problems. That's very impressive. Uh, yeah, he, you might, you might not know this, but he actually came to the University of Central Florida, UCF, and he helped coach our team as well. He helped teach us a bit. Yes, I and know. I learned a bunch from he him. He did a lot of international actions, and he's very much engaged in the Polish Olympiad and responsible for problems as well. And I think if you're interested here at home, you can get the newer copy of his book, There's Looking for a Challenge 2, with even more exciting problems and even more new things to learn. That's true. That's true. And uh, we have here a very interesting team from Oxford. It's from still, Oxford? Yes. Where? Uh, what, what's their name? The University of Oxford. Great okay. Britain. And wh why I'm saying this? Because the current coach is my contestant from 1997. So you trained him? Him. <laughs> he, was, he was the finalist in 1997 in San Jose and then in 1998 and then he became a, got the same he spent many years in different places then went back to poland got his habilitation so called such a scientific title above phd became a professor at the university 
but this year he moved to Oxford and while being in Oxford he started immediately to become a coach of the team and he is here with Bartosz Klin, he is here with, with the team and as I have noticed they are doing pretty well. Uh, yeah, so not only is University of Warsaw in third place at the moment, but University of Oxford is in, I think, 21st place with two problems. Of the teams with two problems, they have the best penalty point score. So if they're able to get a couple more, then they'll, they'll fly up the scoreboard to be doing quite well. And some of our previous contestants were also coaches in some different places in the world. But I even don't remember, don't want to tell you examples, but we've had this. Yeah, I mean, between Tomas and, and all of the books that you've published and, and having coaches at multiple universities, it, it really uh, improves competitive programming, not just for, for your school, but for everybody. And, and did you watch during the opening the game, the, the, the game solving between two contestants? Two the er, Eric Doe versus uh, Andrew He, Hector Walla, in, in Kotlin? Yes. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. Now, but this one was our contestant. Twice the final. So, Agner Wallace? Camille? No, Camille. Camille? Oh, sorry, not Agner Wallace. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah. He was replacing Agner. Replacing uh, identity. Because of, of illness. But Camille, Camille was twice in the final. He, he has a, a bunch of experience. Yes, yes he's one of the people many true. people look up to. And I'm sure uh, many of you guys have, have heard of him. This is Eric Doe. Uh, he's, he's been in LGM on Good Forces before. I think yes. he may have dropped a little bit recently, but he is, yeah, an ex LGM and, and very he's, popular. He's also well. teaching, teaching at high school in Germany. And it's a very good, very good idea, as I said earlier. To be successful at university, you have to involve yourself and look at high school level, because if you have a good teacher, you become interested. If you have a bad teacher, you start to hate mathematics and computer science. Uh, in fact, he will be he will be joining us, Camille, in in just a few minutes here. You'll probably see him on the way out. Oh, I see. Uh, and if we have a good transition to another video, yeah, we'll we'll great. give you a chance to shake hi with this, shake hands with him and say hi and and everything great. like that. Um, all right. Well, welcome. Do you have any any fun stories about University of Warsaw about the contestants? Anything fun that they did? Uh, that you'd like to share on stream with everybody else? Uh, well, as, as I mentioned, basically the, the two weeks were very important for us. And, uh, in Beverly Hills, our team brought suits and ties. Suits and ties, so like, they look very formal. Uh, the only team. And during the closing ceremony, when we were not sure what position we have, first or second, we, were, we expected the first, but it was not yet known officially. I said to the guys, why don't we sit in front rows to watch to this scene? To look at the not where it's at the end. That way they have a really long walk. And Everyone can watch them the whole time, time in the, the procession. Cameras. Yeah. And it was, it was funny, it was nice. As I mentioned, that winning had a big influence on IT companies with respect to Poland. And we got many letters from many people from all over the world later being happy that we won. One, one of the Polish guys, I think nothing to do with the University of Warsaw, but working in the States, he said he bought, he bought a number of New York Times copies of with with those information about our winning, underline red, and says, ha, ha, ha. It shows that this winning was, oh, and by the way, we were also greeted and invited by the president of Poland. And I think it was the first time when ICPC winning was moved to, to let's say, higher level in the state. In Poland, where our teams were often invited by the Prime Minister, by not, not now, but in the past. And also, of course, the director of the university, etc., etc. So, uh, if you had to take a guess here, well, first of all, yes, have you taken a look at any of the problems yet? To tell you the truth, it's not for me anymore. Okay. <laughs> it's not too difficult for me. 
so I'm not I'm not trying even to usually it takes me longer time to read than than to solve you got so much experience solving them that, that that's <laughs> yeah, not the hard part it's reading the flavor text so if you take a look at the scoreboard here you've got is it uh, ooh, Warsaw has has dropped slightly they're now in fifth place oh uh, they've been passed by Seoul National University and the National Research University School of Economics. But it looks like they've got a lot of options left of problems they might want to try and solve. And they have, do we have any solution? Uh, it looks like they got one wrong answer on L. So here's my question for you. Which problem do you think they will go after next, and what do you think their next AC will be? Do you think it'll be problem L? They'll keep keep trying that, or do you think they'll, they'll look at maybe problem I? I has a few solves, F has has quite a few, they don't quite have F yet. Uh, G and B also have solves. Cannot, cannot give any hints, because... Don't want to reveal their strategy. They, no, they have their own idea sometimes, sometimes strange okay. for us, yeah. because they attack a problem which they like, not necessarily which is, simply though the shortage of first is the winning strategy. Oh, wait, wait, they are just trying now. Oh, they've got a submission on problem F. Let's take a look at it. It looks like they got it. That's an AC on problem F. Let's see where Warsaw moves up to then. Great that you could be on stream for that. <laughs> what a coincidence. All right. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, here we go. It looks like the scoreboard is still, still processing it. They did get it right, though. Not to spoil it for anyone. Um, I guess we, if we, we needed to, we could do the math, but it looks like they're back in third place. Uh, back in gold medal range. So. They're slightly behind Utokyo on penalty, but okay. uh, if they're going to win on problems not, anyway, it shouldn't bad. matter too not, much. Not too bad. Yeah, they're only one problem shy of M MIT. Yeah. So, uh, there you go, yeah. They're, they're catching up yeah. to slime. Okay. I hope they will do pretty well. But, but it's a very difficult year because they did not practice together. Being one of them is actually working in the States already. One is working in some companies. So uh, it's, it's hard situation, but not only for us, for everybody, with one year being. Yeah, because of because of COVID, obviously the the, the regionals yes. happened in the 2020 to 2021 school year. Cor correct. And now this isn't actually happening till the end of 2022. So if your senior year was was that year then yeah. you no, they, could, could have been working for quite a while. They started to practice together not long ago, but as we see, not too bad, not too bad. All right, well, thank you so much, thank Jan. Thank you, too. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let Camille come in, and uh, we will be saying hi to Eric Doe in just a moment here, so get excited for that. Right. So good luck for with everything. Thank you. Good luck to, to Warsaw as well. All right, so Camille will be joining us in just a minute, uh, but for the moment, you're going to deal with my solo commentary, and hopefully we find that fun enough. Um, I think problem A looks very interesting, so we're going to take a look at what that problem is and see how difficult it might be. Um, and uh, yeah, I guess we can, we can take a look at that. All right, so problem A is called crystal crossword. You're part of a scientific team developing a new technique to image crystal structures at the molecular level. The technique involves blowing a very fine wind over the structure of the crystal at various angles to detect boundaries indicated by molecules that are exposed to the wind. This is repeated with different wind directions and the boundaries are observed for each direction as needed. And your team already has collected the data 
But as is often the case with scientific experience, now the real work begins, and uh, you got to do your analysis. For a given crystal, you'll know the directions the wind blew over the surface and the locations of all boundaries which were encountered by these winds. For a given wind blowing in some direction, the boundary is uh, some other location where a molecule exists at that location, and no molecule exists in x minus wx and y minus wy. All right, welcome, welcome. But well, how's it going? It's nice. I was a bit surprised of some order of problems solved, but... All right, can we take a seat here so we get the... Doors are a bit tight here. We're here. Here's the mic for you. Here's the mic. Should I have some? No, we here? don't. We don't okay. have any here. So, All right, so welcome to you. Welcome. So, Pablo, you are uh, you're watching the scoreboard carefully. Yes. And you're also a representative from JetBrains. Yes. So I'm here in like two or maybe even three purposes. Capacities, yeah. Yes, so I came as JetBrains representative, so I helped a lot with the stream, with the Scotland stream we had on the tech track. Also with tasks on our booths, so how participants solved, and just with like talking about Kotlin, talking about JetBrains EDs and stuff like that. Also I worked as analytics, so like this, these messages in, in the end of in the top, it's the bottom of, of stream. Is the one way what we are doing, for example, like pictures and selecting which runs are interesting, stuff like that. Analyzing what's wrong with submissions. Yeah, that's a very, very important job, and it also certainly makes the life much easier for yes, us commentators. And also, here. I help live live team with development of all this information. So you said you, you were a bit surprised in the order of the problem solved here. Yes, uh, like problem C solved very early was a big surprise for me. And it looks it, like not only was it solved early, it's got lots of solves. It's well, like it the should get lots problems. of solves. It's not too hard problem. So it's I think so it might have been like fifth hard or maybe six. Sixth hardest? Yes. Okay, I mean, but I mean six, six six easiest. Oh, six, but it's second most solved. Yes, but because it was solved second. Like okay. this scoreboard effect is really big. And do you want to explain what the scoreboard effect is to people who might like not be with when it? one team solves some problem too early, others look on that and spend more time on this problem, and so they are, and so it gets more, it's solved even more, and then more teams look at it. And the reason this occurs is because teams can see which which problems are solved, and they want to go after the easiest one. So if yes. one has a lot of solves, even more teams will go after it, and it'll kind of compound the yes. the effect. Also, this problem is actually not very hard. Also, it has a lot of solutions in Kotlin. Okay. And did you Python. Did you guys send us a, a message saying you thought problem F would be a bit more solved than it is? Or is, is that something else? Well, we thought that it's easier, but it's geometry problem, which is always hard. Also, I think we still will have some sponsor video from JetBrains soon. Yeah, let's uh, take a look let's at this JetBrains video. Thank you for being one of the JetBrains representatives. Yes. Thank JetBrains once again for sponsoring. Uh, we have a quick announcement, but we'll jump jump right back into JetBrains in a second. It looks like MIT has solved problem F, and that puts them back in first place. And they've been in first place for a while, but now they have a full seven problems solved. 
which is very impressive. Two more than even the next team, Utokyo. Two more? Oh, okay, it's really two more. Yeah, Utokyo only has five, so so Emmett, he's got a full full two problems, full two problem lead, uh, and the the penalty points will be racking up the longer this lead contain, yes. or continues. All right, Pavel. So uh, you are are from Jet Brains. Yes. What is your your favorite favorite part favorite technology that that Jet Brains so produces? I am personally working on Kotlin, so I like it. Also, I think that our ideas are quite great. And so personally, I was right in organizing a lot of contests using C Lion when I wrote in C++. Now I'm trying to wrote competitions in Kotlin for just because it's more convenient when you write a lot of code in, in some language that switching between languages is a bit hard. And I'm not participating much right now, so I'm not uh, much fixed on results, so I can afford me like getting a bit worse results for some random time limits or for making it more comfortable more comfortable and enjoyable to write and what are some of the things in particular in, in competitive programming because i know we got lots of competitive programmers watching here that kotlin provides that make things more convenient more comfortable to type well than, say, there, are several, there are several things first of all there is a really good standard library with a lot of utility functions which are really useful in competitive programs like no like it makes your intentions clear, your code smaller. Like you just write one line. Like I, like I, I want to check if this all, everything in this array compute is is this, or something like that. There are a lot of stuff like that, which just make your code shorter and cleaner and less error prone. Also, you get some exceptions instead of random runtimes, which is nice. Also, debugger works much better in Java like languages than in C++. So it just make you write the code faster, but Runs, but it runs a bit slower. That's not important in a lot of problems. It's important in some problems. That's kind of deal. Like it's sometimes good, sometimes not. Yeah, one of the things that I've noticed a lot when when programming myself is that uh, when you get a runtime error, it's nice to know exactly what line that runtime error occurred, uh, why it happened, and stuff like that. And a lot of modern languages will give that to you, but C++ doesn't. Uh, unless you have like very particular uh, well, flag set up and can die, can manually. does it sometimes, but it's not always trivial. In Java and Kotlin are things that that will do that for you. They'll show you exactly where it is, highlight it in your IDE, and you jump right to it. Yes. So also you just get a lot of analysis, which works back in, best in Java. So you you just mistypes. A lot of mistypes are just caught by ED. Like you wrote the wrong variable. It's called like hey you you wrote something strange. Like because some some other variable becomes unused or something like that. It can be achieved by C++ by using enough warnings from compiler, which, but that's not default. That's also can be some, sometimes hard to deal with it because C++ allows you a lot, which is sometimes good, but not always. We got another update here. It looks like lots of teams are, are solving problems, getting a total of, of six problems. Tokyo, Warsaw, and Seoul National University all have six so problems. What did Seoul solved? Uh, it looks like they just got problem L. Okay, that's not the hard one. Uh, it looks like Warsaw also got L as well. So, uh, some of the best teams had chosen to not do L super early in the contest, save it for later. Do you know if it requires a lot of code? Well, it does require much code. So there are several problems that are hard to understand what's going on. Like, like they, they actually have an easy solution, but the model itself is hard. So, so like, for example, when I read problem A first, like, I, what? That was the reaction. So in, in probably in contest, you just throw it away until it's solved at that point. Like, if you can't understand problem with first reading, you will delay it because because it's probably hard. Yeah, understanding like what it's asking is, is certainly useful. Uh, so it looks also, like it has the, also this spiral stuff. Like you need to do requests, like find which is this ID on the spiral, which is quite a straightforward, but not really easy. And it's easy to have some a lot of off by one errors in it. So teams which has to do may don't like to do it. And then it looks like in addition to a uh, problem. Problem L, uh, Tokyo just got problem A. Yes, it's not hard one either. I think, in my opinion, it's like third in the pro in the contest, third easiest. Third easiest. 
Okay. But actually, it has a really complex model. Like, it's try to understand what's going on. But when you understand it, it's easy. It does have a lot of small dimensions. So I noticed the bounds for, for lots of things are quite small. The bounds and coordinates only go up to 1,000 by 1,000. And... Yes, and actually it's like quadratic. In its intended solution is quadratic on coordinates. So you just need to... In fact, you just got 10 grids and need to process them with their total area of time or something like that. Gotcha, yeah. All it's right, yeah. not too hard, but you need to understand what's going on. We also have Faking University, who has four solves with an attempt on problem G here. Uh, looks like they got it wrong, unfortunately, but hopefully they can figure out problem, what they're doing. Problem G is kind of a controversial one. We have what makes it lot... controversial? Well, I mean, like, people have the very different opinions. Some people say that, hey, it's very standard problem, what's going on? For me personally, it had some untrivial parts, which I... But so pro- controversial, you mean in terms of how yeah, difficult it is? Yeah, in terms of how difficult it is, how people like it. Like, some people say that it's wow, some people say that it's uh, what's happening, it's a trivial standard problem, what's okay. going on. Should we, should we take a look at it right now? Well, I think there would be a tutorial at some point. Okay, I, well, we can wait for that if well, you'd like. basically, this is some two, two-dimensional button matching. Two-dimensional pattern matching. Which is quite well known that it can be done using fast Fourier transform. But there are some details. <laughs> yeah, I know there's uh, there's some things you can do to... Because rep- fast Fourier transform, this is what we talked about earlier, FFT. Uh, this is something that you can turn two-dimensional FFT into, into one dimension. If you write but your things that's... in the correct order. It's pretty, pretty well known, I'd say. Yes, but... Among I the think, best teams, anyway. I think a lot of teams... Well, FFT, I think FFT is a kind of algorithm that a lot of teams really use it as a black box. Yeah. And so slightly modifying it can be hard. So is this something where you do actually need to, to modify it, or do you just need to modify the input a bit? Well, at least modify it. Well, there is some tricks of what to multiply, actually. Interesting. All right, like, well... Oh, well, let's wait to editorial for Sure, we can, we can see the editorial then. Um, all right, any, any other problems you want to give us a, a quick summary on here? Oh, and then... probably which one are interested in. Well, I mean, I, I have read very few of okay. them, so you'd have so, to tell, well, tell me. I mean, because of scoreboards. I, well, I think the re- three remaining problems are very interesting. Especially, I like problem E, but probably it's better to talk about it when... So I think it's my favorite problem here. From E? Yeah, but I think it's better to talk it when Steam got to it. All right, sounds good. We can we can save it for that. Do you know what the solution to it is, or do you just well, like I how it's working? Well, I know the main idea. I didn't dig into details. Have you been told it, or did you uh, well, think about yourself? Well, like, we discussed main ideas and something I done myself, so... Interesting, all right. That's... Well, yeah, I guess it's a, it's a toss-up. Do you think it's easy enough that some of these best teams full of lots of LGMs will be able well, to actually... AC? we'll see. So I don't think anyone would solve everything, but I think every problem is doable. So there is no such a problem that, well, definitely no one would do that in reasonable time. But in total, it's quite hard. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Pavel. Uh, I appreciate you coming on. And uh, we will uh, we'll take a look at the scoreboard in just a minute. Uh, it looks like we got some more ACs on J and quite a few wrong answers. So yeah, thank you very much. And uh, okay. thanks to, to Kotlin for being a sponsor. Thank you. So one of the things that problem writers often look for is this thing called a perfect set. And a perfect set has three requirements. The first one is that every problem gets solved. Not every problem by one team, but every problem A gets solved by some team, B gets solved by some team, and so on. The second requirement for a perfect set is that no team solves every problem. So that means if a team solves 12 problems, uh, MIT is at 7, they're in the lead. But if they were able to solve the other what, five, then they would have a set solve, an AK, we call it, for, I guess, all kill, and uh, that would that would put them probably in first place, but they would solve the set. That would make the set not a perfect set. 
And then the final requirement is that every team attempts at least one problem, and it looks like we have almost already achieved that. Uh, the University of Chinese Academy and Sciences, I'm not sure if they were able to make it. It uh, looks like we actually have, have a couple other universities, one other one. Uh, Universidad de Costa Rica, yeah, it's possible they, they weren't able to make it here, but are still on the scoreboard. But uh, the third requirement is that every team solves a, or every team attempts a problem. So every team tries a problem, every problem gets solved, and no team solves every problem on their own. If those three things are all happen, if they all happen simultaneously, the set is called a perfect set. Uh, and if what Pavel was telling us earlier, Pavel from Jeff Rance was telling us, if that happens, that would mean that uh, we're, we're on our way to a perfect set. Apparently, every problem is doable, but there's enough here that it'll prevent any one team from running out of things to do. So we're going to be looking for that later. Uh, and we have a very special guest. We've got we've got Camille here. Welcome, Eric Doe. People have been very excited to see you. Hello. How's your contest been so far? The contest is nice so far for me as an organizer. I would prefer to participate, but it's <laughs> fine. Yeah, very fun. All right, well, well welcome. Uh, I know people will be very excited to see you. You have a tremendously successful YouTube channel. I hope so. Yeah, I think so. I, I know there are lots of people here during registration who are super excited to see you, want to take a picture with you. Uh, and I had a couple questions prepared for you, if you're all right answering them. All right. So uh, as, as a YouTube content creator, uh, I've tried to create YouTube videos myself. And although I've, I've done a bit, I, I'd say I'm far less successful than you are. What would you say is the thing you focus most on when trying to create educational content for people, trying to teach them new things? What aspects do you think are, are the most important parts of that? I don't understand why you say you're, you've tried you did that. You I have. have. I have created made a lot of videos, educational videos too. Uh, the difference is that if you such, if you get rid of few of my videos, then my numbers will not be that uh, big anymore. Uh, there are just a few videos that got million plus views, because non-competitive programmers can also watch those. So some kind of interview and a winning Facebook Hacker Cup qualification round. It used to be Facebook Hacker Cup, Meta now. No, Meta Hacker Cup, uh, yeah. Stuff like that. A lot of people are aware of such a competition, or at least when they see that on YouTube, they will click because it seems interesting. Not necessarily they will watch the whole thing. Uh, I prefer to not look at the total number of views, but instead to see how useful it is for competitive programmers. And then it's just about, you know, making tutorials that are useful. Hopefully stuff that isn't covered yet, at least not in video format, which is getting more difficult to do that, not to repeat topics. Over time, yeah, more things get covered. Uh, one of the quotes that I read recently, which reminded me of what you just said, was one from Einstein, which was, strive not to be a success, but to be of value. And it seems like that's largely Indeed. What, what, you're, what you're talking about here. I'm sure that... On YouTube, where you're, when you're close to educational space, success is indeed very different from providing value. Because where... it's it's so much easier to get a video with X views if you do it on something that's really easy. Uh, that's right. DP for beginners is something right. that's going to get lots of views. Yes. And if you do advanced applications of FFT... And actually, it, not only it should be DP for beginners, it should for 15 minutes talk about just Fibonacci numbers, you know, draw a recursion tree, say what caching does, and now this is a way to do it with an array, if you want, uh, an alternative thing. Actually break it down into two videos, if possible. And you will for sure get more views than showing segment tree with lazy propagation. So on one hand that's successful, but anyone who's motivated and able to make it to world finals like any of these people here, they know how to find those resources. The resources already exist. So it's not going to be particularly useful. Correct. Correct. So, uh, what what uh, of the the more difficult ones? Where do you think is is like the the most useful thing to cover? Is it something that's just totally unseen before, something you invented, or is it something that you think has wide application and, and would be helpful, but is just there aren't particularly good resources on, so many people might not know it yet. If I invent something, I always will try to use it in a competition. It actually, difficult problems are about coming up with something new. Very often it will be a combination of just few standard techniques, right? But if you are able to come up with a new technique that you are not aware of, 
you should hope that in, indeed other people <laughs> don't know it either and you can use it in a competition. And I would say that covering things that are common in contests is useful, but also that's correlated with being covered a lot of times. So I would say among all the difficult topics, it would be okay for me in the future or for you, for anybody, to just cover those that maybe aren't done in video format already, not to repeat that, because this is still a big space. Al difficult algorithms versus YouTube videos for those, there is a big gap. So I want to pivot a bit from YouTube videos, because not everyone makes them, uh, to more of like teaching philosophies and just got an update here. Utokyo has gotten a correct submission on problem B exactly halfway through the contest. They have over half the problem solved, seven of the 12. And uh, yeah, they got it right on their first try. However, they have been behind MIT for quite a bit and that starts to wear on their penalty point score, which means they're still in second place. That being said, there's only 40 minutes difference between them, so compared to... They still have few problems to solve, and then 40 minutes doesn't mean anything. They have a wrong submission on I, so on the one hand they will get another plus 20 minutes eventually, if they solve it, but on the other hand they are possibly closer to solving the next problem. So if they get I now, even though they have a worse uh, total time, they will get above a minute. Yeah, it looks like... Uh... Although they're going to have these 60 penalty points, that's certainly something they can overcome, especially if MIT gets stuck on one of the geometry problems. Forgetting one of those cases and getting lots of wrong answers can be a killer if it comes down to penalty points here. And uh, since I'm here, I will also mention that University of Warsaw has the third place. Yes, yes. And, uh, we, we were I talking to your coach them. just a minute ago. Oh, Professor Mali. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. we were, yeah, yeah. And he was telling us how uh, Warsaw has had the most consecutive World Finals qualifications of any ICPC team. Cool. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So that's that's incredibly impressive, uh, and they're in in the running for a gold medal. It looks like. Yep, that's true. I think that it's not that they are favorites for the win. It's not that they are stronger teams, but of course with good teamwork and lack of the lack of I don't know being stuck on some problem, which can hurt a lot. Many teams can fight for a gold medal. With a good strategy, some strong teammates, and good collaboration, there's a lot you can do. Yep, and I think they are good, reasonably good at geometry, and DK, so two unsolved problems yet, are geometry. That might be important as well. So as of uh, a bit a bit recently, we still had 24 teams, uh, which had zero points. Do you think they'll be able to get problem H, or do you think there are, there are lots of like things people have been doing wrong in problem H? Problem H is a very unusual first problem to be solved in a competition, and we saw that from first minutes after learning what problem H is, because it's very standard. It, it's like the DP uh, we talked about. It's extremely easy for strong teams, because they saw something like this, similar or maybe exactly the same. I think a new variation of that. Yeah. Versus for Weaker teams, it's just a difficult problem where you might try to do something else. Do you know, H? Uh, I've seen it. It's like you have several parentheses blocks and you want to put them together to make a, a Yeah, and you need, so you need string. to basically sort them properly and one might be tempted to sort by the total balance where op like opening brackets minus negative, uh, minus closing brackets. Uh, this is not enough and you can try to experiment a little bit. It, you will pass sample tests, so you will think that everything is okay. You submit, get wrong answer, you try to find a counterexample on paper or with a computer stress testing. You will waste a lot of time, while another team will just get accepted in five minutes. Because they've seen it before. That hurts, yeah. yeah, yeah. Or uh, really, something similar. It's a standard technique. So, I, for those teams that haven't solved anything yet, I think for them it would be better to focus on, I don't know, A, J, problems like those. All right, uh, last question for you, Camille. Do you have any advice for teams who haven't made it to this World Finals, but are still training and, and want to make it to World Finals in future years? Oh, certainly you need to just spend a lot of time practicing, solving difficult problems, learning Are, are these your, your five five best tips? Five best tips, uh, practice. <laughs> to, to get better practice. <laughs> practice. That's, a, that's a good, a good uh, one. I don't know. I know many people who are very strong and in their first years they also didn't get to any important competition. I, in high school, I practiced for IOI and I didn't get to IOI. Later I got uh, to all the big individual ICPC competitions. So, yeah, 
failing once doesn't mean anything and still you have a lot of years in front of you to practice. That's a great inspirational speech and with that we're going to show you a quick video about the volunteers who have helped us here. ICPC would not be possible without the help of committed volunteers to make things happen. More than 200 students and others from the University of Asia Pacific and from DACA have been preparing for weeks to ensure a warm welcome for our ICPC world finalists and staff. I'm very excited because uh, this is the first time for my country to be hosting these finals. It is a very honorable uh, thing to do. Um, there's a lot of big name countries who have hosted it. Uh, I think it's going to be a very big step for my country to be hosting this. Uh, for being a volunteer, we have to take the trainings for a couple, three or four months. So uh, in the sessions, we have learned many things like how should we treat the uh, guest, how we do our volunteership, uh, how we talk to people, how we control our anger, our emotions. So uh, by this we have learned many things so far. So I think the best thing that I'm gonna get from this experience is working in pressure, interacting with uh, different kind of people from different background, different religion, different things. So I think I'm uh, gonna get a very rich experience from this. I can meet up many cultures from different countries and different peoples. So I must get some ex different various experiences. So by this, uh, I'll get to know about you, about your culture, about your country, about your language, and we will have communication. After that, I may help, I may get any help about you, and after that, you may get help from me. For more from the ICPC World Finals DACA, follow us at news.icpc.global and on social media with our hashtag ICPCWFDACA. All right, welcome back. We have a representative from Huawei here, uh, Vicky. Yes. Vicky, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit and tell everyone who you are? Okay, yeah. Hello, my name is Vicky Zhang. I came from Huawei, and I am the Vice President of Corporate Communications. I am uh, based in China, Shenzhen, and very glad to join ICPC World Finals. And actually, that's my first time. Well, we're happy to have you here, yeah. and uh, I know being a, an ICPC World Finals uh, supporter is, is very important, uh, and it's, it's great that we could get a company like Huawei to, to be here. That's our honor to be the part of the communities, yeah, and also, how do you say, because as I mentioned, it's my first time to come here, and I was deeply impressed about the, about the work, the platform ICPC brings to the young generation, and all the contestants, the coaches, yeah, they all over the world. They came here in, in Bangladesh. Yeah, and it's also my first time to Bangladesh to, to Dhaka. And I can see the how to say the light in the young people's eyes. Yeah, they are exploring the world. And also they because it's a top mind competition. Yeah. And and I were there. Uh, they 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 the first problem of the world final so less than 15 minutes wow that's amazing so this young generation this this contest they are so good and yeah, I'm they're, impressed they're not that. easy problems either these are these are some of the hardest problems yes. that you'll see around the world yes. solved by some of the best minds you can find yeah obviously a lot of the contestants here are very interested in problem solving yeah is there anything uh from huawei any any projects that you guys are working on that you think yeah. they would be excited to learn about yeah actually Actually, I think uh, most of the most of the uh, contest joined our uh, ICPC challenge powered by Huawei on Tuesday. Actually, yeah, we are yeah, very yeah. yeah we are very happy that there there are more than 126 teams and also 39 coaches. They submit their solutions successfully to the problem, and there will be 12 winners, winner teams, and also 12 winner uh, coaches. Yeah, will be awarded in the closing ceremony later today, and yeah. also yeah, this is the this is the uh, challenge. The the problem was provided by Huawei, 
Yeah, this time the challenge topic is about the uh, jobs gathering and the uh, task dis dis distribution. Yeah, and also it's a third time we, we're doing this kind of challenge. And those are both types of problems that are, are applicable to the real world that you'd see yeah. in a job situation, not only yeah. in competitive programming. Yes, it's, it's from the real industry problem. And also, uh, not only in this world final and, and some regional event, we also provide a, a ICPC a challenge power by Huawei online. That's a, some kind of marathon. I saw it, yeah, I saw it was yeah, available on code courses. Yeah, different tasks from, from our different, how do you say, uh, area. Some of it is from, is to handling the traffic, traffic problem, data traffic problem. Yeah, some of it. It's very, yeah, some, some in the optical network things, yeah, very interesting and, and challenging. It's the, it's the, how do you think, at, uh, now is the latest and the cutting edge technology. Yeah, um, I know lots of work goes into making problems like that for these yeah. types of contests. Yeah. And I've, I've spent lots of my free time writing, writing some hacker cut problems, so I know uh -huh. lots of engineers at Huawei were, were spending lots of, uh, lots of time working on those. Yeah. And it's great that you can come up with interesting and engaging problems for these world finalists to, to work on. Yeah, actually, I, w I would like to introduce more, yeah, because you mentioned about we have a lot of r and research, pe research people. Actually, we have more than 110,000 R&D people in our community. That's it's, huge! Yes, it's more than 55% of the whole company. And we have uh, R&D centers globally. For example, in, in, in Europe, in every region, we have our R&D facility. And we open our R&D research platform to our ICPC contest. Uh, for example, we uh, just host the uh, first European ICPC uh, training camp. In your in, in Poland, yes. Yeah, oh, Poland. nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We were and, just talking about talking with some of the coaches from from universities that would have participated in that. Yeah, and also we we saw the teams here. Yeah, the teams who who joined the European camps, and, and because we provide the we provide the uh, how do you say the, the challenge problem, both from the east, uh, we also have our Peking University. Yeah, they provide the problem. Also, we have the our. University from from uh, Poland to also provide the challenge and the students their feedback is that's interesting there's some kind of problem they never seen it so it's very good to have this kind of interaction and also uh, in, in that training camp we have more than 100 st students from from 11 countries and this is the first time and it was really a success and we are planning planning to, to do more next year well, I'm very glad to hear that. Yeah. Speaking of Peking University, uh, yep. they have just moved into sixth place. Wow. They are on track to win a, a silver medal, which is wow. very impressive. Yeah. Congratulations. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you so much. I want to thank you and Huawei for, for sponsoring this. And uh, this, this is a, a, an event that, that couldn't, happen, couldn't have happened without you guys. Also, it's an event, how, how do you say, we are a team. Yeah, it's yeah. not only about us. We're only part of this community and we are so honored and glad to contribute well thank you so much yeah thank i appreciate you. it and uh we'll uh we'll have a quick break here and come back yep. to the scoreboard in a minute okay thank, thank you. you very much thank you
All right, we have uh, a quick ad here from IBM Quantum. Uh, we'll see this in just a second and we'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. So, what is QuizKit? KeysKit? KissKit. KissKit is an open source software development kit for working with quantum computers at the level of circuits, algorithms, and application modules. This SDK allows anyone to program on real quantum computers from their laptop. In two lines of code, you can access several quantum systems ranging from superconducting to trapped ion qubits. Want to emulate a quantum computer's behavior instead? Change a single line of code and simulate your quantum circuits on our high-performance simulator. Qiskit is a tool used by tens of thousands of people globally who are all trying to build the future. Whether you're a researcher, developer, or just looking to get started, Qiskit has a number of features available for your needs, allowing anyone to do things like building your first quantum circuit, run cross-domain quantum algorithms, and study fundamental quantum phenomena. Maybe now is the perfect time to get involved yourself and find all the tools you need, including real quantum machines, an SDK through Qiskit, and a community that is happy to welcome you and answers any questions you may have along the way. You can get started today at Qiskit.org. So tell me what's happening. They pull me into another room, and uh, and uh, how are the teams doing? Well, we have some terrific announcements here. Uh -huh. uh, during the break, MIT just solved their eighth problem. Holy cow. Th they're in first place. Yeah, it looks like they just got problem G. They weren't the first ones to solve it, but they got it on their third try. Uh -huh. So persistence pays off, I guess. Yeah. And yeah, this, this puts them one problem ahead of anyone else with eight problems. But at the same time, other teams have been catching up. Uh -huh. We have Utopia with seven. They're in second place. Yep. We've got Seoul National University with seven. And just now, Peking University has solved problem L, their seventh problem. Holy cow. They are also uh, in fourth place. And this puts us with a, a very nice gold medal range up here. Oh, wow. That, that is unbelievable. Well, there's still plenty of time. And it's amazing to see how things can happen. If I recall, the MIT team, you know, was in first place uh, this last year in Moscow until five minutes before the competition ended. And then Nishni Novgorod moved ahead of them, you know. So yeah. I think they probably came back uh, uh, intending to win. <laughs> the, the contest isn't over until an hour after it's frozen. That's exactly right. And we haven't even begun that freeze yet. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but that is great news that they're working so hard and getting the problems uh, solved. Uh, the problems have been getting harder and harder, of course, because we want to, in the ideal, we want all problems solved, but no one to solve them all. You know. Yeah, we were talking a little bit earlier about the perfect set. Mm -hmm. And some of the judges have mentioned it looks like there isn't any particular problem that sounds unreasonably difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, D sounds, D looks pretty tough, and E also looks pretty tough, but it seems like if a team is sufficiently motivated, they might be able to get, uh, get quite a few of them, get any particular set of problems, but probably not all of them simultaneously. Uh, uh, so we'll see, yeah, it, it, uh, it's going to come down to the wire and it'll be an exciting scoreboard reveal for sure. Well, that's great. And, and the thing to remember is this is the top 1% of uh, uh, some of the top um, uh, uh, talent in the universities all over the world. It's, it's, uh, so everybody in this competition is a champion. I want to give a quick introduction here for those of you who are just joining us now. This is Bill Poucher. Uh, one of the most well-known personalities in the ICPC. Bill, I gotta say, your cowboy hat is, <laughs> is, is one of the greatest parts about coming to World Finals. This is my third time here, and I, I, it, 
that brings me joy every time. Well, do you know? Do, do you know what its history is? I want to hear it, and I know there are people yeah. here who who haven't. Well, in 2006, uh, we had the competition in San Antonio, and I this is a hat that I wear on regular occasions, and it has some history associated with it. You know, uh, in uh, in Texas lore, the white hats are the good guys, and uh, you know the black hats are the bad guys, and and this is called gray belly. It's as good as I've ever been able to accomplish, but I can't completely ever make a white hat. You know? But the problem is that I am photosensitive, and so I was reading uh, the names of the top teams in the ICPC, and the lights that were shining in just blinded me. You know, in the oh. opening. So. Uh, so I probably my wife, uh, I, I suppose, said, well, why don't you wear your hat? Well, normally you don't wear your hat indoors, right? So I got my Stetson and put my Stetson on, and sure enough, I could block the lights and I could finish, you know, the, the job uh, uh, when it came to awards. So everybody loved it, so I just kept wearing it. And then on the other hand, it's sort of nice not to be blind when you're trying Absolutely. to Absolutely, yeah, we got some speak. bright lights here, yeah. too, so I bet it helps a little bit. Yeah, I don't see them at all, you know? <laughs> So <laughs> that's that. That's it. So uh, uh, the other thing is that this hat sort of has a history in Texas. That when uh, Texas was building, when we were building our communities uh, from nothing, uh, we came from many different uh, ethnic uh, 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 backgrounds, most from Europe. But I'll tell you, there were big differences. And so folks needed to get together and figure out how to how to build hospitals and and schools and take care of widows and orphans and do the things that communities do, right? And so somebody would need to conduct that meeting and very often they would wear the hat, you know? So much better than they would carry the pistol, right? Yeah, you know? yeah. And so that's uh, sort of the tradition of, uh, of uh, from uh, old Texas that I, that I remember that it's my job when I wear the hat to make sure that everybody has the opportunity to contribute toward uh, a building community. We have a quick announcement here from some of our analysts in the back. They tell us that MIT is currently racing to implement problem B, which they don't have, some other teams do have it. If they get it, this will put them at nine problems, a sizable advantage over the other teams that are in the, the gold medal range. Wow. And the analysts think they're on the right track. Oh! So, uh, I know there are some very, very talented programmers at MIT. Oh, yeah. One of them is Slime. He was at uh, Slime is an LGM. He, yep. was, he was at the North American Championship. Yeah. And uh, there are some other members. I know Anton was at the at NAC, but he, he's not here today. He's going to be competing in the next World Finals. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I, I want to you know, I, I make sure that anything in the health industry that I depend on gets... Uh, that I can uh, use blockchain to find out that they they, they built it. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> because the bottom line is is that these are are the people who have the programming prowess and the mathematical prowess to build uh, um, uh, systems you can trust. And in in the coming world, when systems rely on systems that rely on systems, and uh, uh, you know we we just we just can't tolerate. Um, uh, whoops. Yeah, this can't go wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's life or death. It's life or death. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned some some teams from Texas earlier. Yeah. We got a fun fact. Uh, one of the teams competing here is Texas A&M, and they actually hosted the first ICPC contest in 1970. That I, is exactly that right. That, that was it. And uh, uh, they just invited everybody to come. And... Uh, uh, and uh, and back then we had teams of four, and you might wonder why. Well, basically, four times more people showed up than there were key punch machines, so they just divided them up there. There was nothing magical about it, uh, but that became the standard. And then um, in the uh, 80s, uh, we were growing, and we wanted more teams to compete. And obviously, if you had 24 teams of four, uh, you know, uh, if you change to team size of three, then you could accommodate what? Even more teams. Yeah, but I want the ex actual number All of right, teams. All right, so it was 24 teams of four. Uh-huh. How many people is that? 24 times four? 96, uh, 96 right? 96 people. Right. 96 over three is, well, nine's multiple of three, six is a multiple of three, so that's nice and easy. 
uh, 32. Yep, that's exactly right. And years. under pressure, right, with a college professor <laughs> watching and while he's, you know, on on uh, 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 streaming live. Not uh, not yeah. only am I under pressure, I'm also preparing <clears throat> the fun facts, which we're going to announce now. Okay. UCLA just solved a problem. Okay. And believe it or not, they uh, when they competed on the virtual NAC, which is what they used to qualify for this, uh -huh. they all flew to New Jersey together, despite being located all over the world. Wow. UCLA is very far from New oh, Jersey. Oh, yeah, 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 exactly. And then, oh, and we got a sponsor video here. Here we go. It really steps up the level of programming that you can do in the sense of you become much more confident, your code has less bugs, you become faster. It also looks very good on your resume. The main benefit I see is like to speak to other smart people, uh, to gain some knowledge from them. Meeting people from all around the globe, that's really nice, like I love cultural, the, the cultural I know they're all like soup or something, I don't know they're all, sorry. So, uh... Even outside of problem solving and algorithms, um, it teaches you to like um, work very hard for a goal, to do well at the international level, even under like a lot of um, uncertainty. And I think that's a very valuable skill for anyone to have. For more from the ICPC World Finals DACA, follow us at news.icpc.global and on social media with our hashtag ICPCWFDACA. All right, welcome back, Phil. Yeah. Uh, like I was saying, they they drove to, or they, they flew to New Jersey to compete together. Mm -hmm. And after doing that, they went to the beach and they thought, oh, we're probably not gonna make it <clears throat> because they only solved six problems and they didn't, didn't get anything later. But it turned out they lucked out and they, they qualified for World Finals. Oh, well, that is that is cool. You, you know, um, we had one team, uh, gosh, I, I, w I can't recall, uh, from New York would need to come um, a, uh, a day late to a World Finals that was in Orlando. And the reason was that, that they, uh, uh, the team was also um, a relay team in the NCAA finals trying to go, you know, to uh, the um, uh, to the Olympics and they asked if they could come late so that they could uh, could do that. I can't, I, I'll have to remember back to uh, find out, uh, to remember which university, but I always thought that was uh, quite an interesting thing. So they not only ran track, but they also competed in the ICPC. All right, well, thank you so much, Bill, for joining us. Yeah. I really appreciate it, and I'm sure everyone here loves to see you. Glad to do that. I might mention just one little thing before I head out. You sort of asked, well, I thought saw somebody ask, well, what difference does it make for somebody to be uh, competing in the ICPC? Well, it's because you're in the ICPC community, and you sort of thunder, wonder, well, what is that? Well, I have about 400,000 alumni in the area, and I went to Linksys, I mean LinkedIn, excuse me, uh, whose first chief technology officer was a world finalist, okay, and, uh, and I did a little bit of a search on AI and, uh, and uh, people, and how, how many hits did I have? Looks like we have almost three million, two, two million nine hundred forty thousand. Uh-huh, uh-huh, and, uh, oh, uh, founder and CEO, co-founder, CEO, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, CB, oh, VP and Chief AI Scientist at Meta. You ever there heard you of go. Meta? I, I work for them must, even. Must be a new company. Yeah, but, yeah. <laughs> but their, their first uh, Chief Technology Officer was also a silver medalist in the ICPC. So the answer is that, that, um, that the community that we live in today in, uh, in, in, uh, um, in computing is large, but g gosh, it's connected. And one of the things the ICP do, does is connect you. Okay. All right, all right. Well, thank you so mm -hmm. much, Bill. You bet. We will uh, see you after the stream. Okay. During the scoreboard reveal, I'm thank sure. You. All right, everybody, we got some announcements. First of all, MIT just submitted problem B. This is huge. They also got it wrong. That is very inconvenient for them. The judges thought earlier they were on the right track, but uh, we will we'll see what's going on here.
Also, uh, U Tokyo has another AC. They got B 150 minutes into contest, uh, and they now have eight problems. It looks like they got L just now on their second try, and they're a little behind on penalty. They're about 30 30 problem or 30 points behind on penalty. But you have to keep in mind, at the end of the day, when MIT gets B, they're going to have an extra 20 penalty points for that. So it's going to be uh, it's going to be kind of interesting. We got Andrew coming back. Welcome, Andrew. Hello. Uh, you wanna you wanna sit here? Oh sure, I'll sit here. Fantastic. For a uh, we also got UCF has solved their fifth problem, and they have moved up into ninth place. That would be bronze medal range if they can hold on to that. Now there's quite a bit of time left in contest. Right. And they also have been starting problem B. So if they're able to do well on that, that would be quite impressive for them. So you, I guess we'll were see. You, were you reviewing the whole scoreboard? We were, you were taking a look at all the things we, that, that happened when I was talking to Bill. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And a lot can happen when you're talking to a guy with a, a cowboy hat. <laughs> right, 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 right. <laughs> the world, the world uh, gets even more excited and, and right, right. ACs well, fly around. MIT has submitted B, right? Uh, we the saw top. that. Yeah, we saw Tokyo, we saw Seoul. Peking University moved into, like the team from Beijing moved into uh, moved into fourth place. Well, and they got seven range. problems. They got seven problems. They mounted. They weren't doing that well at the beginning of the contest, but they mounted a pretty reasonable comeback. They, you know, after 100 minutes, they solved. You know, they solved problem like C. They solved problem B. It looks like they also solved problem L. Uh, and so, you know, this, you know, they are, you know, they're. Uh, seems like they they still can make it back into gold medal range. And Tokyo's catching up. Yeah, yeah. Tokyo is definitely catching up with it. Uh, catching up. They. They and MIT both need just one of the problems that the other team has solved, right? Yeah, and, and, and so yeah, so either either B or I. It looks right. like they're each working on those. And they, they each got one wrong. Awesome it, right? Yeah. And so MIT has not very much penalty lead, right? They have uh, they have about thirty penalty lead right now. It's uh it's gonna be close. Right. Uh, it looks like we got a, a submit from Seoul coming up here. Did they get it? Uh, uh, time limit. Looks like they got a time, time limit. Time limit exceeded. Right. All right. Well, that's uh, that's unfortunate. Right. But they have have some time left in contest to fix it. So, not the end of the world there. Not the end of the world. All right. Um, we have another guest. Uh, I wanted to give you a chance to go <laughs> eat some I, lunch. I would love to eat some food. Um, and so we have another guest that will that that's coming in. Um, this is going to be. Uh, I I guess I won't spoil the surprise. You'll see in just a minute here. All right. See you guys soon. Cool. So while we're waiting on that, we can take another look at the uh, submission queue. MIT has just made their second submission on problem uh, on problem B, and it is still wrong answer. And so uh, it's definitely a pretty tricky problem. There are definitely a lot of edge cases that that could go wrong, and we see that a lot of teams that have solved it took you know three tries, four tries. And so we're definitely definitely could be a tricky problem. Don't know if we're going to see it. Oh, and they immediately resubmit and get and get AC. So they are the first team to nine problems. Um, hey. Cool. And uh, we have our guest, and uh, we're here to discuss this. Um, take a seat. Yep. Hello. Uh, this is the mic. You speak a little closer to the mic. Okay. Um, Hello. Hey. Cool. Um, so, welcome. Uh, you want to introduce yourself really, yourself really quick? Yeah, I work for JetBrains, and I'm responsible for educational research uh, projects. So, in particular, our collaboration with ICPC. Right, right. And, and your name is Andrei. All right. Um, 
Yeah, so. and so I, I was just looking at the scoreboard. We, we were talking a little bit about MIT yeah. earlier, and MIT just solved problem B. Okay, um, so, so that's how many? Nine? Eight? Uh, they have... Uh, eight. They're at, no, they're now at nine problems. That was their oh, ninth okay. problem. So they're actually, you know, they've actually solved all problems that anyone has solved. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, are there any, like... Uh, oh, uh, we are going to an ad, so we will be back in a minute. Okay. <laughs> So I interned at Two Sigma last summer and I returned this fall primarily because of the people I met. I feel like people here genuinely form a community around shared interests, usually a shared passion for science and tech. Honestly speaking, finance wasn't on my list when I, but when I came here, everyone was so smart and so friendly and so sincere. And I feel like my skill set can be truly valued here and that's something really important to me. There's so many cool, exciting projects to work on. And I know I'm going to be working with those people that are super knowledgeable. And that's like what drives me to move forward. At other tech companies I've worked at, you can kind of feel like you're a very, very small part of a very, very large thing and that you're kind of expendable that way. Whereas here, people are extremely invested in my success. This is just the perfect place to be. So yeah, I'm pretty happy I made that decision. All right, uh, so we are back. Uh, that was a ad from uh, one of our sponsors, Two Sigma. Uh, let me check the mic settings really quick. I think we are on the right one. One, two, three. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's, I think it's the right one. So, uh, check this. Uh, okay, uh, this should be the right one. Cool. So we're we're on the right mic now. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Tell me, tell me a little bit about you know what uh, have you have you seen anything pretty interesting in uh, Dhaka so far? Uh, well, in Dhaka, I'm mostly either on the ICPC floor or in the hotel, and mm -hmm. the ICPC floor is much more interesting than the hotel. Mm -hmm. But what is the most interesting thing that's happening right now is this competition. Right. Right. So. Have you uh, <laughs> have you talked with any teams leading up to this? No. No. no, no not, haven't had a chance yet. Usually teams uh, are not uh, very willing to talk before uh -huh. the competition because they're thinking about right, right. winning it. They're all they're so. all super focused. We had a lot of teams uh, visiting our booth actually uh, mm -hmm. during the first couple of days. Uh -huh. but, uh -huh. Yeah, it more other guys who were talking uh, to them, not me. Right, right. But that's interesting. Right, that's right. Interesting. Uh, and and one other thing is, uh, you, you haven't done ICPC yourself, no, right? No, unfortunately. When did you when did you learn about it? Or how did you learn about it? In 2004, uh -huh. I got introduced to Itmo University, to uh -huh. Vladimir Parfenov, and to the team of Arshansky, Maurin, and Pavlov, if you uh -huh. know that such team exists. Uh -huh. And we started to collaborate with them about uh, different educational projects. And uh -huh. I also get a, make a friends with uh, Andrei Stankevich and uh, Georgi Karniev. Oh, and right. from them, I know well everything, yeah, <laughs> everything about ICPC. Right, right. And also currently in JetBrains, a lot of ICPC folks are working, starting from Roman Yelizarov, who is uh -huh. the leader of the Kotlin team, right. and my friend. So. Right, yeah, right. I'm close to the community, but not inside the community. Right, right, right. Well, it's never too late to join, right? Yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, what, what kinds of educational projects were you doing? Were they a lot of collegiate things and teaching college students with programming contests or what kinds of Yeah, things? well, uh, we used to have a lot of uh, joint projects with university in Russia. Uh -huh. Unfortunately, because of the well-known circumstances, we had to leave Russia at the uh -huh. moment. Uh, well, yeah. in May, March actually, and at the moment we are trying to use our experience to create some joint program with universities in Europe. Uh -huh. And for example, the current projects I spent a lot of my time for is uh, our uh, collaboration with uh, Jacobs University in Bremen. Uh -huh. We managed to bring there some of our teachers, we managed to bring there some of our students uh -huh. from Russia, oh, wow. uh, including some of the uh, actually very good uh, competitive ICPC teams. Mm -hmm. So probably next final you will see a couple of te one team from this university in the final in 
mm-hmm. the place not yet declared, I think, right? Uh, <laughs> I think there are some rumors. Yeah. I'm a little scared to say the rumors <laughs> out here, but it's a place that may have been scheduled to hold yeah. ICPC it, in the past. It, it is this one. Yeah, and, uh, you know, they, it, it is, uh, you know, it, it uh, you know, it might might be five letters long. The country might be five letters long, yep. but we will uh, <laughs> we will see about whether uh, whether that works. Okay. Um, but so this university also we are working together with uh, some university in Cyprus, right? Because currently Cyprus is changing at this place where a lot of uh, people, refugees from both Russia and Ukraine, uh-huh. uh, working, uh, studying, and mm-hmm. including uh, students. So right. we are creating some opportunity for them to. That's pretty exciting. Yeah. Yeah. Are these mostly? These are mostly, uh, like, primary school students, or? No, no, no. It's high school students. High school students. It's okay. entire computer science programs. Right, right, right. That's okay. That's that's pretty exciting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I started doing programming in high school. Uh, even before, well. actually. Uh-huh. Uh, well, I'm pretty old, as you can see. <laughs> so my first program it was for the programming calculators. Uh, I don't know. You guys know what it is. Right. It was uh, such small devices, and you uh, developed your code uh, in numbers, uh-huh. in, in quotes, uh-huh. for both instructions and uh, data. Uh-huh. And it was very short programs, like 90 comment or 100 comment. So uh, nothing of problems uh, like you solve here right, wouldn't right. be uh, right. possible to solve that. Right, but, but every, I, single, every single line takes so much more effort. Oh, yeah, you, yeah. yeah. So, and after that, yeah, in the high school, I was already doing something in Fortran program language uh-huh. at, uh, right. on uh, a bigger computer. Right. And uh, so it was, I was a programmer until uh, 2000, I think. And after uh-huh. that, I kind of moved to management. Uh-huh. Uh, evil site. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's important and uh, it makes, it's what makes, it's what makes products instead of just code. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So uh, also you can do much more when you have team than right, when you right. are alone. So yeah, that yeah. makes some sense. Yeah, yeah. But uh, programming is much more fun for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean that's why all the teams are here. Yep. They, uh, they're just here to have fun uh, typing yep. code. Yeah. And to win. And to win. Yeah. Yeah, I'm rooting yeah. for MIT. Right, right. Yeah, we were looking <laughs> at this. I think the analyst just told us that uh, at this point, um, I guess Tokyo is far enough behind penalty that uh-huh. they would require they would require two. They, they're required to solve two problems in order to win. So even if they solve from I, then uh, they don't have, they're not fast, they wouldn't be fast enough to be MIT. So MIT looks like they have like a pretty good shot. Um, yeah, but what about those three problems nobody solved yet? Yeah, there's three problems that no one has even touched. I, I think like there's, uh, actually, actually w- one funny thing is uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison uh, has seven, att- seven attempts on problem D. Uh, that's probably not because they're smart, but because they're bad at choosing the right problem to solve. Well, University of Wisconsin-Madison is pretty interesting. They're, they're a one-person team this year um, wow. because I think their teammates got COVID. And so maybe they're just trying to pick a problem which they think is fun to implement. I'm not really sure. Um, but they've certainly given it a lot of attempts. And I think they even started it like from the start of the contest. So uh, mm-hmm. another possibility is they have some pre-written code or something that makes a lot of it much simpler. But they're definitely very very, uh, very yeah. brave to try to, uh, to, to, to go on from D for this long. May I ask you about uh, MIT? Yeah. Why, why uh, MIT team manages to solve so many problems so fast in the beginning? Yeah. It happens every competition. Yeah, well, it, it happens some of the competitions. I think... Uh, you know, it, it really depends on it depends on the exact set of students. I think a lot of MIT students come from a lot of different backgrounds. So mm-hmm. some years, a lot of them come from like United States IOI backgrounds. Some years, a lot of them come from uh, like Chinese IOI backgrounds. Some years, some of them are grad students. And so uh, a lot of these uh, a lot of these teams have different backgrounds. And uh, but I think the the common thread is a lot of us typically have you know tra- trained for a lot of years by the time we already got to MIT. Mm-hmm. And so you know, there's uh, I I always think that. Uh, you know, kind of the most important thing is just implementing, like fundamental implementation, um, and you really just have to be consistent at just implementing whatever comes your way, and uh, you know, just making sure that it's you, you, the you, you have to be you have to be able to get the basics 100 percent you know and i think a lot of the time mit has that and, and i mean uh, there are also plenty of other teams that have that kind of yeah. uh have that kind of experience and have that kind of like fundamental training uh but i think that's really what it uh what it comes down to that uh you know it's uh it, it's it's just uh you know you can be you can practice problem solving and you know that that helps especially with the harder problems but mm-hmm. you also got to practice the basics and make sure that 
it's always down. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Can I ask you one more question? Yeah. Uh, you were also now event in the beginning of the final, right? This uh, yes, small yes, competition. Yes. Uh, yeah, the small competition. Language. Yeah. So what do you think about Kotlin? I think Kotlin is. Uh, I haven't used that much Kotlin. I've never really heard terrible things about Kotlin or anything. Like people, people like to complain about programming languages, but people don't complain much about Kotlin. It's definitely a step up about, from Java, right? Yeah. And uh, I think the way it does functional things is like is really useful, right? Mm -hmm. um, you can the the lambdas are kind of they just look like for loops, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, they just uh, everything kind of just flows, right? Yeah. Uh, I've never tried working on like a large Kotlin project, mm -hmm. um, but it does seem like. It does seem like it's you know, it's it it's it should be it should be pretty good there. I see. Can't really Thank speak you. from experience though. Um, yeah, I mean I I'm a uh, I'm a big C plus plus fan, and uh, yeah I've also used some other problems like uh, some other programming languages like Python and Go, but never really Kotlin for for uh, real projects. But C plus plus is used by most of the teams here. C plus plus is used by most of the teams. Yeah. yeah, it is. It's yeah I mean it, it's really C plus plus is the biggest. It's the fast instead of safe, right? Trade-off, right? And sometimes that trade-off is really important, and uh, you know, other times it's important to write good code. Yep. And so, you know, there's a, there's definitely like a whole range. So it looks like MIT just solved problem E. Wow. Which they That's solved. Cool. Yeah, they solved it like less than 15 minutes after their previous solve. So they must have been working on it the whole time, right? Mm -hmm. um, but that makes them, that makes that puts them actually two problems in the lead. Uh, and that this seems this seems very very difficult for anyone to catch them anymore. Um, so probably uh, finally. Yeah. So maybe maybe it's finally finally the year of uh, the year of MIT. Um, Do you think they solve all of the problems? Uh, well, I, I I don't know if if, the, if Chad knows about all the problems, but I, I read all the problems while I was while I was taking a break, and some of these problems are really tough. I. Okay, actually, E was my guess for the hardest problem. So if they've solved it, they might actually yep. solve the whole, the whole the whole problem set. Um, but K, I think K, I think they definitely could solve. Mm -hmm. And D is a D is a geometry problem with okay. a lot of implementation. Mm -hmm. And so it kind of it really depends on the clock at this point. I think they have um, we are we are three hours and eighteen minutes into the contest, so they have an hour and four. They have hundred minutes left. Um, they might solve K, uh, they, they could solve K in as little as like, you know, 30 minutes maybe. Mm -hmm. And then an hour to solve D, it's pretty tight, but it could happen. I could, it could happen. It would be very hard, I think. But at the same time, I did not expect them to solve E. So, you know, anything can really happen at this point. And this team, uh, it is uh, pretty new. Uh, this like team, even not the team that won in Orlando, right? Uh, no, no. Uh, in Orlando. Orlando. In Orlando, the semifinal and I see this year. Oh yes, this is not the team that won in Orlando yeah. this year. Uh, this team, uh, because this is from a this is a year ago team. They mm -hmm. have one person who's on the same who's on the team. There, that's Slime, who's like top five mm -hmm. on Code Forces right now. So wow. it's certainly good to have him. <laughs> um, and uh, so he he's there as well. Uh, he's he's there, but the rest of the team is is uh, it, it's not quite uh, it's not quite the same. Um, but I mean, I've, clearly they've been practicing, and clearly they're uh, you know they're still uh, they're still good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I heard one story about Gennady Korotkovich uh -huh. that after he won his first championship, uh -huh. he didn't participate in any tournament because he was looking for a team uh -huh. to win the second. Right. And uh, when he finally found them, he won the second as well. Right, right, right. So do you guys at MIT do about the same things? Um, there is some of that. I think one, one funny story is my, my team. I went in 2016 and then 2019. And uh, my team in 2019 consisted of me, and I had previously gone in 2016. There was uh, Yin Jen, who had gone in 2017 previously, and Kevin, mm -hmm. who had previously gone in 2018. So we really did mix and match some teams, so you know, they, looking they, for they some team teams. Of the it was. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so it's it's really uh, there. There is there's sometimes a little bit of mixing and matching. I think a lot of it is just who who thinks they have time and who wants to. Uh, who wants to implement, uh, or who who wants to practice for that for that particular year? And uh, you know, sometimes sometimes waiting for waiting for the perfect team is uh, is the right thing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. The two the two participation rule is pretty interesting. I think it it's uh, you know it it, uh, it does give it does give a lot of people a chance, especially at a school like MIT when there are there are often a lot of people coming in, and uh, it means you you have to uh, 
you have to pick your battles a little bit, which is yep. which is a little funny. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so it looks like it looks like we're being told that uh, MIT is working on problem D, and mm -hmm. you Tokyo are both working on problem D, and so they are both. Uh, it, it seems like they're probably. We'll, we'll see how long it takes. They they definitely could surprise me. Uh, have you have you seen the problem? No, no. We we can take a quick look at the problem. Yeah. The problem the problem is not too not too tricky to to understand. <laughs> I don't know where it went. The problem is not too tricky to understand. Um, but uh, there are a lot of cases. Okay, we'll, we'll use it here. Um, the problem is that we have a w there's a museum guard in a gallery, mm -hmm. and um, we are trying to. Uh, they're trying to make sure they can keep an eye on this sculpture. And so they they can walk around the gallery, but they want to make sure that they have line of sight to the sculpture. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what, the question is pretty simple. It's just uh, we have uh, we have a uh, there's a guard. They want to walk the shortest possible distance while staying inside the bounds of the muse museum and mm -hmm. be able to see the sculpture. Um, and this problem, like, uh, it, it sounds like it, it's pretty, you know, there's not too many steps, but yeah. there are a lot of, um, it's, it's really tricky to make sure that you have all the cases correct when they, they walk, they're able to walk through these places. They're not able to walk through walls. Your path can be really complex if the, if the, if the grid is very, if the polygon is very weird. And so, uh, this type of problem is, uh, definitely a pretty, pretty tricky and we'll see, we'll see how it goes. And what kind of algorithm you usually use to solve this? So... I mean yeah, so a lot of it is kind of geometry code, um, mm -hmm. where you you often have pre-prepared geometry code. So mm -hmm. you uh, you pre-write some code that is able to like you know it is able to do basics. So you you have two points uh, and like you know find the length of the segment between them, or given this segment, check if it intersects with this polygon. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you you do a lot of you have to do you have to think really hard about the cases mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and just uh, use these primitives in the right way. So you know. If I want to walk from this point to this point, like what are the things that can go wrong? I could run into a wall, right? I could maybe I would uh, run into like a wall. There's like a wall on one side that I can skirt around, and you have to decide whether, like, if I touch a vertex, maybe I, I can or can't go around that wall. And then there are things like uh, exactly how close do you have to get to see the thing, uh, to see the point? What if you're, what if there's a wall coming in from the left and a wall coming in from the right that are just perfectly blocking you? And so there's a, you have to be really careful with these with these different cases, and uh, that's what leads to these problems being pretty tricky. Yeah, so it's easy to generate some solution, but most likely it won't work. There are, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, there there are often a lot of like, yeah, there are often a lot of cases. A lot of attempts. Yeah, it, it's it's really you have to be really careful with off by with uh, things that are exactly on the line. That's the yeah, biggest. Yeah, it looks like more uh, of. Um, industry programming task right right yeah i mean if you were if you're actually doing robotics like this is the kind of yeah. pathing path you have to do right um uh i, I don't know do, does colin ha or does jetbrain do much uh, with the robotics community no, we, we have one of the uh in jetbrain's research we had one of the research group who are doing mm -hmm. some simultaneous location and mapping task and uh -huh. the only thing i know about that is right. the name right right but it is similar to, to yeah this yeah is, it's uh, really similar that's yeah. it's pretty much it, th this is pretty much like you know, just just one path instead of actually finding the entire path. Mm -hmm. But it's uh, this stuff is uh, it it people use it in the real world, and yep. it's uh, it's pretty exciting. Yeah, the reason why the reason why I'm I'm uh, asked you about that is uh, and uh, mentioned the industrial programming mm -hmm. is that there is a com common misconception that uh, competitive programmers are not very good in in the real world. Yeah, because they get used to just uh, do something that uh, get passed through the testing system, mm -hmm. and then they forgot about that. Right, right. And in the real world, you have to think about different cases, uh, sometime for ten years after you right. uh, release your uh, right, right. system. Right, right. So yeah, yeah, it's yeah. interesting that there are such uh, actually tasks that yeah, uh, yeah. demand you to do that even during right. the competition. Right, right. Yeah, I think yeah, I think one other thing that people misunder uh, misunderstand is that y it's not it's not easy to implement these things. And you know, just because you use some tricks when you're doing competitive programming doesn't mean you don't really have like a good understanding of like how do you make this code, you know, easy to read and easy to debug. Right. Mm -hmm. That's like in 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 this uh, you know debugging code is. Uh, Debugging code is takes so much time and can hurt you so much, and so you end up actually picking up a lot of the skills that you need to write maintainable code. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, I I think I think actually competitive programming is 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 quite quite great for uh, for uh, you know 
yeah, for previous reasons. Well. That's why I say that it's misconceptions. Yeah, because yeah. the practice shows that a lot of competitive programmers are yeah. very good real world programmers. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, well, thank you for coming. I think we have another video coming up soon. This is going to be uh, this is going to be some interviews with actual contestants. Wow. Um, yeah. And, Thank you uh, for having me. It was a very nice discussion. Yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, see you uh, See you around the contest. See you around. Thank right. you. Thanks. Okay. And on social media with our hashtag ICPC. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, we have better mics. And also, Peking University just got their ninth problem, problem math. Right, so they actually jumped in front of Utokyo, who has been one of the top two teams essentially, the, nearly the whole contest. And they are now, uh, and, and Peking University is now poised to be, to potentially, you know, they, they're the closest team to uh, beating MIT now. They have been working their way up the scoreboard this whole time. Right. And they've had a long way to go. But they uh, they only have one more spot left to get to the top. Right, right. And that's beating MIT. And if they can pull that out of their hat, that would be incredible. Right, right. I guess it, it, it seems that since they've been behind for so long, right. I don't really see any way of them doing it other than winning on problems. Right. Uh, I mean, yeah, they probably would have to win pro win on problems. Their penalty is their penalty is not so bad. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it, it would require either winning on problems or MIT making many wrong submits uh, on uh, it would require them winning on problems. <laughs> it's it's not out of the question, but yeah, uh, yeah, they, it would require them to solve at least two problems. They, they either that. yeah they either have to to solve two problems and MIT doesn't get any more or right. solve set. Right, right. And then you deserve to win at that point. Yeah, at that a, point, if you solve this whole set, you really do kind of deserve to win. I I don't remember a world final set being solved other than tourist second year. I, the only time I remember one being solved. I'm not familiar enough with these scoreboards anymore. All right, <laughs> but I think I think something like that is true. Like people, people. I mean, it, it's the world finals, and the judge, the judges like to make sure that um, teams have something to do, right? Um, it's kind of if you finish the if if it's possible to finish the set, and some team finishes it in four hours. It, you don't want them to be bored for the last hour, right? Yeah, twiddling your thumbs isn't fun. And then also, you want to make sure the scoreboard reveals interesting. So a lot of right. stuff has to happen in the last hour. Right. And so, and so usually, it would, they uh, they don't try and let let any team you know solve the whole solve the whole set. All right, we are officially uh, just over ninety minutes into contest, and I want to give you left. ninety minutes left. Yes, right. ninety minutes left. 
and I want to give you a quick summary of what my team does at this point. Right. When you have 90 minutes left in contest, you know it's coming to an end, right. and you really have to focus on which problems you're solving. You've got three team members. They might be trying three different problems at the moment. Oh my goodness. Interruption. Interruption. Problem K has been dark greened by a team way down the scoreboard with only NYCU. five problems. Well, NYCU was one of the very early teams to solve problem H as well. They got and they the, also have the first they solve. They got F. F. Uh, they were the first solve on problem F. So maybe they're just maybe they're just specialists in what everyone else doesn't know. That is that is incredible. Maybe they're sniping the dark greens and that's their goal here. I don't know. Some teams go I for mean, dark greens. I mean, they've done a good job of that. They're yeah, they're crushing it. K is one of the problems that uh, Eric was talking about. He was saying it seems quite doable. Yeah, yeah, it looks pretty doable. Uh, it's a little bit uh, it's a little bit tricky to to prove that um, what you might. I think I think the first step is it looks pretty reasonable to uh, to to experienced competitive programmers. Um, if you think about like how the like what how how the shape looks and it's like this geometry problem where you're trying to find the furthest point away so you should look at the convex hole yeah um one one tricky thing about this is actually proving the runtime of of the algorithm that you might write is actually very difficult um it's actually not uh not obvious that uh not obvious that it doesn't have doesn't actually take exponentially many operations and in fact it does take a large number of operations but fortunately uh it, it is just small enough given these bounds well, this is the kind of thing where if it's solved now, right. when there are 90 minutes left, what, what I was going to say earlier before the special announcement, right. is that with 90 minutes left, what teams tend to do is focus on one particular problem and make sure they get that problem. Right. If there's three problems they're working on, they're going to drop two of them, focus on the one they're most confident on, and make sure right. they don't wind up with three half-solved problems right. and no solved problems at the end of the contest. You right. want to make sure you, you get at least one of these. Right. But at... At this point, no one's starting a new problem. Right. So they're other unless you're MIT or, or maybe one of the the top top four teams. Right. I guess if you have fewer than seven, maybe maybe. But if you haven't seen K yet and you've just dismissed K as too hard of a problem, you right. might be in trouble. Yeah, you might. It might be. Uh, it might be time to go back and look at the problem, especially since especially for a team like MIT, uh, they have only two problems left, and so they. You know, maybe one person is working on D and another person is looking over their shoulder, like helping them, right? Pair programming. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and the other person should definitely take another look at K at this point, right? It would be super interesting to see what MIT's screen is right here. If it shows up, we'll be sure to draw attention to it. Right. Uh, I would love to see whether they're coding D, coding K, right, or just thinking and trying to, to solve both of them before they jump on terminal. Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, as a... Uh, as we were, uh, as the ticker is pointing out, like both D and K are geometry problems, so they might even share a little bit of code. Um, e is also uh, E is a common, is a hard combinatorics problem, and uh, so so that's off MIT's plate. But now everyone else is probably looking pretty hard at E and thinking about whether it can be solved. And uh, I guess well, we've got D and K, which are are the things people are worried most about. But we got a solution video to problem C coming up in just a second here. So watch out for that. Watch out. Problem C, fair division. There is a crew of N pirates from six to one million, and they want to divide the loot, which can be very, very big. Uh, they stand in circle and choose the fraction f. Each pirate uh, is taking f of the loot, uh, the real number, and passing it next. Uh, we have to find the fraction f that it exactly divides the loot. So in the very, very end, everyone will get an integer. Okay. Uh, at first, let's see what will be on the first round. The first pirate will get exactly a multiplied by f, and you can see it on the screen. Then let's see uh, the next step. Um, then uh, we can notice that this is a geometric progression. So we can compute the sum of this geometric progression. It will be something like this. Okay. Then uh, let's say that f is p divided by p plus q, 
and then uh, minus f is q divided by p plus q, then we can just substitute this values to this uh, geometric progression sum. Okay, uh, we will get something like this. Uh, let's try to do it a bit more beautiful. And uh, in the very, very end, we will get the, this result. This is for the first pirate, and this is for the last pirate. Uh, what we want to have? We want these numbers to be integer, which means that, uh, uh, so this is integer, and this is also integer. Uh, this means that this number multiplied by uh, GCD of these two numbers is, should be also integer. But GCD of these two numbers is 1, because they are uh, nominator and denominator of the fraction. So uh, we want this number to be integer. So let it be at least 1. Then uh, let's rewrite the denominator a bit. We will have something like this and like this. So uh, what do we want to say? We want to say that if this uh, is greater than 1, then uh, we can decrease denominator and it will be also greater than 1. But uh, let's remember that we have at least 6 pirates, which means that p plus q it should be less than uh, the square root of, of power n minus 1, uh, which is less than 4,000. Okay, and then solution should be like uh, we will break force p and q. For n bigger than 61, p plus q uh, is bounded by 2, which is relatively small. And we have to be careful with the overflow. So we can substitute p and q, which we brought force to this formula and check that it's integer. That's it. For more from the ICPC World Finals DACA, follow us at news.icpc.global and on social media with our hashtag ICPCWFDACA. All right, welcome back. We have uh, some, some teams doing quite well, and this is the only failing test for problem D of Tokyo University. If they can figure this out and solve it, uh, it looks like it's quite doable. Is this just two points? I can't quite tell what this is. I, I think what's going on, so so problem D is about, uh, is about, you know, going from one point and seeing another point within this polygon, and my best guess is that it, within within like some ugly shaped museum. My best guess is that this is, oh, this might just be this might just be a rectangle. Okay. I was thinking it might be like a zigzaggy zigzaggy kind of museum where they have to walk back and forth, and oh. it's just so small that we can't quite tell. It's certainly hard to hard to see. It's it's certainly a bit hard to see, um, but I, we're, th I'm thinking maybe it's one of those one of those cases. Obviously, they don't know. Uh, oh, it looks like there was just another AC from University of Warsaw. Problem, problem G. G. That's uh that that'll move them up quite a bit, right? Uh, maybe to gold finals range or to gold gold medal range, right? I think we are at uh I think there are five teams now who have eight problems, yeah. Uh, who have at least eight problems? That's MIT who has ten, Peking University has nine, and then three teams with eight problems are University of Tokyo, University of Warsaw, and uh the uh, NRU Higher School of Economics from Russia. One quick announcement I want to make here about National Taiwan University. They are currently in 12th place, which is in the range for, for looking for a medal. Uh, and they have a wrong answer on I. They're going to try and get it. Hopefully they can get an AC here. Right. Uh, one, of their, one of their members, his code force's handle is Skyline Baby. Uh, he got sixth place in mm -hmm. IMO, okay. uh, International Math Olympiad, right. uh, in 2018. And he used a technique called uh, Perfect Hexagons. Apparently, this is a pretty advanced math technique. So advanced, in fact, mm -hmm. the person grading his test right. didn't know what it was. Oh. So in order for him to teach the person grading his test what it was, he wrote on his test, Google perfect hexagons, click on the first link, read that, and that's the prerequisite to understanding my solution. Wow. He got enough points for it to get sixth place, and he sent me right. a picture of what the test looked like with right. some translations into English. Right. Uh, and I thought it was pretty funny. Right, right. That, that is pretty funny. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in, in addition, uh, in 2021, the same team competed, and they submitted an extra time to all of the problems mm -hmm. in order to get extra penalty points. Right. 
and uh, they w did this in order to avoid going to World Finals a second time. Because uh, they have they have other things they want right, to do. Right, because you you have you know you you only ha you only can, are allowed to go twice. And they wanted to unlock it for the other teams and, right. and be nice and let other people have a chance at this right. terrific event. At this amazing event, yeah. So yeah, anyway, they are they are in twelfth place and they're going to see if they can hang on right. and uh, maybe do a little bit better. Maybe try and get a silver or gold medal instead. Right, right. I mean, anything can really happen at this point in the contest. We've now seen that pretty much every problem is is solvable. E has been solved. K has been solved. And as we as we were saying, Tokyo is one is only one test away from solving problem D. They are so close, and if the judges were going for a perfect set, I think this is exactly how you do it. The only thing you have to be careful for is MIT exceeding your expectations and slime just going ham on the problems you expected to be the hardest. Yeah, I mean they have they have 80 minutes left at this point, and so they definitely could solve two problems. Could you know they they could manage to get submissions in for both problems. One of the things that's really important when you're competing in one of these contests is figuring out which teammates will do which problems. Right. The earlier teams tend to have, you know, people who focus on one particular aspect. Maybe you're, you're the geometry main. Mm -hmm. That doesn't work too well if you run into a problem like K, where it doesn't look like a geometry problem. Right. But it uses convex hull, and if you have someone who's not familiar with that, you might right. run into, tro into right. problems. So uh, we're going to take a look in just a second right. on how some of the teams at this World Finals might approach that challenge. Right. And I guess we'll see uh, which which ways of doing this are the best from some of the best teams here. Yeah. Stay tuned. At first, we just divide them evenly, so I take the first third, other guy take the second third, and the remaining guy take the remaining third. One member see first four problems, and the second one see the second four problems, and I see the last four problems. So at the start of the contest, it's essentially a free-for-all as we all just work together to solve the easy problems as quickly as we can. Afterwards, we split up and specialize according to our own individual areas of expertise. For example, I believe I am a bit better in uh, math questions while uh, my teammates are better in coding problems so we just communicate with each other and try to like find the best person to, so to solve each problem. For more from the ICPC World Finals DACA, follow us at news.icpc.global and on social media with our hashtag ICPCWFDACA. All right, welcome back. Uh, yeah, we've got some some people a little worried about Peking University. They're saying their penalty is too high. It is very high, right? Which means they're going to have to fight on problems. If they're they going to gonna have to be on problems, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's I mean it's it's a it's really tricky to 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 be in a situation like Peking University. In some sense, they don't really have anything they can do better at this point in time. They just got to work just like the rest of the teams uh, on solving problems. Um, but they really have. Uh, you know, they all the problems they have that, that can help them are, are the hardest problems. So they, they have it a little tough. One of the things that makes it even tougher for them is for teams like MIT, right. when you only have two problems left, it's really easy to make estimations on how long each thing is gonna take. Right. You only have so many All right, well hopefully we're we're back. Um if uh if we are we will take a look at a video in just a second. Lot, lots of these team members are, are very happy to be world finalists, and uh, it's a it's a huge accomplishment. Right. When I first started doing competitive programming, I honestly didn't think I'd make it to world finals. Yeah. And like I I, I went to to UCF in order to mm -hmm. do competitive programming. Uh huh. And I I didn't consider myself that good, and it took a lot of training, a lot of effort. Right. And I got pretty lucky, I'd say. I, I think a lot of it was I luck. mean, you also got pretty good. I I got I got kind of good. I got kind of good, but it was fun, and it, it meant a lot to me. And, and making it here was was very important. Yeah, uh, that's, and something I'm very proud of. Yeah, and we we'll get a chance to see how uh, some of these contestants actually uh, how they feel.
It feels great finally to be here. Kind of like dreams come true. It's completely mesmerizing. Like I guess you you never know where life is gonna take you. Uh, I honestly didn't believe we would be here, so it really feels amazing uh, knowing that all the practice really really worked. It feels great. We are very thrilled and honored to represent our university and our country uh, in such a big platform. Just to qualify for the World Finals is uh, big itself, a very huge thing. Uh, then after, if we can do well in the World Finals, that is uh, another icing on the cake, <laughs> right? If I were to like uh, sum all my feelings up in like one word, I'd probably say a bit like emotional. This is actually my second and of course my last World Finals. It feels like, you know, the end of a chapter. For more from the ICPC World Finals DACA, follow us at news.icpc.global and on social media with our hashtag ICPCWFDACA. All right, welcome back. We have my coach, who some of you may remember, Arup Guha, from the University of Central Florida. Arup, how are you doing today? Great. Thanks for having me, David. Yeah, it's a, an honor to be here. Yeah, it's, it's great. Yeah. It is a, a, a formal, official ICPC stream. Yeah, that's And awesome. we're not yeah. going to have to do anything crazy with the background like we did yeah, last time. Yeah, I remember that. So this will be very, very formal, and, and hopefully it'll look good. Great. All right, we got an announcement here. Uh, NCTU just fixed a bug going from wrong answer to accepted. It looks like they were breaking uh, angle ties by distance from the origin, and that makes them AC, it appears. Good to see them getting a problem. All right, Arup, you are a coach of UCF. Yes, I am one of several coaches. What do you, yeah, yeah. yeah. What, what do you think of uh, UCF's performance so far today? Uh, I am very excited with how they're doing. Uh, I think they have a chance to uh, get in the top 12 there, hopefully. We can take a look at the scoreboard here. Uh, we've got a copy of it up. It looked okay. like just just recently they were in in metal range. They were in. They're within, yeah. They're, they're yeah. within striking distance for sure. And it looks like so. I think last time I checked they had some some attempts on B as well. Yes, A and B I think are the ones that they're working on. I haven't taken a look in a little bit. We're we're getting Wi-Fi up here. It's a, it's a bit of yeah. a, an ordeal. <laughs> but we'll we'll take a look in just a minute. Um, yeah. So a couple a couple of questions for you here. Sure. This is the, the second year in a row. First year was, was with my team. Yes. That UCF Russia. has actually replaced one of its members. Correct. Or had to replace one of Correct. its members yeah. for World Finals. Yes. That's like a pretty big a big like task for the for the teammates. You gotta learn to compete with a new person and all this yes. stuff. Yes, yeah, absolutely. What has UCF been doing in order to like help mitigate that change and, and stay on track and keep you in well? Well, I think with uh, with your team, we'll start with, with your team. Sure, right? yeah, yeah. Absolutely. A, a, a was Taking somebody who, A, obviously was eligible to be the replacement, and obviously it's only due to COVID, right? Under normal circumstances, uh, you know, this wouldn't have happened. Um, but yeah, A, picking someone who's eligible, B, someone that the other two teammates uh, know well and would get along with very well, right? So I think with, with you, once we made that selection, we had talked to you and consulted both you and Josh about that. And then once we got the go-ahead, right, then uh, we're like, okay, well, as soon as we did that, we got practices together, right? I think, and you even facilitated it by coming out to Orlando because you weren't even in Orlando. Anymore. Yeah, it, it was a uh, it was a fun thing to do, and uh, I guess I, I've seen uh, UCF has been having a lot of fun in DACA. Yes, they, they've, I've seen <laughs> some cool pictures from them. They were enjoying the the cultural experience. I think there was some concert yes. that was held here. Uh, were you able to see any of that or no? I was not. So, you know, what's really interesting is that my father was born in Bangladesh. Really? And he hasn't been back here, and he still hasn't been back here since he was five when he left. Oh, my goodness. Before the partition. So one of the things I really wanted to do was go see where he was born. And did you check it out? I did. It What'd was you think? The, it, it was It was really eye-opening. So it's a village about three hours away from Dhaka, and uh, I was lucky to be able to find a driver who was willing to go out there. And I kid you not, and I have confirmation from my dad, really did see the house that he was probably born That's in. That's incredible. So, so yeah, so I was doing that instead of dancing. Yeah, well, that's, uh, I, think, <laughs> I think you have your priorities straight here. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, good job. Yeah. All right, so we got the scoreboard up. UCF is currently in 20th place. Oh, wow, okay. They yeah, have, need to get uh, yeah, A they, and B. They've been yeah. dropping pretty quick. But I think yeah, that's just because lots of teams are lots of teams are solving A to be honest. Yeah, yeah, that looks like the the question to solve. 
Yep. It might be nice if we can figure out what it is that UCF is doing wrong on A, if any of the judges have a minute to take a look at their submissions. That would be great. Uh, another announcement here, we got Tokyo University. They're failing one test on D. Uh, it's not necessarily a trivial test, so <laughs> it's like there, there's some involvement. Uh, there are nine, nine points in the case, but uh, yeah, the judges aren't quite sure if it's a precision issue or if they're just doing something wrong. Uh, to, yeah, like I guess as an announcement, this is the, the only team that's attempted D seriously so far. I think only team that's attempted D at all. And they're, they're doing pretty well. If they get it, then uh, that brings them a little bit closer to catching MIT. But they're likely going to need D and another problem just to tie. Uh, and probably DI in the third problem in order to win. Yeah, yeah. What do you think, UC let's go back to UCF here. Okay. What do you think UCF's strategy in order to... I think is, is meddling their goal. Is that what they're going for? I, I think they'd like to meddle. Yeah, I think absolutely. that would be a very yeah. a very good goal at yeah, this point. Goal. Yeah. What do you think their their strategy to do that is? Are they going for six or do you think they'll need seven? I think they'll need seven. I think they'll need seven. Looking at uh, how the score looks right now, and uh, so right now, uh, I think their best bet is uh, trying to figure out what their bug on A is, and perhaps I'm going to guess they need to speed up B. I'm not 100 percent sure, but. Yeah, That's gonna be my guess. it's interesting. It's interesting. Yeah. I also think have they? Uh, I think it was H, right? That was the FF or not H? G was the FFT. Um, so I think they they have the tools to solve G. Yes, yes I know they are aware of FFT for I, sure. I know. Yeah. I know at UCF we spend a lot of time training these these particular skills. Yes, yes, uh, and that is one of them. Yeah. Oh, sure. and we'll we'll come right back in just a minute after this video. Hello everyone, this is the analysis for problem F, Islands from the Sky. So first I'll give you a brief introduction of the problem statement, then I'll proceed with an overview of the solution, and finally I'll give you the complete uh, solution. Uh, so first of all, in the problem statement, we are given an archipelago uh, in a 2D plane with n islands. Uh, there are at most 100 islands, and each of them can have at most 100 vertices, and they are represented by a polygon. Uh, in this scenario, we have M planes flying over this archipelago, and each of them have a camera in which they can view a region of this 2D plane. So they have a visibility projection on it. Uh, they are at most 100 planes, and we are given the star position X, Y, Z1, and the end uh, position X, Y, Z2 of said planes. Now, the problem uh, is that we want to uh, alter the angle in which the camera can view uh, uh, these 2D plane, and we want to see what is the smallest angle so that each of the islands is completely visible by at least one of the planes. So uh, the overview of the solution is that we want to do a binary search on the angle theta. Uh, having one of the thetas fixed, we can then uh, first find a projection of the trajectory of the plane into the 2D, uh, into 2D uh, polygon. And then uh, we can proceed to see uh, and check which of the islands are covered with a uh, set angle theta. And if all the islands are covered, we can try to reduce the angle. And if at least one of them is not, we can increase the angle. So first, let's say that we already have done our binary search and we have a fixed angle theta. How do we find the 3D projection of our flight in the 2D planes? So we have four informations, the X and the Y, uh, Z and theta. So for the X and Y, we have the origin point and the destination one. And from this one, we can uh, create the trajectory line and trajectory path that we are taking. Now, uh, the Z and uh, theta can give us uh, the surface area that is visible by said plane. So with uh, a z height and a theta end goal, we know that we can see up to the uh, tangent of theta to the, uh, to the sign. So now we can combine these two. So we have our flight trajectory uh, here, going from x1 up to uh, x1, y1 up until x2, y2. And horizontally, perpendicular to this, we have uh, our perpendicular line and if with a uh, z uh, tangent of theta, we have uh, two points here uh, delimiting our view. And by doing this both from the origin point and the destination point, 
we can create a polygon that corresponds to uh, this paint's visibility. Now that we know uh, for each of the paints how much they can view of the 3D planes, how can we see that one island is being fully covered by at least one of the planes? So we can separate this by first checking for each different plane and for each island separately. Now, uh, if you have a single plane in a single island, the problem is to find that one polygon is completely covered by another one, which is a common uh, classical algorithm. So in this algorithm, we can uh, isolate each of the points in uh, the island polygon and check that this single point is inside another polygon, which can be done uh, by um, checking um, um, half planes for each of the uh, lines that we have on the uh, on sorry each of the lines that we have on our uh, plane projection, which I, uh, I won't go into much more details. Um, so now that we have this, uh, so how, what does this leave us in the solution? So first we do a binary search on the angle theta, which has a lot of complexity. Now having uh, in a single iteration of this binary search, we have a fixed angle theta. And for this fixed angle, we can find what is the 2D projection of our plane flight, which is done in uh, constant time. Now we can find the coverage of uh, the islands. For each of the planes that we have and for each of the islands, we can check that this island is fully covered by this plane by checking all the points. And for each of these points, we can check that uh, it is, um, this point is, being, uh, is in the half plane that in, is, uh, sorry, seeing that this point is inside the uh, trajectory polygon. So this, uh, the full solution has a complexity of n squared log n. For more from the ICPC World Finals DACA, follow us at news.icpc.global and on social media with our hashtag ICPCWFDACA. All right, welcome back. We have my, my coach, Arup, from UCF. Uh, we've been talking a little bit about the strategy UCF is going to need to use in order to get a medal in the rest of the contest. Uh, and we have a bunch of teams solving problems here, including we had one team just get their sixth. Uh, I think St. Petersburg HSE just got their sixth, I believe. And I guess Zurich just got their seventh. So well done. That puts them in silver medal range. Uh, I guess I've got a quick couple questions for you, Arup. Sure. One of the teams that the UC or one of the, the topics that the UCF teams uh, are, are very good at and certainly have the ability to solve is FFT problems. Yes. Where do, where do uh, people like me and, and this UCF team, where do they learn that usually? So a few years ago, probably about six or seven years ago, because most of our students uh, don't do IOI, in fact have next to no experience in programming competitions until they come to college. So we have to kind of get them going from the beginning. And uh, you know, obviously it's very time consuming to do you know, lots of live lectures on things like Dijkstra's algorithm. So I created about uh, 40 different units on different topics you know, from like basic graph algorithms to actually FFT, you have like an FFT set. So each of these units has like a video and then some practice problems which they can submit on an automatic judge. So that is, uh, yeah, I put that together w over about four or five years, and now all of our new students can use that to kind of get up to speed. And we were talking with Erikto. He said uh, this was a somewhat standard idea. If you've solved enough FFT problems, uh, it unlocks the ability for you to solve this sort of thing. And hopefully that's something that UCF can see. It depends. FFT is tricky because you kind of got to think to use it. Yeah. So it's kind of like flowing that way. Yeah. But, yeah. All right, we have a quick announcement here. The four-hour mark has just passed. Do you want to explain to everyone what that means, Arup? Sure. So unfortunately, for the general public uh, and pretty much everyone but the contestants and the judges, uh, there will not be changes on the scoreboard. So the contestants know when they submit a problem whether or not they get it right. But we, the outside public, will not see that. But we will see that a team has made a pending submission. It'll probably flash on the score sheet. Yeah, so you can see up here on the left part of your screen, you'll see which teams submit to which problems. But you'll notice the, the compile error information, everything else, whether it was correct, wrong, stuff like that, that's all hidden from the scoreboard. And we won't see any of that until after the contest is over during the scoreboard reveal while we'll use the resolver. And there will be a, a very entertaining uh, reveal of which teams got which problems in the last hour correct, which teams got them wrong, and that'll reveal who wins the contest and, and how well people do. Yep. So it should be quite fun. All right. 
we got a couple minutes left with you, Arup. I All know right. I know Andrew wanted to come in. He had he had something he wanted to say around around this okay. mark. Absolutely. But uh, yeah, I, I just want to talk very briefly about how, how UCF like does such a good job training people, starting from basically like brand new programmers into being ICPC World Finals level contestants. Well, I, I think you know part of it obviously is that we build a culture. So we have anywhere from 20 to 40 students who work on these problems weekly, even though you know many of them have just started. And uh, you know, so not only can they learn from the coaches, but they can learn from each other. And I think what usually happens, it takes about a semester for them to kind of get up to speed with the very basic stuff. But once they're down with that, then it's really that spring semester, that very first year spring semester. I know Seba, who's on this team, really made huge leaps and bounds. Uh, you know, started practicing with the top members of, of the team and just absorbing so many new things so fast. Uh, usually running like a second set, I think many teams do this, during the middle of the week. You know, we practice on Saturday with one five-hour set, but uh, you know, the students who are really motivated end up doing a second five-hour set in the middle of the week. Yeah, we spend, we spend all Saturday doing, doing contests. Afterwards, teammates usually get together, get dinner or something like that, do some, yeah. some team bonding activities. A lot of times we'll do We'll like learn new topics from people, sometimes on Saturdays. It depends year to year, sometimes it changes. And then also, yeah, throughout the week, in addition to the Saturday practices, teams will do a bunch of other practices on their own because ultimately you're responsible for your own learning. But at the same time at UCF, there's a lot of uh, cases of like previous team members like becoming coaches and especially uh, professors at the university being coaches. And they do a fantastic job helping other team members grow. Like Garut mentioned earlier, none of these contestants were IOI people. None of them really did Yusako. Uh, I think Daniel did a little bit. Maybe a little bit. A little yeah. bit, but but overall, like nowhere near compared to uh, the kind of like talent that was entering MIT. But yet, when it's when it's leaving, we were we were beating MIT earlier, uh, and there were lots of comments about that. And mm -hmm. that's that's really like an incredible thing uh, to do, especially because all of that that delta, that increase in, in ability, all came from UCF. Yeah, yeah, and it's it is great to see that growth. And we love attempting to compete, you know, with, uh, yeah, absolutely. All right. I want to let you go, Arup. I think we have uh, a video coming up in just a bit. And, oh, I guess, hang on. We have uh, something from, from MIT, perhaps? Maybe not. It looks like we, we may have had an announcement from, from MIT. All right. We'll have it, we'll have it in, in just a minute. So we were talking uh, recently about, about how much teams from UCF practice. Uh, other than, other than the, the two sets, two five-hour yeah. sets a week, uh, what, what sort of things do teams usually do at UCF? Uh, usually it's some sort of targeted practice. So different teams have different coaches, and each coach tries to figure out something that will benefit individual team members or individual teams. So sometimes to work on one-on-one -on -one communication, I'll just have two students work together on specific types of problems. So shorter exercises. Uh, to you know, improve specific things. So here's a, a little bit of a controversial topic for you, Rup. I think you'll have something okay. to say about it. So there's there's a, a kind of a controversy, especially on Code Forces, on whether it's better to learn new things by just solving random problems or by picking a topic and solving like ten of those problems. Personally, I think just from the learn sets, I have become very partial towards the second way. You pick a topic, you solve 10 FFT problems, you solve 20 segment tree problems. Then when a segment tree problem comes up, you know you can do it. Uh, but do you have any, any preference towards the two? Is there anything that the people you train, you recommend they do? Well, I think you need a little bit of both, you know, uh, because there's some problems that defy categorization. So for certain types of things that are easy to categorize, yeah, absolutely. If a coach can go out and find 10 problems that fit that category, it's way better to do it that way than completely doing random problems. But there are some creative problems where you know we call them ad hoc, and the only way to get better at those is to just go out and do random problems. So I, I think a hybrid. Yeah, I guess one of the advantages that there is in terms of just solving random problems is that you don't know the category. Uh, and if like you know FFT problems, on one hand it does teach you FFT, but if every time you encounter an FFT problem you're told beforehand, hey, this is FFT, it's kind of like trying to fit something into the mold. Yeah, and prob uh, problem obfuscation is huge at World Finals particularly. Yeah, yeah. All right, here's a quick video on how other teams have been practicing. Uh, we hope you enjoy. We'll be right back.
Typically, we just pull out an old prom set and do a full five hour contest together. Sometimes we simply gather for like five hours for a contest time and try to focus maximally on the tasks to create the environment that would be most similar to one that we will have during the contest. Most of the time we just absolve some old contests, for example we take the past, some of the past world finals and then we just play them as if we were competing with those teams and try to beat them, try to score as much as possible. You know? For more from the ICPC World Finals DACA, follow us at news.icpc.global and on social media with our hashtag ICPCWFDACA. All right, welcome back. We have Andrew yet again. Yeah, back for the final hour of the contest. The scoreboard is frozen, and, and the teams are trying to catch MIT. Yeah, the the scoreboard is definitely, uh, you know, the you know this contest is pretty exciting, and we'll see what teams are able to pull out. Um, but while you know we are unable to see any of these, uh, while we are unable to see any of these uh, uh, these these submissions, you know, submission results. I thought I would give a quick summary recap of all the problems. I don't know if you've talked about all of them yet. I haven't talked about all of them. Uh, honestly, I haven't even had a chance to sit down and read the set. Right, I've right. been so busy with the stream, but right. we would uh, we'd love to hear them. So let's right. let's so, so let's let's go through the problems once again uh, while we're while we're uh, you know while we're working here. So first off, we have problem. Uh, I'll, I'll go through them in the order that they were uh, that they were solved. Okay. Uh, that they were solved. So the first problem to be solved of the contest was problem H. Um, this is, you know, about a few different, like, uh, it's about, it's about these clay tablets. They're, they have like this pictographic writing system on them. Uh, and the, it turns out that the writing system is just a sequence of open and close, uh, open and close parens, uh, open and close parentheses, but the tablet has been broken into pieces. And you need to uh, take these pieces and rearrange them so that the entire string is ba a balanced parentheses sequence. I see, I see. And uh, yeah, you, you pick the order and there are some, some greedy things you can do to sort it. Right, right. Uh, and, and yeah, the, the, it really comes down to a greedy understanding of how these parentheses work. Um, the next problem to be solved in the contest was problem C. This is the problem uh, fair division. Uh, it's about pirates who are trying to, uh, you know, uh, to distribute their loot in a way that, you know, there's not too much discrepancy between what each person <coughs> receives. Uh, and the way it works is that uh, each each pirate takes a uh, each pirate takes a cut and then passes it on to the next person, uh, and uh, the goal is that everyone ends up with an integer amount of uh, an integer amount. And so this is kind of a number theory problem, and it turns out to be kind of uh, kind of just working with the numbers and working out some math formulas actually, taking some summations in closed form and trying to work through uh, what might work, uh, what what the you know just what might result in an integer value. We have a quick announcement here. MIT has submitted to both problem D and problem K. Right. And so it's tough to say exactly what they're doing. We, we saw their screen a little bit earlier, um, but we will, uh, we'll, have to, we'll have to hold on and uh, wait for maybe the scoreboard reveal even. We'll be, we'll be right back. One possible strategy is they're submitting to one of them legit and the other one to trick people. But sure. uh, you never know. All right, here's a quick video for you guys about the learning experiences here in DACA. It is the first full day of ICPC DACA, and it was a morning full of learning for ICPC contestants and their coaches as they heard this year's Tech Talk, courtesy of JetBrains and Richard Peng's Alumni Talk. After a delicious lunch and a chance to relax in this year's Chill Zone and Tech Showcase, it was time to make things official with team registration. After dinner, the colorful local culture was on display in performances at the day's cultural experience in the ICPC Expo Hall. For more from the ICPC World Finals DACA, follow us at news.icpc.global and on social media with our hashtag ICPCWFDACA. And we're back. I uh, hope you guys uh, hope you guys had uh, hope you guys liked the video about the experiences here in Dhaka. Um, 
Yeah, so where were we? We were talking about some of the problems. Yeah, uh, we were going through. We, we mentioned how it was about dividing things. Right, right. Uh, and uh, it really comes down to you know some number theory to solve it. Um, uh, problem L uh, was the next problem to be solved. Uh, this problem was solved also about like around half an hour into the contest. Uh, and this problem was about um, was about trying to identify where you are by just walking in a spiral. So there are some markings on the ground, uh, and you're walking in a spiral, and you're trying to figure out where uh, where you might uh, end up. Uh, and you know the uh, one you're trying to you're trying to stop as early as possible. And so the general approach is you actually try starting at every single point and comparing like the different times that you see the markings. Um, the way you compare is it's kind of uh, you kind of compare them lexicographically. You kind of sort the values and then compare the prefixes uh, and consider like when the prefixes start to differ. Um, so that's problem L, and that was the third problem of the contest. We we actually still see submits coming in for problem L, right? Uh, yeah, we do. We also see MIT's screen right now, and it looks like they're still editing something, so they're probably not done. Right. I think what I what we what I remember seeing is that problem D problem D is in terminal, and problem uh, K is being coded in VS Code. So that's a little hint. Ah, uh, interesting. At home all right, all right. For which one they're working on? So it's problem D, it seems. I, I think they might be working on both, but uh, we'll we'll have to see. We'll uh, you know we'll we'll leak a little bit of information, but the, at the end of the day, the information might uh. You might have to wait until the scoreboard reveal. Yeah, yeah. Certainly, at least for every team that's not MIT, you'll need to need to see in the scoreboard reveal. Right, right. Yeah. So this this problem, uh, problem J, is uh, the next problem in the set. Um, it, it was called split stream, um, and it's about uh, kind of stream processing. It's about uh, processing uh, processing data. You're given an infinite string of numbers or a long string of numbers, and some boxes split them into the even terms and the odd terms, and then some boxes can merge to merge two things together. So one thing you could do is you could split it into even and odd, and then split the evens again into multiples of four, and you know one mod four, and then you can merge the multiples of four with the odd numbers, and that would give you a different stream. And the question is, uh, you're supposed to answer a bunch of queries of, for for this particular output stream, what is the what is the case value? I see, I see. Yeah, and, and one 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 thing that's a little bit inconspicuous in the problem statement is that the number of queries is actually very small. Um, there are only 3,000 queries. It's, it, oftentimes, they have very large uh, bounds. Yeah, but usually you got to answer the queries quick. But here, you you can, but here you actually, time. you can run each query ind independently. And so this problem is really an exercise in making sure that you can implement things, making sure that you know how to look things up, and uh, just making sure that you actually, I, I guess the, the biggest trick is you have to analyze, OK, if I want the kth output of this, it's going to be the k over 2th input of the last merge, and it's going to be you know, the 2kth the output of the last split, and things like that. And so you have to realize that. Gotcha. All right, all right. Right. Um, what cool. else do we have? So the next problem in our, in, in, that was solved in the set was problem A. This is called crystal crosswind. Uh, and it's about, uh, it's about, I guess, uh, imaging microscopic crystal structures at a molecular level. Um, and what we're trying to do, what we're given is that uh, we have a bunch of different directions. Uh, and for each direction, we know which, which cells are different than the, the cell in that direction. So say, like, say the direction is 1, 1, so like up and to the right. Then we know which cells are filled, but. <laughs>
from the ICPC World Finals DACA, follow us at news.icpc.global and on social media with our hashtag ICPCWFDACA. And we are back. Um, we see there are still submissions coming in. Waterloo has submitted on G. and We got another submit from MIT on problem D as well. Right, right. So we'll, we'll see exactly how well they do on that. Um, but yeah, back to our just quick discussion of the problems. Problem F. Problem F is about um, it's it's 3D geometry. It's about uh, it's mostly just testing your implementation of 3D geometry. So there's a plane on the ground, uh, sorry, a polygon on the ground, and there's a plane flying through the air, and you want to the pl the the plane to be able to uh, like s to be able to see the entire see the entire uh, polygon as it flies, and you want to make sh and and you want to do this with as small a viewing angle as possible. And you want to like pick the pick the angle that you're seeing it as, and then minimize the angle. You want to yeah. You want to minimize the angle okay. by so so the yeah. You want to minimize the angle so that because you it, we're saying that you only see a small angle beneath you, and you want to make this angle as small as possible, but be able to see the entire polygon. Gotcha. All right. All right. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's really just three D geometry implementation. I see. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah so uh, the next problem to be solved was problem I. This is spider walk. I was talking to. Um, uh, I guess I'll, I'll describe the problem first. So this problem is, it's kind of phrased as a biological process, um, but it's really, it, I think it's really based on this Korean game uh, called Ghost Ladder. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's about, you have a spider who's in the middle of a circular web, uh, and the spider uh, the, the, it has many strands, and the spider uh, walks outwards. And every time it encounters a bridge that crosses the strands, it jumps across the bridge. The spider jumps across the bridge and goes to the other strand. Uh, and you want to find, you want to add the minimum number of bridges so that you end up at a, par at a particular number of bridges so that you end up at a, par at a particular. See? Yeah. And I think that's why it took, that's why it took longer. Um, I thought it might have just been some VFS, but it turns out there are some cases where if you want to jump across a lot of strands, you have to, you have to have cases for jumping across them at any given point in time. You have to like, like add several adjacent yeah. things for each one. Yeah, right, yeah. right, yeah. And so uh, that that would actually that would actually be too slow. Um, the next problem to be solved was one that the judges thought would be very hard, and we saw some a lot of submits to it at the beginning. This is problem B. Um, this is uh, a, it's about a dungeon crawler. Um, so Alice and Bob are trapped in this you know dungeon. There, are, uh, it's, a, it's a tree. So there are. Uh, there are n vertices and n minus one like inescapable corridors. So if you go into a corridor, you have to come out the other side. And uh, uh, and Alice's goal is to just visit all of the rooms. But there's two special rooms. There's a key room and a trap room. And you have to go to the key room before you go to the trap room. Okay. Uh, and your goal is just to visit all of, all of these rooms uh, as fast as possible. Is Bob involved in this at all or no? Uh, I guess I'm not really sure. I thought Alice was. At first, when I read this, I thought Alice might have been running from Bob. Okay. But I think actually Alice and Bob are just in it together. They're just I see. They're both exploring. Doing it together. All right. All right. Yeah. Um, so uh, the 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 interesting thing is that the the tree is relative. The tree is fixed, but uh, there are many different queries about particular start points, key locations, and end locations. And so this problem comes down to doing a lot of different uh, doing a lot of different tree uh, doing a little bit of tree manipulation and computing some different properties on trees so that you can do qu path queries on trees eff effectively. There's a little casework you have to start with. You have to realize that Alice, there's like four important waypoints. There's the start, the key, the trap, and then the end. So Alice has to walk from the start to the key, to the trap, to the end, because yeah. you have to get the key before the trap. Yeah, OK. And then, uh, and then you, so you get to pick where the end is, uh, but the others are essentially fixed. And so, uh, so once you understand that, that helps you with the casework. And then picking where the trap is requires a little bit of data structures. Picking where the end is requires a little bit of data structures. Our production crew has a lot of videos. They want to show all of them. And this is the last hour, which means there's not much other information. So here is one more about old DACA.
from the ICPC World Finals DACA, follow us at news.icpc.global and on social media with our hashtag ICPCWFDACA. And back we're again. back uh, again. Like yeah. The white vans. Yeah, quick, uh, quick exploration of DACA. Um, our host city, our beautiful host city. And we're gonna get back to grinding through these problems. Right, so the next problem to be solved was problem G. Um, I think this was kind of the last medium problem. Um, problem G is about, uh, it's about kind of this mosaic picture. Um, you, have, uh, you have a picture and a particular uh, pattern that you'd like to find in this picture. And you wanna find where exactly it occurs. So the pattern can have different colored tiles, uh, different particular colors of tiles. You can also have wild cards or empty spaces that don't matter. Uh, and the way to solve this, uh, there, are, there are two big observations. One of them is that you have to apply this uh, interesting randomized algorithm for testing whether a pattern occurs at a particular point. And the second phase is that you have to realize that this uh, randomized algorithm can be applied effectively uh, at all points by using FFT. So FFT, uh, one, one way of thinking about FFT is it allows you to compute the same thing at a lot of different points uh, and uh, at a lot of different locations. Uh, and that's exactly kind of what this is doing. You're trying to test this pattern against a lot of locations, but the, the randomized part that's tricky is making sure that you, is finding the right way to test that actually fits into the FFT model. Sounds pretty tough. Yeah, it's, it's quite tricky, and uh, it's very impressive that so many teams have, have, been able to, uh, have been able to find this technique. Maybe more, more difficult than I had initially thought, thinking it was just a, a straightforward application of FFT. Right, so the, the, the next problem to be solved was Problem E, which still has only been, oh no, it's been solved by two teams now. Uh, it was first solved by MIT, and I think Carnegie Mellon also solved it. This is hand of the free marked. Um, and so, you know, it's, I, I guess it's, it's, uh, it's about, you know, these, these, card, uh, these card magicians. They're not, you know, they're not quite pickpockets or anything, but uh, they're a magician. And this, this trick is uh, about uh, the trick where you have uh, K card, you have, uh, sorry. First, you're dealt like five cards, say, and you're allowed to arrange them in any way so that the fifth one is face down. So you can pick, you can reshuffle them, uh, you, can, uh, you, you can reshuffle them and pick which one is the fifth one, but you put the fifth card face down, the four, first four cards in whatever order you choose, and then your assistant comes out and, uh, and points to uh, and tries to guess what the fifth card is using only knowledge of what the order and what the face down, four face up cards are. So you get to pick both what the face down card is and you also get to show your assistant the order of the first four right you don't yeah you have to pick one of the five as the as the face down card but you get to pick which of the five and you get to order the four okay and so this this is pretty tricky because you uh we're we're kind of trying to uh, we're kind of trying to pack as much information as possible into just these four cards I see. um but it's very impressive that mit managed to get it and uh that congrats to them uh the last two problems we'll go through pretty quickly um problem k uh, is called take on meme, and this was this was in fact also solved. Um, uh, it's it's about this kind of like I guess fickle populace full of memes, and you're trying to uh, combine memes in this little tree uh, tree diagram, uh, and it turns out that it's a bit of a geometry problem because you're trying to minimize some Euclidean distance, and the main observation is just uh, if you want to maximize some Euclidean distance, you should be on the convex hull, and if you're on the convex hull, you might as well sweep by angle. The details after that are are pretty complicated. Um, there's a you kind of have to like maintain how things change across the angles, um, but uh, that's that's the main idea. And it turns out that that runs barely fast enough. That's also very difficult to prove. All right, all right. So this is a tricky problem. We'll see if any other teams manage to get it. So we'll talk about problem D after this. It was the first day of problem solving for ICPC contestants with the ICPC challenge powered by Huawei. Both contestants and coaches had a chance to solve real world problems and win cool prizes. The opening ceremony featured welcomes, most notably from Bangladesh's Minister of Foreign Affairs. Contestants enjoyed musical performances of both traditional and modern selections and dance. I now humbly declare the ICPC World 45 Finals officially open. For more from the ICPC World Finals DACA, follow us at news.icpc.global 
and on social media with our hashtag ICPCWFDACA. All right. Uh, and that was a quick look at our opening ceremony, right? Which happened two, yesterday, two days ago. Two days, two days ago, ago. yeah. 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 Um, but now we're back uh, with our last problem. This is problem D, Guardians of the Galaxy. Uh, and uh, this is, you know, a lot of people are looking at this problem because this is MIT's potentially last problem. Uh, if they solve it, they might end up with a picture-perfect finish. Uh, very impressive. And it is also about, you know, pictures. It's about a gallery. Uh, and there's a museum guard who's in this gallery and wants to walk to a point where he's able to see this particular statue. And this sounds, that's the whole problem. This sounds pretty, pretty straightforward, like as a, as a statement. They don't ask you for the minimum distance you need to walk, They ask you for the they? minimum distance that you need to walk. Uh. Um, and so uh, suddenly the museum, the layout of the museum is just any arbitrary polygon. It can have dents in it, it can have holes, it can do a spiral in and a spiral back out. Kind of so, cave polygons can be tricky. And, and so finding the shortest path is very tricky. Making sure that you properly handle all the edge cases of, oh, when am I able to go around this corner versus when am I like accidentally trying to burrow, th burrow through this wall? And uh, taking care of all those cases is very tricky. And this is going to be one of the hardest problems to implement, even if teams know the solution. There's a problem similar to it called racetrack that I solved one summer. Right. And it took me over 35 submissions, and I had to write my own data viewer in order to see the kind of cases I was getting wrong. It's a right, whole right. whole mess. Yeah, I mean, we've seen MIT has submitted problem D like at least five or six times already. Uh, yeah, they're, they're working on it still. They're working on it still. Or, or trying uh, to fool all of us. Or trying to fool all of us. Peking University has also submitted both problem E and problem D, so they're definitely, they're definitely in contention still. Uh, and yeah, if they solved both of those, then they actually do have a chance to pass MIT. If they solve it, they solve those problems and MIT doesn't. It's so, going to be a, an interesting scoreboard reveal, that's for sure. It is definitely going to be an exciting scoreboard reveal. All right, coming up next, we have one of our judges, uh, and we will hear what it was like to create these problems and how difficult or easy that kind of process was. We'll be right, right back in just a sec. Hey, we are back. Hello. Uh, I have Arnav here with me. Hey, everyone. Uh, Arnav is one of the judges for this year. Yep. Um, and uh, yeah, what, uh, did you? How, how many problems did you write this year? Uh, I guess let's start off. Yeah, let's start off. Um, so the judging team is uh, pretty diverse. We've got a good group of judges, and we actually have a system where there's a couple of judges on each problem. Uh, mm -hmm. So and and they're kind of collaborative efforts. So the ones I came up with the ideas with were. Uh, B, Dungeon Crawler, and I, Spider Walk, so two uh -huh. of them. Right. Um, yeah, but uh, like the ones I actually like worked on and developed were a totally different set. Right. And it's right. kind of hard to say who like owns a problem once it's uh, once it's been developed or once it's been proposed. Mm -hmm. Makes yeah. sense. Um, we're gonna cut to this quick video. Okay. Uh, about the uh, world finalists. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll be right back. Never give up on your dream. If you want something bad enough, you will get it. Uh, mostly just practice as much as you can. I think that in the final, we are trying our best to calm down and play our best. That basic communicating part is, I think, what is the most fun and also, I think, what, what matters the most and that, that like, skill can be also used in like, other like, aspects in life. To be a good uh, competitive programmer, you first you have to learn how to lose 
and how to uh, learn from uh, your, fa your failures. If you only solve the problems that are easy for you, you won't really learn much. So yeah, that's very important to always solve the problems that are a bit harder of what you're currently capable of doing. For more from the ICPC World Finals DACA, follow us at news.icpc.global and on social media with our hashtag ICPCWFDACA. And we're back. Um, this is, once again, this is Arnav, one of the judges. Are, are you the first judge we've had on today? Uh, I believe so, yeah. I don't right. think, uh, I think a lot of the judges are in the room answering clarifications, looking at the scoreboard submissions. Right, yeah. right. You guys, you, we're, we're almost done with our job. Yeah. You guys, I, you know, even though you guys have been writing the problems, you still have a job through the entire contest. Yep, exactly. Yeah, we, it's, uh, it's pretty important to make sure there's uh, no issues with the submissions. Right, right. Yeah, do you have any, uh, yeah, so I, I guess I also have a, I have a few problems for you. Mm -hmm. um, did, did you guys have, did you have a particular problem problem? Uh, something that was, you know, tough to write or, you know, just to trouble, trouble Yeah, here. absolutely. So I've got the, I've got the set right here. Um, I'm looking, the, the one that immediately springs to mind is problem K, take on meme. This is one of our tougher problems. It's a, a kind of geometry problem. When we first, uh, when this problem was first proposed, the bounds were actually much larger, uh -huh. uh, but most of the solutions we tried still ran in time. And we had a pretty tough time, like, proving that uh, the time complexity uh, of various solutions for this problem. We ended up deciding, okay, let's make it a little simpler and cut all the bounds down so teams can feel more confident that their approaches are, are correct. Right, right, yeah. right. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it is pretty tough to, like, to, to be able to set problems so the bounds can actually be proven correctly. Yeah, you know. definitely. This is one, especially if you just like generate random memes, um, then you're <laughs> going to, I, I love the story for this, but if you generate random memes, most of your uh, solutions are going to run very quickly. Right, right. Yeah, but we are, you know, it's we are trying to test a lot of asymptotic complexity because mm -hmm. that's that's pretty interesting. Yeah, definitely. And so, uh, and so it's you know it's tough to uh, it's tough to make the bounds correct and uh, and actually provable. Yeah, we had uh, we also had uh, a couple of judges with a couple of different solutions to this, and mm -hmm. then um, they were able to actually uh, simplify their solutions the week of. So our difficulty estimate of this problem also varied quite a bit. At first, we thought it was going to be quite challenging. Then we actually thought it was going to be more of a medium problem. Right. But as the teams are proving today, we've kind of landed somewhere uh, somewhere, somewhere on the hard terrain. side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's definitely it's definitely one of the uh, yeah it's one of the harder problems. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, we are. Uh, yeah, I mean this this. Um, I'm sorry, I totally lost what I was thinking about. <laughs> Yeah, so th this problem has only one solve right now, right? Oh wow, yeah. Yeah, I I, I believe so, and uh, I believe maybe so maybe another submit or something. Yeah. And yeah, I, I was sorry. I, my thought was, yeah, estimating difficulty can be really tough. It's it's brutal. There were so many problems in this set. Also, just talking to the analysts and talking to other people as right. the contest is going on, we realized there were many problems which we thought were hard or easier, which we thought were easier or harder. Right. It's uh, very inexact science. Yeah, it's it's so tough because uh, the because you know your judge team can only be so big, especially mm -hmm. since you're trying to maintain secrecy. Yeah, definitely. And, and, you know, especially with something like difficulty, getting more opinions is always, is always really what you, what you mm -hmm. wish you had. Absolutely. But that said, if uh, anybody is out there on the stream watching and interested in uh, being a world finals judge, I definitely encourage you to apply. Uh, it's, it's tough work, but it's really, really rewarding. It's great to give back to the community and uh, help put on this, this contest. Right, right. Did you guys have any uh, goals or any ideas on like what what you wanted the scoreboard to look like? Ooh, um, there's kind of a, a standard uh, uh, trifecta right. that we try and hit. Um, right. Every problem gets solved. Right. No team solves all problems. Right. Uh, and what's the third one? Every team solves at least one problem. Right. right. And uh, that's that's usually our goal. And uh, everything else is uh, kind of secondary. You know, mm -hmm. it's nice to have a sloping gradient. It's nice to have uh, not too many like time ties right. uh, where or ties which are broken by time we like right. to have a, a nice clear pocket distribution right yeah exactly um, but uh, yeah we it's it's so it's so hard to predict we just kind of do our best and let right, the right. teams uh, prove their stuff every year I'm impressed right right yeah I mean uh, right here we have you know almost all teams all but like 10 teams have already solved all problems we still have another half hour in the contest so that could uh, that could even yep. get go up um, and there's submissions to every problem, so it's very There are possible. definitely submissions to every problem. Yeah. We'll have to see 
you know, we're not still we're still not sure about from D. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, yeah, we will we will have to we will have to hold our breath to see what MIT ends up doing. Yeah, they're that's so impressive. Ten before the freeze, is that right? Yeah, that's oh, right. That that I will say, I don't think a single judge predicted that. Right. Yeah. Stay tuned. Uh, we are going to show you a quick video. My wife is working, uh, my full family is working, and the, the, our university students, the juniors, all are expecting us to do well. The students from um, our university, of course, because they're also quite aspirational and would like to come here too. I have my wife watching this at home, also my parents, her parents, uh, my friends. They, they told me that they will go to the bar and they will drink each time we accept it. They will drink. I don't remember something. And each time we fail, they will drink vodka. So I think like maybe in last hour we just fail. <laughs> our competitors back in uh, our country are our, our biggest uh, fans. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Like, like they know what, when I'm gonna have lunch and I don't, like sometimes I ask my, my friends from Syria, like when I'm having lunch, guys, uh, they perfectly know, you know. Definitely, my parents will uh, will watch us from home and supporting us. So yeah, thank you for my parents. <laughs> for more from the ICPC World Finals DACA, follow us at news.icpc.global and on social media with our hashtag ICPCWFDACA. Sweet. Sweet. Um, yeah, so uh, for, you know, for those of you guys tuning in now, this is Arnav. He's a, he's a judge for this contest. Uh, and uh, yeah, we are, we are really nearing the end at mm -hmm. this point. Yeah, it's uh, pretty exciting. I, I love seeing the like flurry of, you know, black right. dish efforts, the, the, what's it called? Suspense is, right. is always great. One thing that's cool here, if you guys can see on the screen, is we can actually see we can actually see exactly what these teams are doing. So MIT is circled there, Utopia is a little bit in the background, and we can see like, you know, they're still working hard, right? Yeah. They probably haven't finished the set yet. Yeah. Yeah. I, I hope so. I've, I've heard at contests, you know, they'll uh, uh, submit stuff and then still look like they're working to throw other teams off. Right. Um, probably not in this case. This is such a grueling problem set. I'd yeah. be surprised. It is, it is really tough to finish. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, we were talking earlier that you didn't expect any team to hit solve uh, 10 problems Definitely before, the, not. before the freeze. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, problem E, uh, mm -hmm. I was looking at it and problem E looked like such a, such a tricky problem. It's, it's, uh, problem E is really interesting. It's one of those problems where, uh, reading it, uh, you can kind of understand the process, uh, figuring out how to solve it requires a lot of theory. Um, but the actual code to write, maybe mm -hmm. 10 lines. It's right. really, really short. Right. And, and perhaps MIT actually, they had three people, right? Yep. So maybe they actually had someone working on it like for a lot of the contest, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so maybe that's actually why, you know, we, my, maybe why we should be a little less surprised that yeah. they were actually able to solve E instead of from D, which e is, D is gonna take a lot of code to implement. That's a lot of code, yeah. Uh, e, e is also interesting, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but MIT specifically, they solved B, uh, which is also a decent amount of code, and then got E like five minutes later, is that right? Right, right. So that uh, lends credence to the theory that they kind of had the ideas written out on paper and just banged it out five minutes. Done. Right, right, right. Which is a, uh, it's it's a very unique thing about ICPC, right? Mm -hmm. You can't really do it in solo contests. Yeah. But this kind of thing is totally possible, and it's totally part of the strategy in uh, these team contests. Absolutely. You only have five hours. You only have five hours on the computer, but you have fifteen person hours, and dividing that right. intelligently is a huge part of the game. Right. Right. Yeah. We have a. We can take a quick look at the optimistic scoreboard right now. Optimistic. Ooh, I think I like this that. is optimistic. Yeah. Uh, no, maybe it is just the current standings. I think it's, it's pessimistic. Current. Okay. Yeah. Uh, this is kind of assuming that all submissions have failed, which, mm -hmm. you know, if you see MIT submitting six times, <laughs> like, I, I'm not that confident. Yeah. Right? Um, but, you know, we, we do see them still working, so mm -hmm. maybe they actually haven't solved it. And, uh, but yeah, there's, we're, we're definitely, we're definitely at, at the point where we don't know who's winning. It's definitely possible that uh, Peking University solved yep. D, just like MIT, and it's definitely possible that they managed to get D 
they just manage to eke out D. Yeah. And that would that would cinch them the win if MIT doesn't solve anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's uh, all the teams up there are super close. When I looked before the freeze, it was what ten nine and then eight eight eight. Right. So right. if you're on the cusp, you get one just after the freeze. That, right. That still puts you in contention. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Going going further down the scoreboard, we, mm -hmm. there are there are a good number of threes and twos. It's it's a pretty good looking scoreboard. Yeah, I'm I'm really happy with it. I was a bit uh, afraid at the beginning when I saw uh, mm -hmm. a huge column on problem H. Right. Every team was attempting that, and then it seemed to kind of like freeze for a little bit. Right. And I was really worried there was going to be uh, like we talked a little bit earlier about uh, distribution in how right. many problems each team solves, and right. I was really worried that. Uh, uh, we would um, uh, have a lot of teams stuck in that one bucket. But mm -hmm. luckily, they've diversified. And more importantly, they found the problems that work for them. Some right. teams moved on to problem A. Some teams moved on to problem J. Right. Uh, and different teams will find each problem easy. Right, right. And, mm -hmm. and understanding that is definitely a big part of this. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, it's good that it's, it's a really nice feature of a problem set that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there are different problems at maybe similar difficulty levels, but different teams, you know, will, different teams will solve them. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one, one thing I noticed was MIT's first accepted was problem C, which right. we as the judges had pegged as kind of a medium problem. Right. And uh, that's a problem where you need somebody with a good understanding of uh, mathematics. Right. So if your team is weak at math and you see that MIT gets it early, you rush into it, right. uh, that could be a bit of a trap. Right. Here we see a bit of a, a, bit of a leak yeah. on the screen. We saw that Seoul National University actually does have nine problems. Whoa. So they solved one. So they're definitely, they're definitely up there trying to, uh, trying to get into gold medal range. This is so exciting. And so we'll see, uh, we'll see if they manage to hold on and mm -hmm. how the other teams have managed to do. Yeah. Um, Let's see. Uh, which which ones do they have left? Is it uh, the I believe they had D, I, and K left, D, which is kind I of an interesting, K. K, interesting, interesting set. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I, so I was actually when it was uh, speaking of proposing when we proposed I that was intended to be one of the easier problems and it was proposed with uh, much lower <laughs> bounds. But one of the good things about working together with all of these judges is uh, they realize hey we can actually uh, solve this much more efficiently. Let's uh, let's give the teams a challenge. Right, right. Yeah. All right, we have a quick quick wrap up video for you. Stay tuned. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five. Today, the ICPC finalists here in Dhaka took their seats on the contest floor. After two grueling hours, contestants warmed up on problems similar to the ones they saw in their qualifying contests to get here. This practice round gave contestants a good idea of how the contest system will work. After the dress rehearsal, ICPC was pleased to honor prize-winning coaches. Tonight, contestants will want to rest up for the big day tomorrow here in Dhaka. For more from the ICPC World Finals DACA, follow us at news.icpc.global and on social media with our hashtag ICPCWFDACA. All right, welcome back, everybody. Uh, during my quick little break there, I got a chance to talk to Mike, mm -hmm. the owner and creator of Code Forces. Right. And he had something to say about Problem H. It turns out, uh, Problem H, he, the last team he coached was Saratov State University, and he was watching them work on Problem H, uh, and he was hoping they could get it a little faster than they did. Mm -hmm. He says Problem H is actually a duplicate of one of a uh, one of the Div 3 problems that oh. he's seen recently. Oh, so that, that definitely would affect would affect the standings. I mean, it is, it, it is, it, it, the, 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 it has this many solves not just because it's, uh, not just because uh, it, it may have occurred recently. It actually is a pretty, a pretty simple problem. And one thing about simple problems is there are only so many simple ideas, right? At a certain point, yeah, the idea either gets difficult and unique, or uh, it's something that's been used before. Right. So even even beside it being uh, a problem that that may have been seen before by some teams, right? It's also a problem that's uh, that's a div three. Yeah, and so I mean it's, it's quite it's, doable. It's a good it's a good exercise, and uh, you know hopefully hopefully teams. Uh, Hopefully, teams enjoyed the problem. And uh, yeah, I guess one of the one of the great parts about qualifying for World Finals right. is there are all sorts of fantastic people you get to meet. Mm -hmm. Hanging out with the, the creative Code Forces is, is something that right. not many people get to do. And right. any, anyone who qualifies for World Finals might just see him walking walking through the hall, get to say hi, shake his hand. Right, right. Yeah, there are so many people involved in competitive programming here because I mean it is the biggest. Uh, 
like so many people who do competitive programming, like this was the culmination of uh, of their career, or you know, this is like the biggest event of the year. This is the thing that you you train for all college, and right. then you get to show how good you are right here. Right. And you get to see whether it's better than everyone else in the scoreboard reveal, which will happen in uh, just a just a little bit here. Right. Right. Um, so we have nine minutes remaining in right. the contest, and uh, MIT has submitted on D six times. Am I six times? Six times. But so one far. interesting thing is, I, I don't think they've submitted any times in the last like half hour or something, or like last twenty minutes. I haven't seen any of them, and so maybe they've decided that they uh, understand what's wrong and they're trying to work on it, or maybe they they actually finished it, but. We, you know, we, we really won't, we really will only be able to guess. Uh, we can see that Peking University is still submitting problem D. They're hard at work, um, which might give MIT fans at home a little bit of a, a little bit of a, a little bit of relief uh, because, you know, MIT is in a position where any other team needs to solve two problems in order to win. And if Peking uh, is still only has one, then, then maybe they actually have it cinched. Then, then maybe MIT has it cinched. Yeah, we also have uh, some other interesting teams on the scoreboard here. Purdue University uh -huh. is the home university of Monagon, who right. many people may know from his contribution on Code Forces. He's submitted right. very, many very funny blogs. Uh, also, he's got Caroni and Richard on his team. Right. This is their second World Finals that's happening after they've graduated. I know Monagon now works for Apple. Right. And uh, he is, uh, many people don't know this, but he's incredible at yo-yos which mm -hmm. are in the shape of a circle. Obviously, the, of the same thing as the monogon. He, he did a competition. There's, there's, a, there's, there's a video there's of him online. In the, in the there, there's one, one string. In the one string, yeah. 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 And uh, it's attached to a circle at one yeah. point. Yeah, at one uh, point. They also have some plushies that they brought. They brought one of them to last World Finals. In this World Finals, they have one per teammate. And this is kind of their team mascot that will be cheering them on. Yeah. Uh, we also have Yale University. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see how they're doing. They got two problems, which is which is pretty good. This is also Yale's first time at World Finals, and it's always good to see some new teams here. Mm -hmm. uh, some some fresh blood here is is always good. Right. Keep things alive and, and keep seeing new teams. It's also great to see University of Warsaw for, for more times than any other contest uh, than any other university. But uh, there you go. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The Indian Institute of Tech Vera Nasai. Uh, they are losing one of their teammates for the upcoming World Finals. Oh, one no. thing we haven't talked much about yeah. is that over uh, this year and next year, right. many teams are, are competing in both, many people are competing in both, uh, and they have almost the same team for both of them, right. except one team member is going to be in this year's World Finals, but, but not, not next in year. Next year. Yeah. 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 We got lots of other fun facts from other teams, uh, but I think we should take a look at all of these submits that are getting thrown in here. Yeah, I mean, there's a healthy mix of problems here. There's problem G, problem B, H, L, C, uh, F. Uh, these are all, you know, they're all they're all still floating around. Um, I think I think earlier some of my discussion of problem F got a little swallowed up by some by some stream problems. Um, but uh, just a quick recap, um, you you know, it's it's a pretty tricky problem. Um, Teams maybe should be a little circumspect when approaching it because it's 3D geometry. It's about uh, it's about taking a plane, uh, taking an airplane, and looking down at the ground, which is also a plane, and looking at polygons in the ground and making sure that you're able to see the entire range. And so there's a lot of implementation there and possibly some binary search uh, that goes into uh, that goes into working on this problem. We've also got the Indian Institute of Technology, Bombay. They have four problems correct before the freeze. They also have four tries on problem B uh, and one more try on problem L. They had three before the freeze. They got one more on problem L. Right. Uh, IIT Bombay has the one you want, who's somewhat well known on Code Forces, I'd say. Right. And uh, this is his third World Finals. Minutes. Last year, he competed online. Five minutes. Uh, uh, that's why he's still eligible. Yep. And within these three World Finals, right. they've had three completely different teams, so six teammates. Wow. This year, his team is, uh, or yeah, sorry, one of his his third teammates. He placed third in a U12 chess championship, and U12. he got well. Yeah, yeah. And recently. Got, uh, well, when he was uh, twelve. When he was twelve. Okay, okay. <laughs> and, I was wondering if his one of his teammates is twelve because that's happened. That's maybe happened before. You my had a my very teammate, young teammate was like fourteen. Right. Uh, and uh, and it it happens that there are just these. These amazing young kids, prodigies, prodigies yeah. that are able to compete at this stage. This teammate got his I am Norm at 12 years old. Wow. So very impressive, very impressive. Also a prodigy in its own right. Yeah. 
And then uh, we got one more, one more fun fact at the moment here. Uh, you mayor de San Simon. Uh, I may have pronounced that uh, incorrectly, but all three of their teammates graduated from the same high school. That's something you don't see every day. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty. Tr it's pretty tough. Uh, it's pretty un uncommon. For... Maybe if you have like a really big high school in the area, maybe it's. Yeah, maybe it's just the. But... Uh, you know, it's it uh, leads to a university. It's close to the university. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Um, but that is that is pretty impressive. Here we see MIT with a flurry of submits on problem D, um, and we they, they seem to be standing up. Uh, it's not clear whether they got they're standing up because they got it or they're standing up because they didn't get it. They're giving up uh, or because they're giving up. But they are still working on this file, which I believe is D.cpp. So maybe they haven't gotten it. Um, there's another submit coming in, uh, and so. Uh, what, one interesting thing is that I believe if they solve the problem, they are still permitted to submit. And these submissions still show up on the scoreboard. I could be wrong. Interesting. So now here's a question. Do they get penalty points for them? You don't get penalty because your penalty stops once you get your first correct submit. Ah, so that's a pretty legitimate strategy. You might you might want to do it in order to convince right. people that you don't have it. Maybe they only go for one more problem or something. Right, right. And so you, you maybe, maybe you should keep... Keep, uh, yeah, keep submitting. Um, yeah, I think someone in chat is pointing out that MIT used doubles or floating point numbers instead of integers. Problem D definitely, problem D requires exact determinations of whether three points are collinear. And so if you use doubles, it is possible to do it correctly, um, but it can be very tricky. There can be a lot of like, you have to set your epsilons very carefully to make sure that you catch all the cases. All right, looks like we have just over two minutes left in contest. For the last two minutes, Andrew, I'm going to leave you alone. And then afterwards, we're going to see if we can get some interviews with some of the contestants on the floor. Right. So we'll, we'll see if we can take a look at that. But Andrew, I'll yeah. let you commentate the end, and you can give people some guesses on whether you think MIT solves that or not. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, we are back. Uh, David is going to uh, tre check out if uh, see if he can get any teams uh, talk to any teams right after the contest, and we can maybe hear their uh, hear their experiences. Right now, we're still looking at MIT. They're still furiously submitting problem D. I mean, at this point in the contest, it really uh, it, it really doesn't make sense to be worried about penalty. If you get the problem, it's worth so much more than any possible penalty that you could have. And so one MIT minute, really just needs to make sure reading. if they solve this problem, then they will probably win, and they need, just need to make sure that it happens. Um, so they're, they're continuously submitting. You know, uh, maybe some of these submits don't make that much sense. Um, but, uh, you know, at least they're trying their best. Um, over further down the scoreboard, we see uh, you know, Peking University does not seem to be continuously submitting, but they might have solved one or more of the problems. Um, and then there is, uh, they have, they had nine problems before the freeze, and they've submitted to two, one of which is E, and which we've seen doesn't take many tries to, to, to pass. So it's definitely possible that Peking University has 10 problems. I think it's a little unlikely that they have 11, um, but and if they have 11, I actually think that they might have won. 10, uh, they might have won the contest. So there's definitely eight, some chance seven, there. Six, um, further down the scoreboard, there's University of Tokyo. Four, um, three, two, they have, uh, they have, they have eight before the freeze and two after the freeze. And so they are definitely still in contention, maybe not for beating MIT, but at least to get, to, to make sure they secure their gold medal. Um, problem I we saw had a lot of solves and problem K might have a couple solves, so we'll see about that. Um, uh, going further down, there's a few more teams with eight problems. There's University of Warsaw, Seoul National University, uh, and the Higher School of Economics. Um, Seoul is the only one out of these that has two submissions. Uh, and so uh, I think we're really looking at maybe nine problems in the gold medal cutoff. Three. Um, 
going further for the down, next there's hour and uh, a half, and there's then opening uh, another ceremony doors six different in hall uh, teams one. with seven problems. And so we're, so we're guaranteed that the bronze medal cutoff is at three. least seven. Jeff? Um, Congratulations. So, yeah, we'll, we'll that was see loud. What this ends up Sorry about like. that. I believe Congratulations the is to now all over. of you for the ICPC um, World Finals in Dhaka. A few announcements that you will need to pay attention to. If you are departing right before 3.20 a.m., I'm sorry, but I need the following announcement for you. If you did not bring your luggage with you this morning, there will be a shuttle behind Hall 2 that will take you back to your hotel. You need to go to that shuttle immediately after the closing ceremony. So let me repeat that. If you have a flight departing before 3.20 a.m. and you didn't bring your luggage with you, you will need to board the bus behind Hall 2 immediately after the closing ceremony. Hey guys, you need to pay attention. Everybody eyes up here for just a second. We wanna make sure that you get safely back. If you did bring your luggage, you can wait in Hall 3 until your airport shuttle departure time. So if you did bring your luggage, you'll depart directly from here and you'll wait after eating in Hall 3 until your airport shuttle departure time. For everybody else that's not flying out before 3.20 in the morning, buses will leave the ICCB after dinner behind Hall 2 to take you back to your hotel. Make sure that you confirm your airport shuttle time with the host help desk at your hotel. If anybody has any questions about departure time, please come to the ICPC office in Hall 3 between 4 and 5.30 for clarification. So I hope everybody enjoys their snack break we're going to begin the closing ceremony in Hall 1. You need to arrive in Hall 1 between 5.30 and 5.45. There are snacks that I personally made for all of you in Hall 3 right now, unless you don't like them, and then Melissa made them. Congratulations, everybody. Cool, everyone. So uh, I will, you know, w the the contest is now over. Uh, we can see all the teams. They are, you know, they're starting to get up and walk around. Um, teams, scoreboard. you may keep your mouse pads if you want. You can take them home as a souvenir. You may not keep your computer or monitor. Looks like some teams are trying to uh, trying to trying to take some equipment. Um, the final results will come out at the closing ceremony, which will be on this stream. Uh, and that will be coming up pretty soon. I think there's a little bit of time before. Uh, there's a little bit of time before then. Um, yeah, we are still not entirely sure what, uh, what the scoreboard looks like. A as people are pointing out, MIT has 19 tries on D. And 19 tries to correct or 19 tries to incorrect? Not really sure. And uh, we'll have to see. Uh, we'll have to see how that goes. Um, it's definitely with this kind of thing. There's definitely uh, there is there's definitely a lot of possibilities. I've seen 
Usually, it means that you haven't solved Remember, it. Remember, if there you dropped anything off right before past. coming in here, it's in the ICPC office in Hall 3. You need to pick it up now, right? So make sure, don't forget, if you, if you, if you check something in, go pick it up in the next half hour in the ICPC office. There has been uh, so, some people are saying that it, you know if it's 19 tries then it's incorrect and that's usually the case but there actually have been times where uh, you know it's been 19 tries or more uh, and and actually you know they got it right on the very last try right before the contest it's it's really clutch and it's really it's really uh, tough to see but uh, it, it might happen it looks like. It looks like some people are saying in the telecast that it's been leaked that MIT solved only 11 problems. Um, we'll have to see about that. And uh, um, well, you know, D was definitely a tough problem, but 11 problems is definitely would definitely be enough to win, I think. Yeah. Um, it also depends. I think I've seen in some past years. I, I don't know if it's still the case, but in some past years, you were allowed to keep submitting after you got AC. Uh, and and then MIT might actually just be spam submitting, but I, I don't think that's the case here. Uh, it's kind of like at the end of the contest, if you have MIT had nearly correct code, and so uh, it totally made sense for them to continue trying to like change small things and try and fix just a small bug. So uh, made sense for them, but uh, uh, but it, it's very tough to uh, it, you know it, it it doesn't have a large chance of working out, but at the same time. Uh, when it when it doesn't work out, you know, it's not like you it's not like you uh, lost anything. Um, yeah, I guess someone asked who's the commentator. I'm Andrew uh, Andrew He or Eknerwala on Code Forces. Uh, I was a past ICPC contestant for MIT recently, so I'm very excited if this is finally the time that uh, MIT wins. Uh, and we are, uh, you know, uh, we are. Pretty. Uh, it would be. It would be pretty amazing for it to finally happen. Um. So, uh, uh, I am. I. I am fine. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Nick. Um, but yeah, we are just. We are just seeing if. Uh, we're, we're right now. We're kind of just waiting to see if David can actually grab an interview with any of these teams. We have some remote cameras that we can deploy, uh, and uh, we're we're gonna see if uh, we can do that and maybe actually get some live you know live feedback about how how they how some of these teams felt the contest went um whether they're relieved whether they're happy or you know whether how, how well they think they placed um yeah there there's definitely a lot of um there's there's i, I remember doing after the contest there's definitely a lot of mingling i think some of the teams are really tight-lipped about how many problems they solved they, you know, they really want it to be a surprise until the reveal. And other teams are, you know, they're just pretty okay with uh, kind of, kind of uh, just telling you. And uh, they also want to know your scores. So some teams are definitely a little more tight-lipped, and some are a little more loose. So it's not, we don't really know what the teams know, um, but some of them might also know that uh, MIT. Uh, everyone for sure knows that MIT is, if not the best, if not the top team here, they are. They lost by a hair. Um, the closing ceremony should begin in a couple hours. Uh, there is a schedule, uh, in, it's linked in a, a lot of places. Uh, it's linked on like worldfinals.icpc.global. Uh, and you can take a look at that and, uh, uh, and hopefully the closing ceremony, I think it'll start pretty much on time. And so be there, uh, to see the score reveal. I think we're getting some audio from the floor. So we can see, yeah, we can hear the team in the way. Okay, well, it sounds like there, yeah, it sounds like we won't be able to get any live stream because uh, 
Wi-Fi, the the wireless, the cameras all stream over Wi-Fi. Um, the 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 remote, the the portable cameras all stream over Wi-Fi, and so once everyone turns their phone on, it's pretty rough. So I think we might just, I might just leave you guys here. Um, we will uh, we will be back for the opening ceremony. Uh, stick around, don't miss out, and uh, congrats to all the teams that competed. See you guys.
Erichto here, talking about problem K, take on mean. We are given a lot of points in leaves of a tree, and this tree describes a tournament between memes. In every leaf, we are given coordinates, like say, 3, minus 4. And in every node that has multiple children, we have some competition between our children. And one of those points we will take with a plus, let's say uh, this one. And the remaining ones will be taken with a minus. And now we need to take the sum of them with exactly those pluses or minuses. For example, here, 3 minus 2 and 1 will be 0. And minus 4 minus 2 and 1 will be minus 7. We do that in every node. And we will eventually get node in the root of this tree. We want to maximize its distance from 0, 0. The, to the output, we print the square of that because square is integer. Constraints are on the right. Number of nodes, 10,000. Height of the tree is 10, that's very unusual. Coordinates of points are integers and up to 1,000. Number of children of every node is up to 100, also a very unusual co uh, constraint. Now, if not for that tree, and instead we just get some points and we want to maximize the sum of them and their final distance from 0, 0, it's a very standard problem, assuming that we can take any subset and sum it up. The solution to that is that um, if there is some direction where we know that the sum of chosen subsets of points will be, then it's optimal to take half plane of everything. So let's say everything belonging to this half plane, you, can, you should take to your subset and it will maximize this distance. The sum of those points will be somewhere here in top right. You don't know which half plane is optimal. Because of that, you should use two pointers and just consider every half plane. Right now, points J, A, and so on belong to your subset. When you rotate your half plane by angle, J will eventually drop, E will be added to it, and like that you maintain the subset. Uh, in take on meme, we have something different. It's a tree, but in every node, we will have some decisions about which one of the nodes, uh, which are one of children we want to take with a plus versus the other ones with minus. So it's almost like a sum of them multiplied by minus one, and one single note is taken differently. How can we approach that? Solution number one is to use Minkowski sum, but first we should notice the following. If Imagine bottom-up DP. If your child tells you what are possible points that it will provide after we decide uh, in its subtree what to do, which child each time to take with a plus, with, uh, the remaining ones with minus, then each child will give you some set of points, 
And a very obs important observation is that only convex hull of those points is important, is relevant. We can drop everything inside of the convex hull. Why is that? Because at the end, every point or every subtree providing you some point will be taken in the final sum with plus or minus. So always, if there is some point and there is some direction that is from zero, zero direction to the final sum point, the solution, we want to maximize in that direction and always one of points in the convex hull is better for that. Uh, then, when you have, when you ignore the interior of every convex hull, every child in this bottom of the P will give you a convex hull. Let's erase the interior indeed. And now you need to sum up multiple convex hulls. In what way do you sum them up? You will, from each of them, choose one of points, say this one, this one, and this one. One of them you will take with a plus, the other ones with minus, and the sum of coordinates x and y will be your new possible point. You want to again find a convex hull of this sum. If it was just summing up of convex hull, we would use Minkowski sum. You can read about it in cpalgorithm.com. This is even uh, a picture from that website. Uh, in geometric category, there is Minkowski sum uh, topic with a nice tutorial. We will not discuss it now. But one of convex holes needs to be taken with minus one. Now, possibly it can be done faster, but because of low constraint for k, let's remember k is up to 100, we can iterate which child will be taken with different sign. So let's say this one, the blue one, we will do with plus one, everything else with minus one. This multiplies time complexity by k. But now if you, let's say, multiply this single special polygon by minus one, we can do Minkowski sum. The time complexity of such a solution is O of, and I will look at my notes, that's n times h, times h uh, comes from the fact that you merge in subtrees, and because of that, every point will exist on every node in path to the root. So sum of sizes of subtrees is n times h. Now, you multiply that by k, you iterate which child is the special plus one, and you multiply it by some logarithm. Now, this logarithm, it depends on your exact implementation. If you really do everything naively, so in Minkowski sum, in the final convex hull, you sort all the points from left to right to find convex hull from scratch. Um, I believe it will be n times h or, or something very similar. You can do it smarter because if you have a lot of convex hulls, uh, they are already sorted. So we can get something smaller here, but it doesn't matter. No matter what logarithm you will have here, that's accepted solution. Of course, more challenging, it would be to get rid of this times k, which is maybe possible. Anyway, there is a second, uh, I think, nicer solution, where we do things greedily and we don't even maintain any convex holes. A uh, common way of at least providing a proof of correctness of this well-known solution of subset of points is to say, if we are given by a well-known, by a magical fairy, if we are given direction towards the solution, then we know what subset of points we should take, let's say those, uh, they belong to some half plane. And now, if we have this direction, then actually we also can simulate that for the whole tree. If we're given this tree, and we know, yeah, we maximize in that direction, for every subtree, we know that at the end, it will be taken with plus or minus in this final direction. So we only want to know two possible points. Let's say point zero minus seven might be extreme, the furthest within that direction that is given to us magically. And also there is a point, say, minus one comma eight, and that is in the opposite direction furthest, according to that direction. So if we are provided direction magically, then we will say what to do. We will know what to do in our subtree. Always it will be, oh yeah, in this subtree, the two extreme points are A and B, the, the sum of points from the subtree. And then when we merge a lot of subtrees, again, it will be easy. It's like a one-dimensional problem for us. We will use doubles there, possibly for distances. Well, it's a bad idea, so better use integers. But uh, points you can compare by squares of distances. Uh, okay, but we don't know direction. So we need to observe that uh, we need to observe that there is some final set of points that are possible for us to achieve, and we are interested in its convex hull. And if we ask about some direction, we will be we will find this 
possible point, the answer, furthest in that direction. If we also ask the opposite direction, we will find some furthest point. And now, very important trick, we can imagine a segment going through those two points and ask perpendicularly to this direction. This way we will find other points belonging to convex hull. So already knowing some points in the convex hull, so already know, you know those four points belong to the convex hull, always you can take two consecutive points, ask, per to, to ask using a direction perpendicular to that, and you will find another point. The time complexity of that is O of size of the convex hull, for now I will say convex hull, multiplied by uh, just the tree size, n. It's not even n times h because you don't maintain convex holes. And this is simple, greedy, very short code. Uh, now, what can be the convex hole size? Well, theoretically, it can be n, you might say, because that's the number of points, but coordinates are very limited. And you can say, well, x, let's say x is limit for coordinates, that's like 1000, is limit for convex hole size. There is even a lemma that uh, you can prove that x to the power 2 over 3 is limit for size of convex hole, multiplied by n, size of the tree, is this the time complexity of this second nicer solution. I will again summarize it. First ask is, let's say, two opposite directions. You will find two possible answers, two possible final points that you will achieve, and keep maintaining this convex hole that you can reach. For every two consecutive points, ask in direction perpendicular to them, and if you find a new point different than those two, uh, then uh, you add that to a convex hole and you recursively ask again for the two connections. If you are careful, you will get this time complexity. If not, maybe you will have here n or x, but x should still be fine. For more from the ICPC World Finals DACA, follow us at news.icpc.global and on social media with our hashtag ICPC. Might be a bit hard to hear. Are we, we're good? All right, where is MIT? And your eyes, you need to pay attention. Everybody eyes up here for just a second. We want to make sure that you get safely back. Where's MIT, do you know? Yeah, MIT. All right, one sec. All right, MIT, congratulations on your performance today. None of us know whether you have solved set or not, but we did see you had quite a few submits at the end of contest. Were you aware that you're allowed to submit after getting your last problem right? Yeah, yeah, yeah we know that. We know that. And if you did hypothetically do that, do you think that would be a good strategy for you? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Why not? You want to confuse the other teams and make the scoreboard reveal yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah, of because course. Of course. Yeah. Take them into thinking that like, we actually didn't solve it and yeah. we were trying so hard to solve it. All right. Well, we'll see in the scoreboard reveal. Do you guys know how many teams in the past World Finals history have solved set? I, I don't know. I don't actually know, no. I think Taurus did once, but other than Taurus second year, I think that's, I think that's the only time. So, if this is something that you guys pulled off, that would be incredible. Either way, the fact that you were able to get 10 problems so fast uh, certainly put you in the lead with penalty points. So we'll see if, if anyone else was able to beat you.
Uh, and it'll be a very exciting scoreboard reveal. All right. All right. We'll see you there. The names are right here. Do you guys want to do a quick interview for ICPC Live? All right. All right, we ready? All right, good morning, Peking University. Uh, you guys had, had a bit of a rough start, but you were climbing the scoreboard the entire time. Were you worried about, about catching up to people, or were you pretty comfortable in your strategy to figure out how to solve the problems and then solve all of them? Really, really, really bad. And I come, I and I talk, communicate with my teammates, and I told them that we can calm down and we can still get a great, great, great results. And finally, I think that, I think that in the third and the fourth hours, our, that we did very good, so that we can try to finally we can solve ten problems. All right. Well, we'll we'll see how you did in the scoreboard reveal, but you had a very impressive climb. Uh, up the standings. Were there any problems that you guys really enjoyed and you thought were particularly well written? Uh, maybe problem E. Uh, finally, actually, I, I, I know how to solve it in the second hour, maybe. Uh, but, but. But we, but I, but I, uh, uh, I think it's interesting and and it helps us to get ten problem in the end. Well, congratulations, you guys did very well, and I'm looking forward to the scoreboard reveal where we can see exactly how well you did. Thanks, thank you. Yeah, thanks so much. All right, see you guys later. Let's find the next one. So maybe, maybe. Waterloo? Waterloo, yeah, yeah. Uh, all right. We're ready? All right. Can we do a quick interview? Sure. All right. Good morning, University of Waterloo. What did you guys think of the contest and, and your performance today? Pretty good. Pretty good performance. Yeah, we're happy. Were there any problems you thought were particularly well written or you enjoyed solving? No, not really. It was just a, a struggle the whole time. All right, well, we'll see how you did in the scoreboard reveal. Uh, what do you think was the most most difficult challenge uh, during the problem set that you faced today? I think it's problem. What was the hardest problem? I think it's problem D. B? D. D? Yeah. No, D has geometry. Yeah. Yeah, the geometry problems, yeah. Yeah, we had, we had D. There was also kind of K was a little bit geometry. What did you think about that? No, but K looked more like K had a tree as well in it, so it looked more familiar. All right, okay, all right. Uh, what did you think about problem H? There were some rumors that it had been used in a Div 3 set a while ago. It was the one with opening and closing parentheses, and you had to make it a, a balanced sequence. Oh, I think I've seen this problem like 
10 times before already, yeah. It's a very standard. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, thank you so much. Uh, good luck, and we'll see how you did in the scoreboard reveal. All right. Maybe high school economics? I don't know. Can we do a quick interview with you guys for ICPC Live? Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. is that all right? All right, congratulations on your performance today, first of all. You guys did a great job. Uh, were there any problems you particularly enjoyed solving, or, or you wanna you wanna shout out to the authors, say they were really good? Oh well, for me, yeah, I I I spend almost time in problem I, and yeah, it was very sad that it takes time for me to solve it. But yeah, I think the problem statement is very. Oh, interesting, and yeah, it makes me feel that yeah, I want to solve it. Which which problem was problem I again? Can I have a quick reminder? Problem I. Yeah, what was it about? Oh, the problem about spider. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, the spider, and he has to get to a particular exit point. Yeah, yeah, from center outward, and yeah. Are you familiar with the the game where you have like several vertical lines and you draw horizontal lines to kind of pick oh, a random number? Of course, it is called in Japan Amidakuji. Amida, yeah. Andrew, he was talking about that. He said it was kind of it was probably inspired by that sort of way of going about things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the problem is circular, so it makes things a little complicated. Yeah, I think non circular version is enough to solve it. So. Uh, oh, it makes me. Oh, it's complicated. <laughs> do you think? Do you think the fact that you were familiar with it helped at all in solving the problem? A little, but not so much. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks so much for the interview. Congratulations on your, on your performance, and we'll see you at the scoreboard reveal coming up in uh, in a bit. Thank you very much. All right. to interview some team that is not on the top? Yeah, let's interview a team where it's their first time here. Okay. Maybe Yale? What about Yale? Yale? Do, yeah. Do team Yale? Or we can do DACA. What? We do DACA. Oh, yeah, let's sorry. do DACA. Yeah. Let's do DACA, yeah. Yeah, DACA, all right. We didn't see you earlier. Would you guys want to do a quick interview uh, with ICPC Live? Yeah. 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 Well, that's fine, that's fine. Ha, ha, all right, all right. Ready? Well, congratulations on competing in World Finals, you guys. What did you think of the contest today? Well, uh, I think the problem set was interesting, but uh, <clears throat> the codes were a bit tricky, so uh, we got stuck in a few uh, problem submissions, and uh, the, uh, we could have done better, I guess, uh, if we implemented uh, and got AC correctly, but yeah, I, we enjoyed the contest. What did you think of problem H, the one with opening and closing parentheses? Did you, did you put much effort into that one? Uh, I think we, uh, um, uh, that solved actually uh, the other team made, but uh, uh, we knew the main idea before. We solved it a few days ago. So uh, we knew how to solve it, and uh, I think we did it pretty well soon. Of all the problems that you read in this contest, which one are you, which one do you think is like the most interesting? Which one's your favorite? Uh, well, I, I personally um, uh, enjoyed uh, solving problem C the most because uh, I very much struggled getting a C in it. Uh, I uh, uh, I got the main idea very quickly, but uh, uh, we had to resolve the overflowing issue, and it took a lot of effort, too. Thank you, thank you. We know you guys weren't the host university. That was Asia Pacific University. But as a team from DACA, what did you think about having a university in your home country, hometown? Uh, well, I think this would be a uh, great milestone for, uh, for this uh, country. So uh, we're really excited uh, to see uh, uh, the younger guys motivated by this event. 
Well, thank you so much for hosting, and uh, it's been a pleasure getting to talk to, to people around here and probably your friends as well. Thank you. Do you guys want an interview or no? An interview? Yeah. yeah. What do you got? Uh, yeah. Sure. yeah. So what do you got? All right, all right. Welcome. We got UCF here. We had Arup, their coach, or one of their coaches, uh, earlier earlier today over here. Uh, and now we got to talk to the team as well. What did you guys think of the problem set today? And of all the problems you worked on, which one do you think was, was your favorite, most well-written? Yeah. Um, well, most well-written. I don't know. There were a whole ton of good problems. Um, I have like a, a, a like I don't know. I'm probably partial to F. I thought that was a cool problem, cool geometry problem. Um, G, also good, good uh, solid problem. We were close on the end. I thought it was well written as well. Um, I we were thinking about for like a pretty solid amount of time and got pretty close. Uh, didn't make it all the way, but also was well. Yeah, the spider web problem. I thought was like really yeah yeah really like cool mechanic moving around the uh, lines. Interesting to analyze that. So you might not know, there's actually a game in Asia similar to that thing, except instead of being circular, it's just a bunch of vertical lines. Oh, yeah. But that's a thing that a lot of teams, in particular from like East Asia, have seen before. Yeah, like the snake ladder problem or something like that. Yeah, I've seen that. I think was it was it the Banff World Finals that we ran previously that was that had that problem on it? I think it was. I think it was like the 2008. It was Banff 2008? Uh, yeah, World Finals had a similar problem about the ladder, and we were anal that's a. Uh, it ended up you could like look at the number of inversions, but we were so we started with that approach, having recognized that like previous problem. But it turns out it doesn't quite work the same on a circular, uh, like circular setup. So we had to switch our approach. So we know you guys don't have phones here, so you haven't seen. Yeah. But on Discord, there have been lots of pictures of people from UCF doing watch parties. Sure. Is there anything you want to say to the people back at home who are seeing this live? Oh man, um, practice PTL respect. PTL respect. <laughs> PTL respect. All right, PTL respect. There you have it. This is University of Central Florida, the university I went to, uh, university that our Roop coaches. And we got Coach Glenn over here, too. You want to say hi to everyone, Glenn? Hi, everyone. All right. Thank you all very much. We will see how they did in the scoreboard reveal. Yeah, okay. Take care, man. Do we do one more? We can try. Yeah. So... I don't know. <laughs> well, I will be able to catch some Russian team. So, well, let's just. Suri? Maybe. Sure. Wait, who? Suri. Hey, are you interested in to in interview with ICPCY? Uh, I'm not sure. I did. I did an interview like uh, for Huawei, and I'm not really sure if it's really uh, for the ICPC. Yeah. Uh, I, think I think that's. It's fine. Yeah, you can do both if you want. Okay. Is that alright? Yeah, I'm feeling pretty good. Like, our, uh, we have we have the lot of uh, big difficulty in the first uh, one hour or two hour, but when we look at the scoreboard, I f we find that everyone uh, was having difficulty with the problem, so we are not that bad. So and we just trying to be try to be confident, and we managed to do to solve all the problems. We we opened in the last last uh, like uh, 20 minutes or something, and end up with nine problems. So we are really happy today. It's kind of like yeah, the, today is our day. So. Yeah, it's really. I'm really feeling good. So, very nice. It should make for a, a very exciting scoreboard reveal of the problems you were working on. What one was your favorite, and uh, why do you think so? Uh, sorry. What was your favorite problem? What problem do you think was most interesting? Uh, uh, I think problem A is pretty interesting. Like uh, when I first read it, I read I read it at at like uh, first ten minutes, and but I I cannot uh, like uh, find out a solution. But I like I I try to figure out the, the properties of the problem. I found there's a really really nice solution and really nice easy to code. So and uh, I solved it with uh, one attempt, I guess. And yeah, it's a really good problem. Like. Yeah, that's all I want to say. Yeah. All right, well, thank you so much. We wish you good luck on the scoreboard reveal. Yeah, yeah. And I uh, hope your team did well. Yeah. Thank you. Have a nice day. Yeah, you too. Bye. One more Uh, Yeah, yeah. Hello. Are uh, you interested in the interview for ICPC Live? Okay. Yeah? All right. Um, well, okay, in this room, but we probably need to... And then, then we'll leave. Outside. All right, all right. I can interview him, like, as your captain. 
Sure, all right, all right. Last, uh, last real quick interview here. What university are you from and what did you think of the contest today? Uh, I'm from KTH, uh, Royal Institute of Technology in Sweden. Uh, I really enjoyed the contest. There were a lot of nice problems. Yeah. So you said KTH, right? Yeah. That's the, the creators of Cactyl, probably the, the biggest help to everyone's hack pack here. Yes, exactly. Uh, it was very helpful yesterday in the practice session. Um, one of the problems was actually in Cactyl immediately. So it was really nice. That's awesome. Yeah, let's see. Was it the, uh, the pollution solution, circle triangle intersection? Yes, exactly. We have polygon and uh, circle intersection in Cactyl. Awesome. Yeah, it's a classic. I know after that came out, that was added to everyone's book code, everyone's hack pack. Uh, of the problems you solved today, were there any that you were able to use your hack pack for to help you solve? And not the ones that I sold, but I think some that my teammates sold. I think they used like lowest common ancestor from Cactyl and stuff like that. And uh, do you know what, what piece of code they used? Yeah, I think they used lowest common ancestor. LCA, all right, awesome, awesome. Well, thank you very much. We wish your team a great scoreboard reveal, uh, and we hope you, you did well. And I'm loving the balloons here on the backpack. Thank you so much. All right, goodbye. Thank you all. We have to leave now, so we are exiting the building. That's all. Back to you.
is working, uh, my full family is working, and the, the, our university students, the juniors, all are expecting us to do well. <laughs> the students from um, our university, of course, because they're also quite aspirational and would like to come here too. I have my wife watching this at home, also my parents, if your parents, uh, my friends, they, they told me that they will go to the bar and they will drink each time we are accepted, they will drink, I don't remember something, and each time we fail, they will drink vodka. So I think like maybe in last hour we just fail. <laughs> our competitor back in uh, our country are our, our biggest uh, fans. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Like, like they know what, when I'm gonna have lunch and I don't, like sometimes I ask my, my friends from Syria, like when I'm having lunch, guys, uh, they perfectly know, you know? Definitely my parents will, uh, will watch us from home and supporting us. So, yeah, thank you for my parents. For more from the ICPC World Finals DACA, follow us at news.icpc.global and on social media with our hashtag ICPCWFDACA. more from the ICPC World Finals DACA, follow us at news.icpc.global and on social media with our hashtag ICPCWFDACA.
Welcome to the ICPC World Finals Taka Closing Ceremony. Congratulations to the teams and coaches for your hard work. Please silence your mobile devices at this time. And now, dear guests, please welcome on the stage World Finals Taka Director Professor Dr. Kamrul Asan. Thank you, Ms. Lucia. Good evening, and I welcome you all on this closing ceremony of ICPC World Finals, Dhaka. We start our program by conducting the welcoming speech. So, I would like to welcome Dr. Muhammad Alauddin, University of Asia Pacific Beauty Chairman, to come onto the stage and deliver his closing welcome speech. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Distinguished chief guest, Mr. Muhammad Abdul Mannan, Honorable Minister for Planning, Special Guest, Mr. Junaid Ahmed Falok, MP, Honorable State Minister, IC, I, ICT, Government of Bangladesh, Guest of Honor, Dr. William P. Boucher, President of ICPC Foundation, Senior Secretary, Mr. Jaul Alam, PAA, ICT Division, Professor Kamrul Hassan, Honorable Vice Chancellor of our University of Asia Pacific, Dr. Michael Donaho, ICPC Director of World Finals Contest, Mr. Ranjit Kumar, Executive Director, Bangladesh Computer Council, members of the National Expert Committee, representatives of international and local sponsors, dear champions of the champion, trainers and coaches, contest directors, entrepreneurs, foreign and local guests, representatives from media, my honorable board of trustee colleagues, faculty members of the University of Asia Pacific, and the dear volunteers of the University of Asia Pacific. Assalamu alaikum and a very good evening. It is with a great pleasure I welcome all of you to this closing ceremony. The world has just witnessed the most prestigious programming contest, 45th ICPC World Finals, being successfully held in Dhaka. This is a historic moment for us in Bangladesh. It is a dream come true. It is a solace to the soul of our former Vice-Chancellor, 
uh, of Asia Pacific, University of Asia Pacific, and late national professor, Dr. Jamil Riza Choudhury, who dreamed of it and paved the way of holding this 45th ICP, ICPC World Finals in Dhaka. We thank you, uh, Mr. President of ICPC Foundation, Dr. Bill, Bill Poucher, for, kindly, for your kindly announcing a memorial scholarship to our university in the name of late Jamil Riza Chaudhary. With this memorial funding, uh, his name will stay alive in the ICPC world. We thank you very much for that. The ICPC World Finals is a celebration of excellencies, uh, excellencies of the universities. This World Finals competition is a live example and a vivid manifestation of what universities can do to uplift the world community. I congratulate 137 universities from around the globe and their faculty members, expert trainers and coaches for unveiling marvels of such excellences in human power in computer science engineering. Dear champions of the champions, you turn real life problem into real life solution. You meet people's aspiration and empower people with new technological advances for a happier world. You undertook painstakingly long practices and your moments of joy have come to share with us. In a moment, we shall enjoy a award of trophy and triumphs. Appreciate and praise your present and future powers. We congratulate you, salute you for becoming the best of the best problem solvers to impact on human lives. I wish I could name all the institutions, organizations, and agencies, all the individuals involved in organizing such a magnificent opportunity for the universities and their excellent students to come and attend this World Finals in Bangladesh. As a whole, I would like to say thank you to the ICT Division and Bangladesh Computer Council, so ably guided by the passionate Honorable State Minister, Mr. Jonayad Ahmed Falok, Thank you for gracing this ceremony with Honorable Planning Minister, Mr. Bannan. I thank ICPC Foundation President, ICPC World Final Contest Director, and superb staff of ICPC. I say thank you to the directors and members of the operating teams and sub-teams. I also thank the members of the National Expert Committee, members of the agency that set up the contest floor and the computer network. I thank the smiling volunteers, volunteer boys and girls, and to those I might have missed mentioning. All of you rose to a call of an amazing teamwork and worked in an unparalleled harmony to, uh, to make this moment possible and earn a national pride for Bangladesh. I salute all of you. It has been, it has been a great honor for the University of Asia Pacific to host this world event with proud support of our government, in particular, ICT Division and Bangladesh Computer Council and also the cooperation of distinguished experts of our universities in Bangladesh, and of course, the ICPC Foundation and the sponsors. My best wishes to each one of you 
in this 45th ICPC World Finals. Once again, I humbly welcome all of you to this closing ceremony. My personal as well as our EAP's gratitude to all of you for being here with us uh, at this closing session. I once again welcome all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mohammad Alauddin. Now I would like to invite Mr. Ranjit Kumar, Executive Director, Bangladesh Computer Council, to deliver his speech. Thank you. Honorable Minister for Planning, Mr. M. M. Annan, Honorable State Minister for ICT, Mr. Junaid Ahmed Polo, Honorable Senior Secretary of ICT Division, Mr. N. M. Jiolalom, PA, Vice Chancellor of University of Asia Pacific, Professor Dr. Kamrula Hassan, ICBC Executive Director, Dr. William B. Paucher, ICBC Deputy Executive Director, Dr. Jeff Donaho, contestants, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu Alaikum and good evening. It has truly been an exciting journey for us to host the 45th ICBC World Finals Dhaka. As the executing agency of this mega event, Bangladesh Computer Council, along with the ICT Division and University of Asia Pacific, has provided all our support to make this event a grand success. This event has been hosted in a country branded as Digital Bangladesh because of its digital transformation during the last decade. The transformation was led by our Honorable Prime Minister, Sheikh Hasina, and under the guidance of the architect of Digital Bangladesh, Mr. Shajib Wajid. The world took our development as a shining example, and once Bill Gates referred to this as wild adoption of technology. This 45th ICBC World Finals was especially in many respects. Did you notice that all participating teams designed their own logo, which was structurally similar to the main logo of ICBC, ICBC World Finals Dhaka? Didn't know this has ever happened before. However, no mega events of this scale can be organized without challenges. I must mention that we, the organizers with the ICBC World Finals Secretariat and tremendous support from the vendors successfully took care of the challenges. Our team have also worked wholeheartedly to make this program a grand success. What you have seen here now in this event from 6 to 11 November, the excellent environment of this contest, Venu is the finished good product of a lot of hard work that was first initiated back in 2017. And the operational planning and preparations started last year. And since then, there has been hundreds of meetings with ICBC foundations, both physically and online to understand and deploy all the necessary requirements. Our technical teams, the engineers from VCC and other partners have worked continuously and did a wonderful job. My heartiest thanks to all the persons 
in host roles members from ICPC Global team, all the ministries and agencies who were involved with this agreement. Our utility service providing agencies, the managing authorities of our contest venue, the designated hospitals and doctors are everyone else who have worked day and night. We sincerely and love to make the 45th ICFC World Finals Dhaka a great success. Once again, I thank the ICBC Foundation for this wonderful event, and I hope that we will again have this beautiful gathering of the brilliant minds on our soil again. Before concluding, I must mention the great support and guidance of Mr. Junaid Ahmed Palok, Honorable State Minister for ICT. On the host part, he led the entire management from the front to make this 45th World Finals a grand success. Wish all the contestants very best in the days ahead. Thank you. Joy Bangla. Thank you, Mr. Ranjit Kumar. I would like to invite now Mr. N. M. Ziaul Alam, Senior Secretary, ICT Division, Bangladesh, to deliver his welcome speech. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chancellor. Good evening, everybody. Uh, we all know how globally digital solution of problems using ICT is now regarded as a critical component of long run growth. Every past IT solutions delivered important gains, such as higher living standard, longer lives and less disease, better communications, raising productivity and economic growth. If we encourage the youths to embrace innovation at an early age, they will undoubtedly become more capable of propelling world forward by designing novel solutions to pressing problems. So we need to support it to the young people more on IT skill. Bangladesh has been experiencing transformation of a leading edge technology and consequently a standard economic growth, a journey to smart Bangladesh. Here with the government, along with the business organizations, leading companies, academia, startups and experts from all across the country are working on co-designing and piloting innovative new approaches to governance and development. To this context, the oldest, largest, and the most prestigious programming contest in the globe, the ICPC World Finals 2022 is very significant to us, which is going to become a great success today. And it, it gives us immense pleasure to see how the new digital solutions coming from the young minds across the world. We are highly in depth to the, to the founder of ICPC, Mr. Poucher, the president of ICPC, and his team, including Jeff Danahu and others, for their kind guidance and wholehearted support to us. This success is greatly attributed to their extraordinary leadership in the ICPC. The government, the academia, event management of Bangladesh, and the contestants across the world got a very huge and excellent experience from this event. I wish all the best to the aspiring digital enthusiasts and competitors today. I'm sure you will be the world leaders of tomorrow and will take the world to a greater height. I would like to express my heartfelt congratulations to the uh, contestant of this year 
and winners. And I believe you will be the winner of tomorrow too. My heartfelt gratitude and thanks to the chief guest, Mr. M. A. Mannan MP, Honorable Minister for Planning for expecting our invitation and accepting our invitation and for being here with us today. Sir, your gracious presence truly encourages us in arranging such a big event. I would also like to acknowledge my gratitude to uh, the Honorable State Minister of ICT, Mr. Junaid Ahmed Pollock MP, for his continuous support and extraordinary guidance. Otherwise, it would not be possible to make the event a grand success. I am thanking all the organizers and all the stakeholders for arranging such a wonderful and colorful event. Once again, I extend my sincerest thanks and good wishes to you all. Thank you all. Stay safe. Joy Bangla. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. NMZ Al Alam. Now I would like to invite Mr. Junaid Ahmed Polo, MP, Honorable Minister of State, ICT Division, Bangladesh, to deliver his welcome, welcome speech. Thank you very much, Professor Dr. Kamrul Hassan, Vice Chancellor of University of Asia Pacific and Director ICPC World Finals, Dhaka, today for your kind introduction. Today's Chief Guest, Honorable Minister for Ministry of Planning, Mr. M. A. Mannan MP, Dr. William B. Poucher, President of the ICPC Foundation and Executive Director of World Finals, ICPC, Mr. N. M. Ziaul Alam, Senior Secretary of ICT Division, and Dr. Michael J. Donahu, ICPC Deputy Executive Director and ICPC Director of World Finals Contests, Mr. Ranujit Kumar, Executive Director of Bangladesh Computer Council, Government of Bangladesh, our talented programmers, problem solvers, contestants, respected judges, dear volunteers, and friends from media, good evening to you all. First of all, I would like to pay my homage to Father of the Nation, Bangabundhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, who gave us liberty and showed us how we would be developed Shonar Bangla in future. Let me start with one of my favorite quotes of Bangabundhu from his historic speech at the United Nations General Assembly in 1974. I quote, there is no room for doubt at all that international cooperation and partnership in resources and technology can facilitate our task, can alleviate people's sufferings, unquote. The people of Bangladesh have experienced how the daughter of Bangabundhu, our Honorable Prime Minister, Sheikh Hasina, is using modern technologies to provide citizen services under her premiership we have experienced rapid social and economic progress in last 13 years. With the guidance of the most dynamic and versatile leader like her, we have received our digital Bangladesh. Now we are going ahead to achieve the vision of smart Bangladesh with her dynamic leadership by 2041. With the proper guidance, and the leadership of 
the architect of Digital Bangladesh, Mr. Shajib was a joy, honorable ICT, at, ICT Affairs Advisor to Prime Minister of Bangladesh, we have been able to provide more than 2,000 services online from the government side to citizens' doorsteps. Bangladesh has made impressive strides in digitalization with the establishment of union digital centers to ensure online government, commerce, and banking services and enable internet connections for the villagers. The government has set up more than 8,000 digital service delivery centers across the country under the Aspire to Innovate A2I project under ICT division. Around 16,000 men and women entrepreneurs are providing all these services, including banking, e-commerce, and different public and private services. Not only that, I was listening to Dr. Poucher's press briefing speech on Facebook Live I was listening to him that he was also mentioning that in Bangladesh, out of 170 million population, we have been able to provide 130 million internet users in last only 13 years. And you'd be very really happy to know that on a single government portal, we have 52,000 government websites from where our citizens are getting information and also services. Bangladesh is becoming a rich nurturing ground for startups and new innovative ideas that are transforming the entrepreneurship ecosystem in Bangladesh. Currently, we have more than 2,500 startups. Every year, we are getting 200 new startups. To provide them mentoring support, coaching support, we have set up Innovation Design and Entrepreneurship Academy our government has set up Startup Bangladesh Limited Company, which is the government-funded venture capital company. And also under ICT division, our high-tech park authority, they are creating a partnership environment between government, academia, and industry. We have recently established IT business incubation centers in different universities. Chittagong University of Engineering and Technology, Khulna University of Engineering and Technology, these two universities has already have already IT business incubation centers and another 50 specialized labs we are going to set up on AI, IoT, VLSI, AR, VR, MR, cloud computing, metaverse, cybersecurity, data analytics, and so on. We are building 92 high-tech parks and 64 Sheikh Kamal IT training and incubation centers across the country at the divisional and district levels. Our software, BPO, e-commerce, and R&D sector, in total, 2 million jobs we have created in ICT sector in last 13 years. And currently, we are exporting $1.5 billion from ICT sector, and we have a target to reach $5 billion export by 2025, and we would like to provide 3 million jobs in IT sector. You'll be happy to know that we are hosting more than 600,000 IT freelancers, and we have a target to transform them into entrepreneur. In partnership with World Economic Forum, we have a plan to establish Center for 4IR in December in Dhaka. We have four pillars of digital Bangladesh, human resource development, connectivity for all, government service delivery, and ICT industry promotion. For this, we are taking many initiatives from the ICT division to be connected with the youth and smart people like you we think that a wonderful initiative like ICPC may help us to meet the smart people whom we are searching for. I have learned from the directors of ICPC that they have some fantastic programs 
and initiatives for underprivileged children and students in different countries to encourage them to learn coding and programming, especially IBM Quant Quantum, JetBrains, Huawei, they are helping ICPC for a long time. So I would like to call upon IBM, Quantum, Huawei, JetBrains, Huawei, and board of directors of ICPC to introduce those fantastic initiatives in Bangladesh. We will ensure every support from ICT division to make those initiatives successful in Bangladesh. Dear friends, I want to mention a few lines from my very favorite song by Queen Band. I quote, we are the champions, my friends, and we will keep on fighting till the end. We are the champions, we are the champions of the world. Bangladesh is currently enjoying the benefits of demographic dividend from 170,000 educational institutions we have more than 50 million students and 70 percent of our population are below 30 years of age from 150 universities we are getting more than 20,000 IT and ITS graduates every year this workforce is an economic powerhouse for building smart Bangladesh. Dear contestants and guests, though we are at the closing ceremony, this is not the end. This is the new beginning, the bond that we developed with you. We want to continue it for a lifetime. We want you to be part our new journey towards smart Bangladesh. Finally, I want to give thanks to participants, respected judges, mentors, and all the stakeholders for making this event wonderful and successful. I want to thank again the ICPC Foundation for providing us the opportunity to host the 45th ICPC World Finals here in Dhaka, and I hope that this will not be the only time for us to host it. I hope that we were able to make your stay in Dhaka comfortable and pleasant, and you will be going home with some beautiful memories. Dear contestants, you have already owned over the Bangladeshi people and will always be welcomed in our humble homes with open hearts. I wish you all a safe journey back home and we'll be looking forward to your visit to Bangladesh again. Let me conclude my speech by mentioning a few lines of my favorite songs by Aerosmith. I quote, dream on, dream on, dream on until your dreams come true. Joy Bangla, Joy Bangabundu. Thank you. Uh, State Minister, Mr. Junaid Ahmed Pollock, MP, ICT Division, Bangladesh, for your very eloquent speech. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to invite Mr. M. A. Mannan, Honorable Minister for Planning, Government of Bangladesh, to deliver his welcoming speech.
গুড ইভনিং শুভ সন্ধ্যা নিশ্চিন বাংলা আমাদের মিনিং দ্য সেইম এজ গুড ইভনিং ইন ইংলিশ let me begin by saying that i have not up to the mark with the subject or the matter that has been the central thing here for the last two days contest in icpc i am in a sense uh, an old timer because uh, i'm not trained in this uh, digital matters having said that let me also say that i feel proud that we have very young and energetic ministers like Junaid Ahmad Palak, my colleague in the cabinet, who looks after this very modern subject. My job is in the back room, providing documentation and finance support for these kind of activities. And my boss is, of course, the prime minister, who encourages us to introduce and to work and to invest in these areas which will push us or move us upward, which has been our aim, has been our goal for the last few years, particularly in the last decade or so, with the present prime minister in charge. I would also like to thank my colleague in the government, and I'm Ziaul Alam, senior secretary of this division, and other officers, and particularly teachers and vice chancellor and professors of University of Asia Pacific for joining hands with our ICD division in organizing this international event. I was, I was pleasantly surprised to hear and to read from the papers here, there are 1,000 overseas participants in this uh, contest from 70 countries. That's a really huge, huge honor for us in Bangladesh to be able to host such an event. It's particularly gratifying to also know that before us in Asia, our great neighbors in the East, Japan, China, and Thailand have hosted this contest. So that's a really a very, very pleasant and a very satisfying uh, bit of information to know that we are in such good company. Ladies and gentlemen, we in Bangladesh at this moment, we are working, all of us, you know, in every vocation or in every field of activity to see that the country moves upward and forward. It's very well known all over the world that we are not a mightily rich country. But it is also known that we are a hardworking people. We have about, and, about, about 12 million people now working all over the world, working literally physical work, working in various fields and creating wealth for the communities where they work. So that has opened a bridge to the world for us. We would like to go out, learn, come back, and translate our learning into our own programs and work back in the country. We are very happy to also inform you that through the last 10, 12 years under our present Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, we have been able to break the shackles of poverty to a great extent. For the first time in our history, we have been able to attack hunger in a sense which has created confidence in the global community that we will be able to finally move into middle-income country by end of the decade, and hopefully our country will be able to move to what is called developed country status by 2040, working in this field, all of us. So in that context, work in our ICT division in this modern latest technology, digital technology, which will be our tool of change in the coming days, is very important. The government is providing, we don't have much money, but we are, we are providing a lot of our funds, investment funds in this field, with the hope that our people will be able to reach benefits and reach 
a better standard of living in the coming few years. Ladies and gentlemen, as a guest here this evening, my job has been to welcome all of you to our country, particularly the young contestants, the teachers and professionals, and other people who are in this great field of activity, and to assure them that we stand ready to join hand with all countries of the world in seeing that the global community as a whole can move to a new area where good life, better life is available to everyone. So in that global struggle, in that global effort to reach a better world, to reach a better living standards for all people, we would like to inform you, the contestants here and the other participants, distinguished guests, the Bangladesh stands ready to join hands with everyone in that big effort. I would like to thank all of you for joining us here. And I would, of course, like to wish you that you have a pleasant stay in our country. Enjoy your beef stay. And as my colleague, Junal Ahmad Pollock has just said, I would also like to join my voice with him and say that you return home happily and carry memories of pleasant stay here in our country. We would like you to come back again and again in the coming days. And we would like also to remain in touch with you so that our our, our efforts towards better life is strengthened. I would like to thank the Ministry of our ICT, Ministry of ICT, and particularly its minister, Mr. Pollock, and the secretary, Mr. Alam, and other people who have been very kind in asking me to join with you in this evening. And I am really humbled by this invitation, and I thank them once again. Thank you all. Good evening. Joy Bangla, Joy Bangla Bandit. Thank you, honorable speakers. And now, please welcome to the closing ceremony stage, ICPC Foundation Board Member, ICPC Deputy Executive Director, and World Finals Contest Director, Jeff Donahue. <laughs> All right, good evening. Congratulations to all of the competitors and coaches. It's a lot of fun to watch the competition today. What an exciting world finals here in Dhaka. There are so many people that we need to thank for, for making all of this possible. Thank you, University of Asia Pacific. Thank you, Vice Chancellor, Dr. Kwamrul Asan. ICPC World Finals DACA Director, and Dr. Mohammed Alauddin, University of Asia Pacific Chairman, for their extraordinary commitment to the ICPC World Finals. Thanks to ICPC World Finals DACA Deputy Director, Dr. Shah Murtaza Rashid Al Mazud, and ICPC World Finals DACA Assistant Director, Mr. Imran bin Azad. The community support for ICPC World Finals DACA is indeed astounding. Thank you to Mr. Mohammed Zafur Iqbal, former president of the CSE department, and the city of DACA for your outstanding hospitality. Thanks to the ICT division and Mr. NM Zaul Alam the Bangladesh Computer Council, and Mr. Ranjit Kumar, Engineer Mohammed Emmanuel Kabir, Mr. Mohammed Rashuldul Islam, Engineer Mohammed Galoom Sawar, and Mr. Madho Sudum Chanda for your steadfast support. And finally, thanks to M.A. Manan, Minister for Planning, Government of Bangladesh, and Mr. Zinad Ahmed Palak, Minister of State, ICT Division, Bangladesh. Without his support, strong leadership, and vision of the future for Digital Bangladesh, this event here today would have never happened. 
We would like to acknowledge his strong and continuous support of the community. Your commitment to future generations will impact the lives in Bangladesh and across the globe for years to come. Thank you, Huawei, ICPC Diamond World Finals and ICPC Challenge sponsor. Thank you, JetBrains, ICPC Global Programming Tools sponsor for your longstanding support. You are all the champion of champions. Your unwavering support allows us to spotlight the world's most excellent problem solvers and make their dreams of competing on a global stage come true. Accolades also go to IBM Quantum and Endure Capital for all of your support. We're getting close to announcing the world finals champions and I'm very excited to announce a new tradition the ICPC World Championship flag. ICPC is very proud that we recognize and celebrate the annual competition and crowning of the ICPC World Finals champions. This year and for the coming years, the World Finals champion team will be awarded the coveted World Finals Cup that we all know and love, as well as the World Finals flag that will remain at their university following the World Finals. We'll be revealing this flag for our, world, for our world champions in just a little while, but we look forward to seeing this flag and the trophy in World Finals photos all around the world. As mentioned earlier, the ICPC World Finals requires a lot of support, and JetBrains has risen to the task. It is now my pleasure to introduce to the stage Senior Vice President of Investment and Research and Education for JetBrains, Andre Ivanov. Andre. Good evening, friends. Congratulations with an excellent World Final, one of the best I've ever seen. It was very well organized. Uh, the competition was very good, and actually I think that the best team has won. Probably guess who is it, but we will know a little bit better. So, uh, thank you. I wouldn't say much. It was a great final. Thanks. Thank you, Andre, and thank you to JetBrains. Most, comp most competitors and coaches participated in the ICPC Challenge powered by Huawei on Tuesday this week. It is my pleasure to introduce from Huawei, Vice President of Asia Pacific Research Institute, Mr. Fan Shui Sen. Uh, respected Minister Junai Aham de Pollock and uh, ICPC Foundation President uh, Bill Pointer, and also the uh, Deputy Director Jeff Donat. Yeah. And uh, dear uh, the doctors uh, Kumara Aham, so, yeah. uh, all the contest, coach, and uh, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'm Fan Xue Sen, uh, Vice President of the Asia Pacific Institute uh, from Huawei. Uh, during the past four days, I was deeply impressed by your passion, your confidence, uh, your dedication, your skills, and your algorithm. Uh, we played in well played indeed. For our champions and top rankers, please enjoy the coding, coding now and coding in the future. Taste.
fail and remember the excitement. Enjoy the pause. We salute you. Allow this glorious moment imprint on your career and life. You deserve a repeat of this for all the contestants. Please be as much long as possible because all you have accomplished complete, completely and perfectly throughout the whole contest. I sincerely hope you have improved by using your knowledge from the Ivory Tower to the solve some interesting challenges from the industry side. Yeah. One thing, ICPC has sold us that how powerful it could be if we comply the wisdom from the academy and the, the industry, the marriage of the two can be definitely drive the technological progress uh, to the benefit of the human people. Last but not the least, let's be all be the thankful to the ICPC Foundation, the host university. University of the East Pacific, Bangladesh ICT division, and many sponsors, contributors, and also the volunteers who organized to build such a wonderful platform, platform and occasion. For our young talent to test their skills and rise to the challenge. For all the contests, don't forget Huawei I already prepared our online challenges uh, uh, for all of you. Look forward to meet you again at the ICPC World Final in 2023. Thank you. All right, I'm, I'm, I'm getting quite used to standing next to that beautiful trophy. I, I'm, I'm getting jealous of whoever the champion is going to be. But before we get to that, let's see who's won some prizes from our ICPC challenge powered by Huawei. Please join us on the stage for awarding these prizes. Mr. Wang Amin, Vice President of the Institute of Strategic Research, and Vicky Zhang, Vice President of Corporate Communications to hand out the prizes. To all who have participated in the ICPC Challenge powered by Huawei, your custom t-shirts will be available for pickup in Hall 3 during the celebration dinner. Please send one representative to Hall 3 to pick up your t-shirts for the entire team. So let's first look at the screen and congratulate our top 11 through 30 teams and coaches. <laughs> Congratulations on your achievements. And now the top four teams and coaches, we'd like you to join Huawei on stage for your prizes. Congratulations. The fourth place team, University of Rockla. The third place team, Tokyo, oops. I think I got a little ahead of myself. Congratulations, and now, for real, the fourth place team. University of Rocklaw. Third place, Tokyo Institute of Technology. Second place, MIT. First place, 
National Research University. Please join us on the stage. And to our top four coaches, congratulations. The fourth place coach, Vladislav Ipivanov, Bjorn Martinson, Volchek Nadara, Genady Korotivich. Congratulations to the teams for the ICPC Challenge powered by Huawei. Let's get a great picture. All right. Congratulations, everybody. Thank you. It's always great to have too much swag, more swag than you can possibly carry, so thank you, Huawei. The other prizes for the challenge will be available to the silver and bronze winners to pick up following the celebration down on the floor at the far side of the stage. It's now my pleasure to introduce to the stage ICPC Foundation President and ICPC Executive Director, Bill Poucher.
What an amazing competition. You know, every year we seek to, to, to put on the world's greatest world finals, and in fact, our target is it just needs to be the best in the history of mankind. And so once again, we've accomplished that mission. Thank you, thank you, thank you, our wonderful hosts. And here we are uh, already looking at what we're going to do next year because we've got a bunch of teams out here that have done some remarkable things and we need to have another one of these world finals. And I've got to admit that our, uh, our DACA uh, hosts uh, have made that pretty hard, you know. That's one of those things. But I better get them up here before they back out, don't you think? So I'd like to invite to the stage Professor Yusriel Gamal, I'd ICPC Executive Committee member, Professor Osama Ismail, ACPC Super Region Director, Mohammed Fawad, ICPC Foundation member and ACPC Executive Director, Dr. Samar El Masri, AAST Director of Financial Affairs, Dr. Amr Hassan, AAST Director of Logistics Affairs, and Dr. Ahmed El Shanawi, Dean of Regional Information Center, to make a very special announcement. Okay. And so let's see, Jeff, do I hand it over to you now? Bill, I think we should watch a video. Well, why don't we watch a video? You know, I have five grandchildren, and I thought we might just watch a video of, no, no, I guess we're going to watch a video of the next World Finals. But uh, uh, go ahead, let's take a look and see what in the world is going to happen. So where do you think it's going to be? Any hint? Oh, whoa.
ICPC World Finals, Sharm El Sheikh. Dr. Usuri, here you are. Professor uh, William Boucher, ICPC executive directors, and all esteemed members of the uh, ICPC Foundation, honorable representatives of uh, Bangladesh government, honorable representatives of South Pacific University, RCDs, coaches, uh, our volunteers, participants, contestants, dear guests, on behalf of Dr. Ismail Abdel Ghaffar, the president of the Arab Academy of Science and Technology and Maritime Transport, who should have been with us here except for some binding commitment, I would like to welcome you all to the next contestant, the next uh, ch championship at the beautiful resort city of Sharm el Sheikh. <clears throat> next year will be very remarkable year because we will organize two world finals at the same time, 21-22 and 22-23. That is, that is a major undertaking, but with the full cooperation of ICPC Foundation and the generous support of our sponsors and the full support of the government of Egypt, we will do it, inshallah. As we speak, the resort city of Sharm el Sheikh is hosting one of the largest United Nations gather, uh, gather, gatherings, which is the COP27, with more than 40,000 participants and from 197 countries and organizations. The city is very well prepared to receive such a large number of guests because it's the largest city a resurgence resource city in Egypt. So we promise you an event that you will remember for a long time to come. So again, I would like and look forward to welcoming you in Sharm el Sheikh 2023, November the next. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. This is just um, really a, a dream come true, another dream come true. And this is the way things work. You see, every step we take uplifts our communities, and we take that step together. Academia, industry, and our community leaders. Why? Well, because... We're going to make a difference each and every year as we build on our strengths uh, and uh, to the benefit of our communities and provide those services uh, for our neighbors that will lead us to even happier times than we have today. And I have often mentioned that the world that you will live in will be framed by how you see it. And I'm going to ask you just one question right now. Do you want to be happy? Wait, wait, wait. Now, do you want to be happy? 
Okay, let's go make that happen. Thank you. All right, let's get a picture. Let's get a picture. And I know no better way to be happy than making sure that our 8 billion co cousins out there are happy too. So let's get after that lifetime purpose. Please welcome to stage Upsilon Pi Epsilon, UPE Executive Director, Orlando Mantrigo, ICPC Director of Judging, Joe Perry, and ICPC World Finals Chief Judge, John Bonomo. Thank you. On behalf of the ICPC, I wish to thank our chief judges, doctors, John Bonoma and Joe Perry for their leader, leadership roles in the, the judging process for the ICPC. The first problem solved at this event was problem H. For those, those of you who had a copy of the problem, is it's a page long. It was solved in 11 minutes by the team from South Korea, Seoul National University. Congratulations to Seoul National University. I'd like to ask the three members of the team plus their coach to please come forward. You hear some of all right? They're coming, they're way over there. So for the remainder of the first assault um, awards, please do not come to this stage. Instead, stand up so we can recognize you. The, uh, the second uh, first assault problem came in at minute 25, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, solved problem C in 25 minutes. So MIT guys, stand up. Are they, do you, where, where's the, where, oh, they're way over there. Okay, okay. And keep on standing, okay? Because at minute 30 into the contest, MIT solved problem L. Uh, the fourth first to solve was uh, problem J at minute 37. That was the University of Tokyo. Uh, following that, at minute 50, problem A was solved by MIT.
The next problem to solve came in at minute 54, problem F, National uh, Yang Min Jiaotong, Un Jiaotong University, sorry. Uh, minute 61, problem I was solved by ETH Zurich. And at minute 76, Seoul National University solved problem B. Okay, minute 85. Problem G was solved by University of Tokyo. And 196 minutes into the contest, MIT solved problem E. So, Okay, finally, at uh, the 210th minute, Problem K was solved by the National Young Ming Chiao Tong University. recognize the World Finals History Hall of Champions. Please welcome back to stage, Jeff Donahue. All right. We saw that Hall of Champions for ICPC going back many years. Who will we add to this Hall of Champions? Are we ready to get started? Awesome. Well, to do this, I am going to need some help. So please join me in welcoming to the stage ICPC World Finals Technical Director, John Clevenger, and ICPC Foundation Board Member, and ACPC Executive Director, Mohamed Fawad. Please join me on the stage. All right, at this time, I would like to invite to the stage Bill Poucher and Steve Bourne and our award presenters, Professor Dr. Hassan, Dr. Mohamed Aludin, Orlando Madrigal, and Eric Baker. Oh, I'm sorry. Hold no, up. No, no. 
Sorry, hold up, hold up, hold up. Hello? All right, I got ahead of myself. Apologies on that. Yeah. Yeah. Not in a hurry. Yeah. Future, future host of the ACPC. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay. First of all, let me hear it loudly. Are you ready? No, no, I need to hear yes very loud. Are you ready? Why you are not answering? You are not ready? <laughs> yeah. Are you ready for the results? Uh, before we start, actually, we, uh, we are very thankful for uh, our host this year. They did a great job hosting us. Thank you very much. I can remember uh, 2017, Dr. Kayum told me that we need your help to make it happen in Bangladesh, that was in uh, South Dakota, as I remember. And I promised him that we will do it here in Bangladesh. And now I can say we did our promise as ICPC. Thank you. Uh, we need to give our host a big round of applause for everything they did for us before we start. Thank you very much, Bangladesh. Thank you. Asia Pacific University for all the great work you did. And unfortunately, you made it very hard for us next year. So I, will, I may ask some help from your people with us next year. Thank you. Now it's time for a little fun. We're going to find out something. We're yeah. going to resolve things. So, Mohammed, what do we have here? 671 yeah. pending submissions. Yeah, a lot of work in the last hour. A lot of submissions. In the last hour of the contest, there were 671 submissions. Yeah. Let's tell the mom and dads who are watching us from home, what does it mean that we have a five hour contest. In the first four hours, everybody can see the results. But in the last hour, what's going on? In the last hour, the scoreboard is frozen, what is sometimes called the blind period. Teams still submit, but, uh, and the, their submissions are judged, but they're not posted on the scoreboard. So at the beginning of that final hour, the scoreboard looked like this. Yeah, we can see a lot of colors here, like green, dark green, red, which is my favorite. And another color that's, actually, I call it yellow because I know RGB. I don't know this. The girls have a lot of names. Like, well, what's the name of this color? Let's call it yellow. Let's call it yellow. Okay? Let's, let's call it yellow. So yeah. we have red, green, and yellow. Obviously, green are, are um, submissions that were successful before the last hour, and red are submissions that were unsuccessful before the last hour. And then all of the yellow, those are all the pending submissions. Yeah, and the dark green is the first to solve. So this team is the first to solve this problem, the dark green. So for now, we, let's, let's make a deal. For every yellow, if it's turned green, we're gonna cheer the team by a round of applause. But if it's red, we will share them twice because they did a great job trying to solve it. Okay? So for every trial, we need to share the students, the contestant, yourself. So let's start. Okay, so we will first go down to the bottom of the scoreboard. And we start down at the bottom, resolving upwards until we have a world champion. Yeah, a lot of teams. John, a lot of teams. I wonder what we're gonna do next year. So there we go. The first step is to decide from on, among the, all of the team submissions what teams end up qualifying for honorable mention. And so we're gonna take all of the pending runs 
and we're going to throw them into the judge's queue and we're going to evaluate them and we're going to find out who all the honorable mention teams are. Are we ready? Are you ready? Okay, let's all go. All right, here we go in the judge's queue. <clears throat> we started out with a submission from uh, Technological de Pereira. They submitted one and it was a no. They submitted another one. It was a no. Costa Rica got a no. University of British Columbia got a no. And they got another no. But then they got a yes. Syrian Virtual University got a no. And then they got another no. German University Cairo gets a no. Uh, again, they submitted. And that one was also no. Faust Institute submitted. And the judges rejected that one. They submitted again. That one got rejected. Cairo submitted one. And they got a yes. AAST Cairo submitted and got a no. American University in Beirut submitted twice and got no's both time. Madison, Wisconsin uh, got a yes, so they moved up. Uh, right, uh, Bucharest gets a yes. Uh, San Simone uh, is a no. Shahid Beheshti gets a no. Suleiman Dimarel gets a yes. And Ain Shams University also gets a yes. Beijing Jiaotong University submits two. The second one is yes. Sao Paulo, uh, San Carlos gets a yes. Simone Bolivar, that was a no. Uh, Tehran, the judges rejected that one. They submitted another one. That one was also a no. Uh, De Bahia got a no. Princess Samaya University was rejected. But then the second one, they got a yes. Adama uh, got a no. EAFIT got a yes. Uh, Durabi Ambani, they get a yes. Damascus submits, they get a no. They submit again, the judges accepted that one. Tishreen submits and the judges took that one also. Ein Shams gets a no, but their second one is a yes. Technological Automato de Mexico has a whole bunch of submissions. 17 submissions. And no. they were all rejected. But then they submitted again yes. and they got a yes. Bucharest got a again, yes. yes. The judges, Sule Suleiman Demirel got a no. Sao Paulo yes. uh, gets a yes from the judges. Beijing Zhao Tong gets a no. They submit again. That one's a yes. Yes. University, Yale University gets rejected by the judges. Birla Institute Pilani gets a yes. Campus of Sao Carlos get a yes. Northeastern University gets a yes from the judges. EAFIT -E submits and they got a no. Belarusian submit. The judges took that one. De La Census gets a no. Rochester was accepted. Albath University was a no. Tishreen University gets another yes. Universitas Indonesia is rejected by the judges and then a second one. And then they got a third one and that one was accepted yes. by the judges. Jahan Grinagar uh, University submitted and the judges said no on that one. UT Dallas submitted a whole bunch of times and they were all rejected. But then they submitted again and they got another one. Ishvest State got a yes. Uh, Guadalajara yes, gets a yes from the judges. Higher Institute gets rejected. University of Dhaka gets a yes. Woo! Ecole Polytechnique submits two. The second one is a yes. Campus Monterey gets uh, two submissions. They're both no. Kazan Volga region submits a whole bunch of times, and in the end, that one was no. But they submit again, and they got a yes. Aleppo University submits 13 different times, and they were all rejected. Bucharest submits three times. That was rejected by the judges. Belarusian National gets a yes. IIT Kampur also gets accepted. Charles University gets accepted. The University of Dhaka, that one was rejected. Alberta was rejected. Georgia Institute of Technology gets rejected again and again. And no, and again. And, no, and, and no, again. And no. And again. And, and they're rejected no. again. Georgia Tech no. is rejected again. And then they submit and they oh, finally do it. it. Ural Federal gets accepted. The judges also took Buenos Aires. Alexandra Yonkuza got a yes. Nizhny Novgorod also gets accepted by the judges. International Institute at Hyderabad, Hyderabad uh, gets rejected. Sharif University is accepted, and so is uh, Sidewall de Campinas and Karlsruhe University and Panamericana Campus Bonaterra gets accepted. IIT Ruhrki, they finally they get one accepted. Federal de Campina Grande is accepted. The Technical University of Munich gets accepted. University of Hong Kong has 16 different submissions. 
And in the end, they were all rejected by the judges. But then they submit again, and they get yes. a yes. Korea University submits and was rejected. Belarusian state was accepted by the judges. McGill submits, and that one was also taken, accepted by the judges. Texas A&M, they, they get accepted by the judges. The University of Science is accepted. Michigan and Ann Arbor gets rejected once, twice, three times, no, four times, no, five times, no. six times. Seven no, times, no. eight no. rejections. No. No. Yeah, but they finally get it. And Shalzalal University is accepted. And IIT Guwahatari gets accepted. And uh, Ateneo de Manila University, the final one in the judges' queue, is rejected. And that's what happened in the judges' queue. And that means we end up with all of the following teams in honorable, honorable mention, mention category. So honorable mention teams, please, if you see your university, Whoops. please stand up. As your teams, as your name shows up on the screen, please stand up so the audience can recognize you. No, 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 no. Okay. Got to back up here. Um, I may need technical help here. There's a reason I'm a technical director because I have a technical team. There's a technical problem. I think uh, we, if you hit the computer. Hmm. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, do, do, do. No, I don't think so. That's not going to do it. Can I get no? Uh-oh, Bill is coming up. Let's, let's yeah. run, let's run. Yeah. Let's run, Bill is coming. Yeah. Well, can I help? Huh? <laughs> yeah, you press forward. You already press B? Press B, I tried to go backwards. We're waiting now. Okay, until they finished fixing the problem, I think I'm going to tell you the story of my life from the beginning. I'm 43 years old, so we have a lot of time to, to tell. So how you like the competition here? You can see, you can compare. Uh, the, the most thing I heard is that whenever they go to ICPC location, you, you decide it to be a location, they see different world. Like when they go, they come to the ICBC location, they think it's, wow, it's a lot of change. So again, let's thank our host for all the things they did. Thank you very much. Okay, so let's get some bidding on this competition. Who you think won this competition? Yeah, that's the answer. You know, coming to the finals is the winning part. We just compete for fun. But the real thing is achieving the, the finals is the winning. Yeah, let's get back to the... Wow, it's a very fast fixing. Okay. So that proves two things. 
I'm smart enough as technical director to have a technical team that can fix problems and when all else fails with a computer, restart it. <laughs> yeah. So, our honorable mentions. Please stand up and be recognized when your name appears up here. Honorable mention teams, please stand. If it's shown. So we have a technical team that can repeat the problem. <laughs> okay. Again. Oh, it's shown here, but it doesn't. I know, it's there. Yeah. So have another solution. We can invite everybody to the stage so they can see here. Because we can see it here, but not here. So if you all come to the stage, then you can look to the screen. Yes, that's right. We can put the camera on the screen. One more problem for you. Honorable mention teams. Can you put just the camera here? Where's the camera, the director? Can you put just take here? No, that's not, that's not gonna work. Because if you put the camera here, it will show. Me. As you know, we are problem solvers. So to prove that, we need to create some problems. Otherwise, nothing will happen because we are not working. So we create some problems and then we solve it. So we are problem solvers. Yeah, that's it. Okay, if you want to, to know your result, come here. <laughs> Just come here, I'll tell you, <laughs> team by team. I'll give you the result and you go back. <laughs>
technical team so they can solve the problem quickly. I'm getting tired. Anyone here who can sing a song? Is there a singer here? No? No singer? Okay. Oh. So. I hope it's work, the honorable mention, this time, unless it will be horrible. Okay. Honorable mention? Teams? Yes! <laughs> if you see your name, please stand up. Teams, see your their names on the screen, please stand up. Congratulations to honorable teams. They are, most of them at the tent, so let's cheer them from here. The problem now is I'm afraid to touch it. <laughs> <laughs> don't touch anything. Yeah, do not touch anything. But. We have to go on, and so let's see what happens. So yeah. we just finished. Honorable mention is up through 73rd place. And so now we're going to go on and resolve all the remaining runs. And what we're headed for is up to the medal categories. Remember that the top 12 or more teams get medals in the ICPC World Finals for gold, four silvers and four bronzes. So, <clears throat> we start, well, we've got number team at 72nd place and they get a yes. La Habana has a yes, they move up also. Sydney has three runs, the first one is no, but the second one's a yes. Belarusian National is finished, they don't have any more runs. Charles University in Prague is done, IIT Kampur gets a yes, they move up in the ranks. Georgia Tech is done, or Ural Federal gets a yes from the judges. Nizhny Novgorod uh, is finished. Al Alexandru Ionkuza is done. University of Buenos Aires is done. Karlsruhe is finished. McGill is done. Estuardo de, de Campinas has no more runs. Sharif University is finished. East China Normal is done. Belarusian State. And we've got a team moving up. Uh, Federal de Campina Grande is finished, but uh, Munich moves up. Michigan Ann Arbor is finished. The University of Science gets a yes. Shal Jalal University is done. La Habana is finished. Hong Kong is finished. National University of Singapore is done. I IIT Guanada is done, but then de Cordoba moves up. AST Alexandria gets a yes from the judges, and they move up. 
uh, Utrecht University gets a yes, and they move up. Saratov State University also gets yes, a yes again. from the judges. UCLA gets to move up from the judges. Bangladesh University of Engineering and Technology gets, uh, no, they're finished. IIT Bombay has two runs, both of them are no. Keo University has three different pen problems pending, and the second one's a yes, they move up. IIT Kanpur is finished. Yeah, but, we, but here, we, let's, start, let's call Bill and Jeff to the stage. This, well, it stopped again. But do you know why it stopped? Yes, yes. Bill? Yes. We, actually, this was supposed to happen. Do you know why? Yes. Because at this point right here, Mohammed. Yeah. Indian Institute of Technology, Kabul is Asia West champion. Please come up to the stage. Please come to the stage. Indian Institute of Technology, Kabul. And the Institute of Technology Kampur, Asia West Champion. And let's continue to see what's happening. All right, let's keep going. We're currently moving up from 49th place, heading to our top 12 medal winners. So next is Ural Federal University. They have no more problems pending. They're done. Uh, Pan America campus. Bonaterra is finished. VNU HCM is done. AAST Alexandria. Well, they have no more pending runs. But Mohammed, do you know yes, why we stopped here? Yes, here because. Our Academy for Science and Technology, Alexandria, is the champion of African and Arab contest. Please come to the stage. ASD team from Alexandria. Arabia champion, Arab Academy for Science and Technology, Alexandria. Thank you very much. Are you going to stay the whole night here? Okay, okay. No more teams for you this year. Okay. All right, congratulations, AAST Alexandria. Yeah. Well, we're and up to we 44th place, so let's see what happens moving up towards medals. The Technische Universität München has a pending run, and it's a no. They've got a second one, and that one's a yes, yes. so they move up. <clears throat> Nacional de Cordoba has a pending uh, run. It was a no, but in fact, we once again pause here because... Yeah, Universidad Nacional de Cordoba is Latin America champion. The National University of Cordoba is the champion of Latin America.
Latin America champion. Thank you. John. Right, we continue on in our journey to the medals and the world champion. So currently we're looking at next is 43rd place and that's Utrecht University with one pending run. It's a yes, Woo! they move up. <laughs> Sydney is done. Uh, Saratov gets a yes, they move up. Bina New Centara has three okay, problems. Yeah. The first one's a yes, they move up. Keio University has a no, and so they're done. Hanoi University gets a yes from the judges, they move up. Uh, Belgrade has two problems. The first one's a no, the second one's a yes, so they move up. Uh, Zhijian University has a yes, and they move up to, from the judges. UCLA has one pending problem, and they get a yes also. Jagiellonian University also gets approved by the judges. Keist has another yes there. University of Toronto has three pending problems. The first one's a no. The second one gets a yes from the judges. They move up. Moscow State has a pending run that's a no. Kyoto University has two problems. The first one's a yes. They move up. Belarusian State University, two problems. Again, the first one's a yes. KTH Royal Institute of Technology gets a yes and still has two left. National Yangming Chao Tung University has two problems, and the second one is a yes. St. Petersburg Itmo, three problems, and the first one's a yes. University of Central Florida, the first problem is a yes. Um, uh, the Munich University is finished. Saratov State University is done. Utrecht has no more problems. International IT gets a yes from the judges. They move up. Hanoi University of Science and Technology has finished. Tokyo Institute of Technology, yes, they move up. The Faculty of Computer Science Belgrade has no more. They're finished. Being a new Santara has two. The first one's a no, and the second one's a no. UCLA has no more problems. Zhidian University is done. Jackie Elonian from Krakow gets a yes, and they move up. Kyoto University gets a yes, and the judges move them up. The University of Toronto gets a no, they're finished. Belarusian State University gets a yes, they move up into 14th place. Keist has one problem left and it's a no, they're finished. KTH has two and the first one is a yes. The University of Rockla has a yes from the judges. Swarthmore College has two pending runs. The first one's a no and the second one's a no, so they're finished. Carnegie Mellon has four and the first one's a yes. Um, MIPT, last year's host, has, is finished here, and St. Petersburg Itmo gets a yes, and they move up. <clears throat> University of Waterloo has three pending runs. The first one's a no, the second one's a no, but the third one is a yes, and Waterloo moves up. Purdue University has two problems pending. The second one is a yes, and they move up. National Yang Ming Chao Tung is finished, yeah. uh, but we pause here Way just to point here. out that yeah. they were the first team, as announced earlier. Yeah, we need to announce something first before we go this. We need to move, announce. Okay. Yeah, that I just got an uh, announcement that the uh, people who's leaving on 1 a.m., 1 and a half a.m., and 2 a.m. flight, they need to go directly to Hall 3 now because the bus is waiting for you. 1 a.m., 1 and half, 1.30, and 2 a.m. flight needs to go to Hall 3. And okay. now... We don't want you to miss your flights uh, home, so have a safe flight home. So we move on now. Yeah, uh, no. We go on, and we're at National Taiwan University, and they had one pending run. They're finished. A cold number on Superior gets a yes, and they have two more to go. St. Petersburg campus has two runs. The first one's a yes. Moving, looking now at University of Central Florida, UCF has two, they're both a no, so they're finished. International IT has no more runs. Tokyo Institute gets a yes, then they still have another problem. And University Medals of coming. Rockwell has a no, and then Kyoto University is finished. KTH gets yes. another yes, and they move up. Belarusian State University is finished. Jagiellonian has no more pending runs. Purdue is finished. St. Petersburg Itmo has no more runs. Carnegie Mellon has two. The first one's a no, but the second one is a yes. The judges moved them up. And now we're moving up towards the top finishers. We're here at University of Cambridge. 
with uh, no more runs. University of Waterloo is finished. St. Petersburg campus of higher uh, school of economics is done, but, but uh, Paris University moves up. The University of Engineering and Technology, VNU, moves up. And now we're in the top 15. The University of Oxford moves up there now in seventh. St. Petersburg State gets a no, and then they get a yes, and they move up into seventh place. Uh, ETH Zurich has four problems. The first one's a yes, and they move up, still looking for that 15th place, and that's Tokyo Institute. Shanghai Zhao Tong is now in 14th. KTH University finishes in 13th, and, and now we stop. Yeah, before because that, now we have arrived at the top 12, and Jeff, yeah. the top 12 are our medal winners, right? Absolutely. Yeah, that's medal time, but again, it's another announcement. 12 a.m. flight, 1 a.m. flight, 1.05 flight needs go directly to hall three. Now, if you are in 12 a.m. flight, 1 a.m. flight, 1.05 flight, then you need to go to hall three now. All right, I got to practice before inviting you to the stage. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do it right this time. So now I'd like to invite to the stage Professor Dr. Hassan, Dr. Aludin, Orlando Madrigal, and Eric Baker. Did you want to do the sponsor? Yeah, go ahead. And from our, and from our sponsors, Mr. Fan Susain, Vice President of Asia Pacific Research Institute, Huawei. Mr. Wang Aimang, Vice President of Institute of Strategic Research, and Vicky Zhang, Vice President of Corporate Communications. All right, all other regions, let's see. All right, let's see what we have here. So now let's see who will be on 12th place. Is that right, John? Bill. What do we got here, Bill? Wait, wait, wait just a second. Uh, Jeff, would you mind coming over here? Because I can't understand. I don't understand this. All of the regions and stuff. What about Andre? Okay. Uh, Andre Ivanov and Margarita Shadrina for the ICPC medals. Please come forward. Uh, I think we've got the full house. I, th I think we've got all of our metal hooders. Yeah, but I, I, I'd like to tell you that you are blocking the screen. But, but we still don't know who the medal winners are. We know who's, who's in the top 12, so all of these remaining teams are medalists, but the question is, what medal are they getting? Well, yeah, so right now... In 12th place, we have Carnegie Mellon University, and they have one remaining pending run. So let's find yeah. out what happens. It's a I yes, and they so move they up to move third on. place. Wow, well, they move to the third place. That means they are in the gold area now. All right, and so that means in 12th place with no more pending runs, the University of Engineering and Technology, VNU. Please come to the stage. First bronze medalist for today, University of Engineering and Technology, VNU. They solve it eight problems. Please come to the stage. Hurry up, I'm hungry. Hurry up.
bronze medalists for today, University of Engineering and Technology, VNU. John. All right. So yeah, let's see. Now, now we're looking for the next medalist. Yeah. Currently in 11th place, Ecole Normale Supérieure de Paris. But they, they have still won. have one run. They, they have, still have one run. They have one. Yeah. Shall we find out? Let's see. It's a, it's yes. a yes. They move up into third and place. They move, they move to the third place. They refused the bronze medal. So we go back down to 11th place, the University of Oxford. They have one pending run. Let's see what happens here. It's the last five. That's points. a no. So it's a row. And that means that, that Muhammad, means the University of Oxford. Yeah, second bronze medalist for, for today, University of Oxford. Bronze medalist is of eight problems. University of Oxford, second bronze medalist for today. Thank you. John? All right. So next, currently in 10th place, we have oh. ETH Zurich. They have three bending. pending submissions on three different problems. Yes. So let's take a look. Here's the first one. That's a no. Oh. All right, Still let's take a look two. at the second one. That one's also a no. The third one. That one's a yes. Oh. They up. Seven minutes before the All end. All right, which means we go back down here and we are now in 10th place, St. Petersburg State University. No pending runs, and that means... Third bronze medalist for today goes to St. Petersburg State University. They solve with a problem. Moving on, currently in ninth place, National Research University of Higher, Higher School of Economics. They have pending runs on one problem. Let's take a look at that. And oh. that was a no from the judges. And Mohammed, that means? Fourth, medal, fourth bronze medalist for today goes to National Research University High School of Economics and Northern Eurasia champion. They solve it at problems. National Research University Higher School of Economics, our fourth bronze medalist for today, and the North Asia champion. Congratulations and thank you.
Now, John. Well, so that, did we count? How many did we count? That Four. was 12, 11, 10, 10 and, nine. and 9. So that was our bronze medalist, right? Yes. yes okay. So that means everybody left has at least earned a silver medal. Yes. But that doesn't mean they all are in the order that we see. So right now, currently in eighth place, we have Seoul National University with pending runs on four different problems. Well, oh. let's resolve them. Let's see. Let's take a look. The first one, that one's it's a no. A no. The second one. That one's a yes. They move up into second place. <laughs> oh, they move to the second place. All right, still looking for our first silver medalist, the University of Warsaw, currently in eighth place with one pending problem. Let's take a look at that one. Yeah, it's in the last minute. That one was a no. no, and Mohammed, that means? First silver medalist for today, University of Warsaw. Our first silver medalist for today, University of Warsaw. They solved eight problems. Welcome, University of Warsaw. Our first silver medalist for today. This is all with eight problems. Thank you, Warsaw University. Thank you. John? All right. Looking for well, second. Looking for another silver medalist. University of Tokyo is currently in seventh place in a silver medal position. They have two, they have pending runs on two problems. Yes. So let's take a look at the first one. And yet again, a yes on that one. The it's judges it. move them up into second place. All right, so what that means is here we go Carnegie Mellon University. Mohammed? Yes, yeah, second silver medalist for today, Carnegie Mellon University. They solved nine problems. Second silver medalist for today, Carnegie Mellon University. They solved nine problems. Thank you, Carnegie Mellon. John? All right. Well, people can read scoreboards. It's fairly clear. Currently in sixth place is Mohammed? Yeah. So our third silver medalist for today, Ecole Normale Supérieure de Paris.
Congratulations. medalist for today, they solved nine problems. Thank you very much. So we are All looking right. for the last silver medal. And again, the it's very clear from the scoreboard, ETH Zurich. Yeah, so the fourth silver medalist for today, ETH Zurich. And they are Europe champion. First to solve problem I, and they solve nine problems. What a big title. Silver medalists for today, Europe champions, and first the sole problem I. Congratulations. Thank you, ETH. Thank you. Now it's time for gold medalists, but now we before know. that, before that. We, yeah, it's time for gold medalists. So hold up. This this is the gold medal category. We and need, we cannot do it be, without. We need some other people up here to celebrate. Yeah, it's so. Gold. I would like to ask my friend Dr. Hassan to invite some friends up here to the stage to celebrate with us the gold medals. Dr. Hassan. Thank you very much, Jeff. I'm requesting. Honorable State Minister, ICT Division, Bangladesh, Mr. Junaid Ahmed Palak, MP, please, could you please come to the stage? And I'm also, I'm also uh, requesting Mr. N.M. Ziaul Alam, Senior Secretary, ICT Division, to come to the stage. Thank you very much. John, now we can continue looking for... All right. Who's We're, in the fourth place? We know who our gold medalists are. The yeah, question but look is, here. what rank are they? Yeah, let, so, let's, look, let's have a small look here. Uh, Bikini University, they solved nine problems, but they submitted in two other problems. So if they manage to solve them, there will be 11 problems. So they will be the, in first place. They, they have the potential to jump all the way into first place. That is correct. Yeah. So let's see what happens here. They have two pro submissions on two problems. The first one, that one's oh, a no. Oh, it's a no. But again, they still can solve 10 problems and maybe beat by time the it, MIT. It, it's possible, I think. Let's take a look at this one. And oh, they get it, they move up into second place. It's a yes. But they go to the second place because of the time. All right, so we're still looking for our first gold medalist here. Yeah, so, but again, it's the same thing, because Seoul University has two more problems, and if they are correct, 
they will be 11 problems. If they solve both of these, they will, get, they will have 11 and move up into first. So here we go. Let's take a look at the first one. That oh, one's a no. It's a no. Well, let's see the second one here. That was it's a no also, no. which means, Mohammed? Our first gold medalist for today, Seoul National University, first to solve problem B and problem H. Congratulations, Seoul National University. Seoul National University, our first gold medalist for today. First to solve problem B and problem H, they managed to solve nine problems. Thank you. Congratulations, Seoul National University, our first gold medalist. And now there were three. Yeah, they still have one problem. And they the University of Tokyo is currently in third place with nine problems solved and pending runs on one problem. Yeah, but it's like they submitted five times and in minutes 209, so it's two minutes before the end of the contest. All right, let's see what happens. That was it's a, no, a no, which means that... That means second gold medalist for today goes to the University of Tokyo and they are Asia Pacific champions. First to solve problem G and problem J. Second gold medalist for today, they are Asia Pacific champion. First to solve problem G and problem J. They solved nine problems. Congratulations. Thank you, University of Tokyo. Th thank you. Great job. Congratulations to our second gold medalist. And everyone can read a scoreboard. So, Mohammed? Yeah, Bikini University is our third gold medalist for today. They are Asia East champion. Bikini University. for today, Bikini University, Asia East champion. They managed to solve 10 problems. Congratulations. Thank you, Bikini University. Thank you, good job. Now, okay, well, here's a question. Here's a, uh, before, there is always a challenge. Before we go on, I yeah. remember Bill, One Bill. Day, a long time ago, Bill Poucher told me that 
a competition, a programming contest, could be viewed as a contest between teams from universities. But a better way to view it is that it's a competition between each team and the judges. The judges write problems with specifications and the team is trying to meet all of those specifications. So there is some drama left here, and that is what happens with these remaining two yeah, rounds? Yeah, because they the, the, submitted in these two problems and they managed to solve them. That means they managed to solve all the problems. So let's see if they managed. All right, let's take a look at the if first they one. they did that, oh, first one, it's in the last minute of the competition, they submitted 19 times, and it's a no. no. That uh, was a no. Uh, unfortunately, there, it's a no, so it's a win for is, the judges. There but there is something. There again. is something else. Yeah, we need to know if the champion of this year won by time or by, by number of problems. So our both the first and second, they solved 10 problems. So we need to know if the champion won by the difference in the time. Left some folks out. Can our folks from Endure Capital come up here and enjoy this festivity with me? Come on. Tariq, Endure. Come on up. Come on up. Yep. Come on up. So the last question is, did the world champion just beat the other teams by values measured in seconds, or did they really beat them by no, solving before, more problems? Yeah, before we know that, let's ask the contestants. Who think they beat it by time? Raise your hand. OK. Who think they beat it by Number of problems, raise your hand. Wow. wow. Okay, well, the Let's answer see. is they yes. beat them by problems. Yeah. MIT. Yeah. Let's welcome MIT, the world champions, North American champion, first to solve problem NCE, ICBC DACA champion, MIT University. Congratulations.
Thank you very much. Congratulations, all the champions. So, it's come to an end of this closing ceremony. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm now inviting you all to celebration point. So, our volunteers, they will guide you to the celebration point. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you all. Congratulations to our world champion, MIT. So for the first to solve problems, please come to the stage to take your black. First to solve problems, come to the stage to receive your black. to pick up your first to solve and your silver and bronze prizes from the ICPC challenge and your polos from Huawei for the ICPC challenge. Congratulations to everybody. See you next year.